Welcome everyone to this Keystone e-Symposium on Reimagining Scientific Conferences. Today we will explore pandemic lessons in reducing carbon footprint, engaging new audiences, and rethinking strategies for scientific exchange. Thank you for joining us for these important conversations regarding the future of scientific conferencing as we navigate re-entry into a post-pandemic world. I'm Shannon Wyman, the Director of Program Development and Scientific Communications at Keystone Symposia, and I'll be hosting the event today. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers for you, featuring innovators in virtual and hybrid conference design, leaders in platform technologies, and diverse conference organizations to share their experiences and expertise. Together, we will explore the benefits, challenges, and solutions for virtual and hybrid meetings and determine best practices moving forward. Ultimately, we aim to outline novel ways to enhance community engagement, promote collaboration, and drive scientific advances through new conferencing tools and formats. To begin our program today, I'd like to introduce our meeting organizers to share with you their inspiration and vision for this event. I give you Dr. Debbie Johnson, the President and CEO of Keystone Symposia, and her co-organizer, Dr. Judith Klinman of the University of California, Berkeley. Well, good morning and welcome everyone. As uh, Shannon said, which I want to first thank her for all the, the work that she's done in putting this conference together. Uh, I'm Debbie Johnson, President and the CEO of Keystone Symposia. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, we're a nonprofit organization that is currently celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. Uh, we generally convene between 55 and 60 global meetings every year that are focused on basic and translational life science research in areas that span genetics and biochemistry to cancer immunotherapy and vaccinology. So during the last three years, I think we can all agree we've faced unprecedented times. The pandemic thwarted our ability to convene in-person conferences for two years, much longer than any of us had anticipated. And in doing so, it really has forced us to reconsider how to best engage our scientific communities beyond our traditional in-person events. Many of us experimented with virtual meetings with varying degrees of success, and there were many lessons learned. So we thought now is a good time for us to come together and reflect on these experiences, to share both our successes and our challenges, and to explore what opportunities that we might avail going forward as we adjust to reconvening in-person meetings and adapt to new hybrid formats. So given our experiences and some of uh, yours, I think uh, in my mind there are three key issues amongst others that I'd like to see us address during these next two days. First, how can we produce virtual and hybrid events in a more cost-effective manner? I think that's an important factor. For the hybrid events, how can we better engage the in-person attendees with those that are attending virtually to catalyze interactions, connections, and collaborations? And third, how do we optimize networking opportunities in virtual formats that best reflect the serendipitous interactions that we all value in in-person events? So I look forward to hearing from all of you, and I really hope that this meeting inspires new ideas that will transform how we engage our scientific communities in the future. So thank you again for being here, and now I will turn it over to my co-organizer, Judith. Thank you, Debbie. I'm thrilled that we're actually seeing this uh, event take place. First of all, I wanna thank all of you for coming and participating in our conference, uh, Reimagining Scientific Conferences. And I first want to shout out the invaluable contributions of Debbie, Shannon Wyman from Keystone Symposia and Eowyn Mater from UC Berkeley, who have worked consistently and hard over the last several years to bring this meeting to fruition. As disastrous as COVID has been in the US and around the world, we have learned important lessons about how to stay connected and how to adapt quickly to new ways of interacting. At the same time, the climate emergency contributes to barrel ahead, with CO2 emissions continuing to rise despite the promise from nations around the world 
to achieve either a plateau in CO2 emissions or to reduce uh, em emissions uh, of CO2. And as we speak, 2022 UN Climate Change Conference is in progress, COP27, where the key issues of mitigation and adaptation are being discussed. One of the most compelling issues is how urgent it is that we act quickly as we move into a regime where large scale and irreversible damage is taking place. We have reached a new status quo where the economic cost of prevention and mitigation has become less than the economic cost of recovery from the damage incurred. Just as the burden to move forward constructively within the international community lies predominantly with the rich nations, our community of scientists also has a, a major role to play. For example, in the ingoing, ongoing development of much needed new technologies, and um, certainly uh, CO2 capture is a, a big part of that, in disseminating the truth of the scientific basis for the environmental destruction that is rapidly accelerating rather than diminishing. And finally, in setting examples of how thoughtful changes can be implemented that may both enhance the vibrancy of the scientific community and help to mitigate global warming. My hope is that this meeting will jumpstart a conversation and initiatives that address the challenges and inconvenience of climate change and promote responsible behavior and principles among the contributing societies and general scientific community. It's clear that we're going to need to iron out differences in experience and opinions and ultimately to set out pos possible roadmaps toward shared practices. As a community of creative working scientists, technicians and administrators, we can face the challenges with new views of how to move forward. And it's also important to remember that introduced changes aren't necessarily forever but they are urgently needed now to mitigate the circumstances of this critical time in our planet's future. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie and Judith. Now it's time to kick off our keynote session, highlighting different perspectives on how and why to invest in virtual and hybrid conference formats in a post-pandemic era. Each of our speakers will give a 20 minute talk followed by a group discussion and Q&A. You can submit your questions for our speakers at any time into the Q&A chat box. Please specify if your question is for a specific speaker. Everyone is encouraged to vote on the questions submitted so we can gauge audience interest in the various questions. And now please join me in welcoming our first keynote speaker, Dr. Walter Greenleaf, a neuroscientist and digital medicine expert at Stanford University's Virtual Human Interaction Lab. Dr. Greenleaf will be talking to us about designing virtual interactions to catalyze connection and collaboration. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be with you today. And for my topic, I will be discussing virtual world technology and how it will be used moving forward for virtual meetings and other applications. I'm a behavioral neuroscientist working at Stanford University but I also have a, a focus on how can we apply virtual reality technology to clinical care and to promote health and wellness. So in the course of my presentation to you, I will be discussing both uh, virtual world technology and some of the challenges we have as we start rolling it out. Where is it now and where can it be? And how it will impact uh, both science, research, and uh, I'll give some examples from the clinical care community. So there's a little bit of a nomenclature issue that I always run across when talking about uh, virtual reality technology and augmented reality technology. We're now starting in the field to use the phrase immersive systems because with the variety of different uh, ways of being part of a virtual world, sometimes we experience the virtual world by looking at a webcam, but seeing in front of us a three-dimensional interactive world. Sometimes we play something on our head that allows us to either overlay the real environment with extra information. Uh, and in some cases, we also can interact with that extra information. 
So there is a bit of a nomenclature going on. But one thing's for sure, uh, now is the time that uh, virtual environment technology, immersive technologies, VR and AR technology, XR technology, uh, now is the time, despite the evolution of the nomenclature, now is the time for these technologies to start impacting our world. And I'll give us some examples of where we are and where we're going. Uh, we're already seeing examples of how virtual environments will be part of the next computer platform, impacting how we work, how we play, our educational systems, uh, our social systems, and uh, to the focus of this conference, how we sometimes meet each other and exchange information in scientific conferences. Um, the terms that uh, we're shuffling around right now, we use the term VR to virtual reality to indicate a fully immersive system that blocks out the outside world. We use the term augmented reality to talk about overlaying the real world with extra information. Mixed reality is when we are able to interact with that extra information. And now we're starting to use the term XR or extended reality to talk about the spectrum of those systems. And they're gaining momentum rapidly. If we look at the adoption curve for technologies, look at the color TV or the video cassette recorder or the personal computer, and we look at the adoption rate of augmented and virtual reality technology, we're actually adopting uh, VR and AR technology at a faster rate than we did with some of the previous technologies, including that of the uh, cell phone. And for my focus, uh, I tend to look at how this is going to impact uh, health and wellness and clinical care. We're in the middle of a digital health revolution right now, which is enabling moving these technologies to the mainstream and the enterprise. The focus of the digital health revolution is the patient. No longer is the hospital the point of care, uh, especially in, engendered by the pandemic. We're moving to distributed ways of reaching patients. And again, this will impact uh, the evolution of virtual world technology, and that will impact as part of that evolution where we start having our meetings and conferences. So what I've seen in the last uh, uh, while is the evolution of all of our research devices and clinical devices moving from the handwritten and analog world to the digital world. We're entering the era of medical wearables where information is collected uh, sometimes 24 seven by things that we affix to our bodies or implant in our bodies. We're also seeing the evolution of new ways of understanding our behavior. We can use our voice tones as an analytic for um, anxiety or depression or pain. We can capture facial expressions and other signals to um, indicate our cognitive attention and status. And we can evaluate our brain health often just by looking at the passive data that we collect uh, from our cell phone technology. This is allowing us to build a tremendous um, system with uh, clinician um, and research scientists facing dashboards with uh, information, ideally uh, information that's kept very secure and private, and then a variety of patient-facing applications in the immersive worlds that we can use for research and for clinical trials and for clinical care. And as we collect more data, uh, ideally again, uh, uh, protected and secure, we start to uh, be able to implement more interactions. Um, we're also seeing some tremendous changes, again, empowered by the need to adapt to the pandemic uh, with shifting business models of the tech titans, uh, Apple, Google, Samsung, uh, um, Amazon are all jumping into the um, uh, virtual environment arena and to clinical care. Uh, we've had to shift our regulations uh, of approving medical devices that are distributed over the internet and virtual worlds, telemedicine. And then we're also shifting to pay attention to our mental health and the impact of how we interact with each other, such as video conferencing on our mental health. There's a number of emerging and confluent technologies that are supporting this move to virtual world environments. And again, my focus has been on the clinical environment, so the examples will be mostly from there. 
We're seeing sensors and the evolution of the Internet of Things where sensors are promulgating and embedded into almost all the devices that we use. We're seeing uh, the application of machine learning and predictive analytics to these large data sets. This allows us to make sense of all the data that we're collecting from the sensors. We're seeing ways that we can take the signals that we collect both in the virtual world environment uh, and as we use uh, VR and AR technology and understand the user the, by paying attention to eye gaze, uh, facial expressions, voice tone, behavior within the virtual environments, we can come up with an individual score of how one can handle different levels of complexity and cognitive load. Uh, this helps us uh, adapt the virtual world environment to the individual and with an aging population and uh, often uh, mild cognitive impairment and neurodegenerative disease, we're able to adapt the interface and how we express information to the individuals to match their cognitive styles and emotional status. And again, because we're entering the era of medical wearables, we're collecting a lot of information that allows us to personalize the interaction with uh, the virtual world technology. This is important because we do need to understand our cognitive state and our emotional state in order to best utilize uh, the technology that will be part of our future of how we meet, socialize, work, play, recreate, educate, etc. We're also starting to come up with concept migrating it from the manufacturing world to the um, virtual world technologies of coming up with a digital twin that represents us, uh, our cognitive state, our emotional state, our physiology, our behavior, our preferences and our goals as part of the avatars that we use as we participate in virtual worlds. 5G connections are allowing us to push the, all this complex information. Uh, we can render it in the cloud and with edge computing uh, provided to the user uh, with light frame glasses. So cur the current head mount displays that we're using are often bulky and unwieldy. Uh, they're, fortunately, they're not very expensive right now. You can get a very good uh, VR system for $300, for example, the third of the cost of a smartphone. Um, but um, they are uh, sometimes a bit uncomfortable to wear, but with 5G um, promulgating, we will be able to do cloud-based rendering and have the uh, system, the display systems be much more uh, lightweight and unobtrusive and will look less silly when we wear them. Uh, we're also starting to add extra dimensions of sensory input. Uh, for example, we now can bring um, dimensional smell experiences so that one can be in a virtual world, uh, hold up, uh, a bouquet of roses and smell them. Uh, the smell gets stronger as you move closer. You can turn around and smell the lawn being mowed behind you. Uh, it's actually quite uh, uh, remarkable how robust those systems can be. So as we start moving to virtual world platforms as our way to interact with each other, uh, there are some amazing things we can do, but there are also some challenges. Uh, we have the enabling technology and the enabling tools. We're working on the content. We have to be careful to make sure that the content and the data sets that we capture are diverse and age appropriate and culturally um, appropriate and secure and safe. And that is, I think, one of the biggest challenges that we have right now. Mm -hmm. But um, we are starting to already see what's called the metaverse, uh, where virtual world technology is shared in a distributed manner, um, a, a persistent, freight iterated um, uh, intersection of virtual worlds, different platforms with some common ways of connecting over those platforms in common ways of interacting. It's evolving, but we're gradually getting there. And again, this is where a lot of our work and our socializing and our education will take place uh, moving forward. We'll be able to reach underserved populations because of it. But again, we have to be careful to make sure that we design to not exclude groups or build into our data sets uh, biased, uh, uh, biased sets. So it's really quite amazing some of the virtual world uh, technologies that are out there. Uh, how many of you have had a chance to use the virtual world? more than I thought. See, it's gaining in, in uh, preponderance. Uh, 
but uh, they can sometimes be photorealistic. Re and uh, uh, but there are some challenges that we see in uh, evolving virtual worlds right now. Um, if done correctly, we can address some of the concerns that are uh, one of our current ways of having group meetings and interacting with each other over video calls. These are often extremely exhausting. There's a reason for this, but a lot of it boils down to an aspect of um, human behavior. It's actually stressful for us to be looking at uh, talking heads uh, for hours upon hours, um, normal human interactions, um, we move around the room. We don't always keep our gaze on the other person. We communicate non-verbally with each other, uh, both by what we do, how we position ourselves, where we look, what we say, how we say it. And a lot of this is put down through a real filter as we interact over video conferencing. Of course, it's better than some of the interactions that we had been using previously to only interact with uh, remote team members, for example, by typing or texting or audio, but it still leaves us exhausted. And there's been a lot of interesting research as to the reasons why video conferencing can be exhausting. And the hope is that virtual world technology, by being more natural, will allow us to step over some of those limitations that we see in video conferencing technology. But we're not there yet. Uh, virtual worlds currently are um, sometimes very silly, sometimes very challenging. Our avatars um, um, often look like robots. They don't have the right kinesthetic movements. Um, uh, in Meta's world horizons, for example, our legs are missing. Uh, we don't have easy ways to capture or extrapolate uh, um, the inverse kinematics necessary to have uh, full motion. And frankly, our avatars are rude. If, uh, if several avatars are talking to each other and another uh, person walks up to join the conversation, um, it takes a while to reshuffle, welcome them into the group, something that we do automatically when we're interacting with a group of people as we don't even think about it. But in virtual worlds, our gestures, our body language, our facial expressions, uh, by and large, are horrible. And that's one of the things we need to work on before people will be able to effectively use virtual worlds for meetings and social interactions, education, etc. However, I'll describe briefly uh, some of the solutions that are underway to address this concern. I think a lot of this will be um, helped by the work that's going on in effective computing. I think the data sets and the heuristics that we will be getting out of what's currently in the medical research arena will be applied to virtual world technology and uh, hopefully make our interactions, our avatars, and our behaviors as transmitted in the virtual world much more engaging and uh, appropriate. Uh, effective computing is a study and development systems that can interpret and process our human affects, our human emotions. Uh, we can do this by capturing a variety of different signals, such as facial expressions, body language, voice tones, and we can use those analytics to evaluate someone's emotional state. And this is going to be a big part of our, our future. Um, we are the tech companies, as they evolve the interaction technology that we use, the computers, the phones, the um, uh, the immersive world systems that are part of what we'll be using to connect with each other, they will try and personalize it. They will want to be able to understand our moods, our cognitive status, and our goals, and adapt our technology to us. And that will be a good thing, and I think it will have a positive impact on virtual worlds. Uh, we're already harvesting information about um, nonverbal communication and body language and facial gestures and using this as part of adapting technology to us. And I think we can anticipate that our smart cars, for example, will be paying attention to our mood, to our cognitive status and adapting their behavior to uh, be more efficient and uh, feel more comfortable for us. Our built environment will also leverage uh, adaptive sensing to adjust to us and to the people that are in the room. But we have to do a lot of work in interpreting all the signals that indicate cognitive and emotional state. It's a, it's a complex area, and we again, we need to make sure that as we do this, that the data sets that we use to move people into the virtual world and um, represent them are not biased. 
but uh, we're making progress. There are systems where it used to be that um, you're that, and still is by and large the case that uh, avatars uh, look very robotic and did not look or sound like us. But we can change that now. We can have them using uh, AI systems recognize our facial gestures, our voice tones, and map them to an avatar that may look like us, or we may choose to filter the data and have things look differently. But we have the ability now to technically to have more realistic looking avatars that look and sound the way we'd like them to be. And I should mention at this point, why is this important? And what are the applications that that I and my colleagues are very excited about of using uh, virtual environment technology as part of clinical care. Um, one of the reasons we're starting to use virtual environments is because they are a very effective way of engaging and promoting uh, clinical adherence to often difficult products. Um, we can leverage the brain's neural neuron systems. Uh, for example, at our lab at Stanford, uh, we've done some research on how age progressing your avatar and having your avatar have a conversation with you, your future self, can affect your behavior and help you uh, understand the importance of doing sometimes the difficult thing of exercising or uh, saving for retirement or um, working on uh, better nutrition, et cetera, or maybe changing your behavior with alcohol. Uh, these systems have impact because they activate, uh, uh, instead of just uh, a narrow bandwidth of activation of the brain, we can leverage the brain's reward systems and give feedback because people are more fully engaged. The other thing that we can do is we can um, activate the, the brain's um, uh, reward system and memory system. And I think what's most exciting is that we can put the power of story into these interactions, much like we do in the entertainment and gaming arena. We can leverage the brain's um, um, association with narrative stories and bring that to how we interact with each other by the avatars and the backstories that we choose to convey in virtual world technology. So in summary, I think we're entering into a new era of uh, both research and clinical care and uh, understanding human um, cognition and emotional expression and how that can be mapped to the avatars in a virtual world. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. And the enabling technologies that are emerging hand in hand with this uh, will facilitate better virtual world interactions. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause here, and let my colleagues continue with their presentations, but I hope I've conveyed to you my excitement about where we can go with virtual world technology and also some of the challenges that we're currently addressing that hopefully will be uh, resolved soon. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Greenleaf. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Felix Rondell, co-founder of Futurehine, a solution studio at the intersection of science, innovation, and society. Mr. Rondell leverages creative meeting design with the power of interdisciplinary collaboration to tackle grand challenges facing the world today. He will be talking to us about virtual and hybrid conference design for optimal outcomes. Hi everyone, um, my name is Felix. Um, it's a great pleasure being here with you today. First of all, thanks Walter for that really amazing presentation, a uh, glimpse into the future of meetings. Uh, thanks to Judith, Deborah and Shannon for setting this up. I think it's an incredibly timely and important uh, topic uh, to think about where we're going next with academic conferences and what the future might look like. I want to say uh, happy birthday to Keystone Symposia as well. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. To all of you out there uh, in front of your screens, I hope you're cozy and comfortable. Uh, I'm currently in Berlin, Germany in my office. It's uh, in the PM's late afternoon. Um, so wherever you are, thanks for joining. I'm talking about some thim similar themes um, as, as Walter uh, did uh, about technology, about humans, uh, about the power of story but I'm really coming from a very different perspective. And that starts with uh, me, first of all, uh, not being a scientist. Um, I am what uh, some people might refer to as a creative strategist, a consultant and a meeting designer. And what that means, um, if you don't have a concept of this yet, 
I'll explain that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, I run an agency out of Berlin. Um, it's called Future Hein, and we work with uh, international science uh, partners, people, organizations, uh, associations um, run on science and and working with uh, science to help them with uh, strategy communications and congresses, conference concepts. So um, this is basically where I'm coming from. For the last 15 years or so, I worked between these two worlds as kind of a wanderer between the worlds, between the world of science and uh, scientific um, institutions and the big world of events, professional business events, the events industry, as uh, if you will. And uh, one part of my career journey and the one focus was really always to try and bring these two worlds a bit closer together. So what I'm telling you today has a lot to do with that, bringing in insights from the world of professional business events. There are a lot of uh, trends and tendencies that we can um, apply and, and um, yeah, work with in the scientific world. Um, and what you see here is a conference that I curated for many years, for um, eight years in a physical form. That's the photos you see here, but also in a virtual form. Uh, it's an international interdisciplinary science conference based in Berlin, the Falling Walls Conference. Uh, and some of the um, experiences that I'm sharing are from uh, some of the cases that um, happened there in the last few years. So back to my uh, presentation title, yes, virtual and hybrid conference design for optimal outcomes. I'll be focusing on the reimagining part a lot, um, asking the question, how can we build better science conferences in the here and now? How can we affect change today by applying different methods, different mindsets to our events, to our conferences, um, and how can we create better user experience, delegate experience, participant experience, however you want to name that for uh, the people that come to our conferences. And so it's a very human focused uh, approach. You will see it's a very design oriented focus. And before I talk a little bit about these um, insights, about the mindsets and models, I really want to zoom out um, and really look at this topic from a bird's eye and even further out, uh, look at the scientific conference as a technology as in itself. So if we take scientific conferences as a, as a technology, um, I think uh, Judith has, has um, hinted at that, we look at a platform that uh, needs to be a catalyst for scientific exchange, for the advancement in science, it is a platform that connects scientists when, within and across disciplines. Um, of course, it's in many cases uh, an opportunity for career development, professional, but also personal development uh, uh, among scientists. And it's a platform for disseminating breakthroughs uh, and, and, and new uh, scientific advancements to broader society. Um, ultimately, it's also about you know, sustainably building communities launching and stirring new collaboration and under the bottom line um, if we look at this technology the science conference it what it needs to do is accelerate insights that will benefit society so how do we build for this how do we accelerate and and um, expand this this technology as we go into the future and what has happened in the past um, We've learned, of course, that technology and design do not stand still. I'm going to show you a few almost stereotypical um, slides that you might have seen before. Uh, of course, technology um, advances in functionality. Take the uh, dumb phone to smartphone development uh, and think about what that means for um, academic conferences. Technology changes uh, in design and how it is produced and how it needs is tailored to uh, audiences. And that, of course, also has to do with zeitgeist, with changing um, consumption patterns and how we like to use our technology. And this is certainly also true for uh, scientific conferences. So we're seeing some change there. I'll get back to that in a minute. The structure of technology has, of course, changed. This is now a, a building uh, analogy. But of course, think about the structure of uh, academic events and how this has been advancing over the last years or decades. So I'll 
break it down to the million dollar or million euro question, um, what is happening with scientific conferences? How is this te technology um, progressing over the years, over the last decades? Again, I traveled uh, extensively to academic conferences in Europe, in the US, and the images you see here from face-to-face -face events are still the standard. These are not historical uh, photographies. This is still what you see everywhere. So where is this, um, where are we standing now and how are we pushing into the future with this platform? I think that's a very important question to focus on. And then, of course, that's why we are here to discuss uh, about um, reimagining uh, scientific conferences. We've been disrupted uh, in, in our uh, scientific uh, conference world. The pandemic has really led to an acceleration of uh, change, a massive uh, digitalization of events, and we are going to see more pressure on this field by climate change, by global warming, and uh, the other related effects, biodiversity loss, um, much uh, stronger regulations, etc. cetera. Um, Kate will address this in the next talk. I know that, so I'll keep it there. But how are these pressures um, affecting change in our field? Um, yeah, of course, as I said, Kate will address this. Um, there's a huge uh, opportunity in using virtual events uh, to uh, cut carbon, the carbon footprint in this very intense, carbon intense um, meetings industry in general, and also scientific conferences should take the lead in uh, cutting down uh, carbon footprints. So here are a couple of uh, quotes and, and insights from recent papers. Again, I'll, I'll leave this to Kate, but um, there's another aspect that we have to talk about, and this is um, not really dependent on the question whether we are running physical events, face-to-face -face, face events, or virtual events. We have a problem that um, we had to face already before the conference, and I talked about this um, a lot pre-pandemic. There is a dissatisfaction with how conferences are run and have been run, the uh, very provocative um, newspaper uh, screenshots you see here are just representative of that. And it has to do um, with changing user needs. Again, there are, of course, also new generations of um, researchers uh, coming into academia. They have changing needs, Generation X, uh, millennials. Um, they are changing consumption patterns um, all everywhere we look in society. And this is rapidly accelerating. And the zeitgeist, again, referring to design, uh, referring to how we uh, visually like to uh, perceive um, uh, conferences, about how we want to go through conference experiences and conference um, journeys. I'll touch that in a minute. Um, that is all changing. And there's uh, oftentimes we ask ourselves the question, why do we make this investment of time, of money? Um, and, and of our attention to travel to faraway uh, conferences and then find ourselves, you know, in dark uh, rooms with stale air, with bad coffee. And, you know, the, we all had these experiences. So back to um, an overview of the evolution of events or what some might say is the evolution of scientific events from in presence to virtual, then hybrid, then VR, AR and um, Web3 metaverse, you might add. Walter touched upon these some of these stages in the, in the development. But I would really contest this view of a, uh, of a simple um, linear evolution in academic events. And I would much rather add a different dimension of development and a dimension in um, innovation that we need to look at. And that is an innovation that not only has to do with the medium, i.e. moving from face-to-face -face events in the real world to virtual events um, on platforms, but also in the craft of how we design these events. Um, let me tell you what I mean with that. The meeting design model that we are using um, for setting up academic conferences, science uh, congresses, expos to do with technology and innovation is built on this principle. Again, a uh, architectural metaphor uh, for cohesive meeting design. So we want to build a structure 
uh, an event, a meeting that is holistically planned from a strategic um, point of departure, thinking about the purpose, thinking about the objectives for us as an organization, the objectives also for our target group. Then around that, we tailor a consistent narrative that you can think of as the facade of this building, a compelling, attractive storyline, um, a narrative that will um, you know, communicate to the target group what this event is about, what we're trying to achieve together, why you should invest your time um, and your money and attention to go there or to be there uh, virtually. And then um, as the inside, the interior functions of this event structure, we think about you know, what are the formats that we need to apply? What are the contents that we need to deliver there? And ultimately, this experience layer, how do we want our delegates to feel when they navigate through the structure? So this um, is a bit abstract um, at this point, but I think the architectural metaphor is is very appropriate. Um, having a you know aesthetic, uh, visually compelling, but a highly functional and uh, overall holistic structure that we build from scratch. Um, that's the goal. And how do we do that? Um, we apply a design process. And here's a small hint. This design process is the same for physical face-to-face -face events and virtual events, but it's even more important for virtual events where we need to um, activate engagement. We need to activate the feeling of uh, commitment of, you know, it's, it's uh, important for me as a delegate to be there to uh, join in this experience. So this design process, I, uh, as I as mentioned before, it has to do, first of all, with identifying the purpose, the why, what change in the real world do we want to affect with this meeting? Why should everyone take their time out of their calendars and attend this meeting? What can they get out of it? Um, and how do we move on afterwards? How, what's the sustainability? In this um, context, not the ecological, but the social, societal um, sustainability of this event. We clarify the objectives and we don't move on in the planning pro process before we uh, didn't clarify all the objectives for us as an organization, for our partners, and for the people that we want to join in. Um, for that, we also really need to uh, have a very good knowledge of our audiences. Sometimes we can use data from previous events. Um, that's the beauty of uh, virtual event platforms, that we can get a lot of data and insights on um, how um, our audiences navigate on these platforms, how their attention spans, um, work with our formats and much more. Um, and then ultimately creating these stories, uh, creating a build based on the purpose, the, the narrative of uh, why this event matters and um, building structures and ultimately um, the emotional experiences that will lead us through this conference. Here's uh, an overview of a few building principles um, these virtual events should be designed with the user in mind as so a very user-centric design manner that um, shall lead to better engagement, activate people's engagement, um, more um, yeah, efficiency in getting to results and outcomes. And um, yeah, we need to know what kind of needs and requirements our audiences com come into the conference with, what kind of um, questions they are um, struggling with and how we can bring them into collaboration to solve those together. Um, I mentioned the aspect of purpose-driven um, design. This is not just about a shared narrative. Um, I always call this the power core of, of a conference, of an event. Um, if we are able to tap into this shared purpose that everyone thinks is extremely important and relevant, we can really activate enormous energy in the community that can last for uh, much, much longer than one individual event. Um, then we want to make sure that we build our virtual events to be activating, of course. Um, so not only frontal input from uh, distinguished keynote speakers, but also leaving a lot of pockets and niches and uh, opportunities for delegates to come together, connect uh, socially, also emotionally. Um, we know that um, it's 
attending scientific conferences is not only about professional connections and development, but there are also a lot of personal motivations that are coming into play. So provide some space for that. Also be creative in um, framing these spaces and uh, setting social cues that show, you know, we have uh, low um, hierarchies here. It's fine to talk to everyone and creating incentives for connecting and collaborating. There's a beautiful, beautiful quote that I always share by a fellow meeting designer from the Netherlands, Monique van Dusseldorp, and it really captures all of this in one statement. A successful conference will make the audience feel something is happening that matters and that they are part of it. So what I talked about in terms of the power core if, is that we need to um, convey this what matters. Why are we doing this? I think we all um, understand that in this uh, specific symposium, um, we are onto something. This is a very important topic. We all have experiences to share. I'm very much looking forward to um, hearing your experiences uh, from your previous events, your successes, your failures, and then to understand that we are part of shaping this movement as we go forward, that it's not just a one-off event, but it's a community effort. So here is one tool that I want to share with you that um, really is a very cost effective. So we um, talk also about you know low uh, budget solutions for um, associations, smaller NGOs, universities, for basically any meeting you set up, specifically in the virtual space, um, is to uh, take a sheet of paper or a, a whiteboard, digital whiteboard, and map your delegates' experience as they go through your planned event. Um, this is called participant experience mapping. I basically adapted this from marketing uh, uh, research where you, you, know, you have experience journeys through supermarkets or museums. Applying this to events is a very powerful tool and a very simple one. You only need a, a small team and uh, um, uh, you know, your first plan, your first sketches of, of your uh, planned event. What you do is you highlight all the important um, moments in the event uh, and imagine how certain um, persona, certain per, uh, representatives of your community will go through this event, what kind of um, experiences they will, they will uh, encounter, encounter and how you might be able to enhance these experiences, tweak these experiences, make them more interesting, make them more flawless, um, make them surprising, make them more emotional. Um, so I'll, I'm using this in all of our um, meeting design projects. And this the trick is basically to imagine your virtual conference as a chain of experiences, uh, as the a need for engaging storyline and um, hopefully coming with a dramatic arc. And all of this is possible with this simple tool um, going again through the moments of your event, uh, sketching out the, um, the uh, different interactions of a delegate with the event and trying to enhance these and um, yeah, turn this event into a unique experience. And I think that's where. Um, that's where the magic lies in, 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 this, um, in this simple method. I can... Mm -hmm. um, one word about hybrid versus virtual events. And um, I think we are in a tricky situation here. We need hybrid solutions as we move forward. Um, and we still find them very costly. Um, in order to put together a impressive and very well merged um, fluid hybrid experience that really connects um, our live audience, our physical audience with our online audience, we really have to invest um, not only in technology, but also really on in the, uh, the, the direction, the, the uh, dramaturgy, the um, yeah, the, the meeting design. Um, so what I'm suggesting here is that, of course, first of all, we have several different definitions of hybrid uh, going around. We have the very uh, standard um, broadcasting, um, online broadcasting of a face-to-face -face event. But um, there's one hybrid mix that I think is especially helpful for 
smaller um, you know, NGOs, uh, science-driven associations, universities, that is uh, an, a non-parallel hybrid mix. So focusing on one or several face-to-face -face meetings that really focus on the power of uh, the human connection, on the social and emotional experiences, on you know, trust building, on collaborating um, as, as um, both uh, on a personal and professional level, and then really enriching this with a chain of uh, virtual meetings where everyone is uh, joining uh, through online uh, platforms and um, both bringing both together the power of uh, virtual formats for you know, content-driven um, meetings, for sharing information, for digital collaboration, AI-driven networking, and all year round engagement with these special occasions for uh, tapping into uh, the power of human connection is where I currently see with the state of technology and the cost of hybrid technology is where I see the biggest strengths in the, in the hybrid mix. So to close my, um, my presentation with a few recommendations, some do's and some don'ts, um, what we see um, in successful virtual events is that um, scientific organizations manage to create this shared purpose, a story, a context. Why is this what we, why is this cause that we're following together uh, important? Why is it important that we get together and collaborate? I think this is 100% fulfilled in this meeting. Um, I think uh, what's important is to make sure to make, um, the user experience of your delegates flawless and not just on the technical side, you know, being uh, sure of what your, how your platform works and how your users are interacting with that platform, but also the emotional, uh, the learning user experience, all the things that I hinted at in this um, user experience journey uh, overview and really trying to eliminate any frustrations, uh, any low uh, points, any emo emotional uh, dips, and trying to keep a constant active level of participant engagement, creating these spaces and also incentives for exchange and collaboration. There will be a networking session here later. Uh, there will be panels and, and so on. So make sure to make use of them. Um, and then again, make sure that you use the pre and post event phases. Don't only focus on the virtual event per se, but use all the pre-communication uh, period and the post-communication uh, period before and after the event to make the most of um, your content. And last but not least, I think um, we all should try new experiences. We um, should try to be surprising in how we set up academic events and um, that will, um, yeah, attract new audiences. Think about the uh, different generations that we are uh, now um, dealing with um, in, in, in this broad mix of, of uh, our target group. Some don'ts, um, do not ignore your delegates' personal motivations. I think this is very important. Um, when we talk about face-to-face -face, um, uh, scientific meetings, we know that there's always you know this family aspect. We're meeting old friends. We're getting together at the bar after the event. Um, we can replicate this in virtual meetings as well, and we need to, and we should. Um, so providing these spaces is extremely important. Do not try to copy and paste formats from in, in presence events. Uh, no large panels with uh, six people reading their uh, papers and, um, uh, and using hours for that. This will simply not work with the uh, online attention span. Um, do not overload the sessions uh, per se with heavy content. Uh, try to work with content before the event and after the event so you can really focus also during the virtual event on the human aspects, on learning, on exchange. Um, don't assume, and again, this goes to uh, all the uh, smaller organizations with smaller budgets for the events. Don't assume that higher budget means higher engagement. A lot of the um, engagement comes through interesting, attractive planning um, and um, giving opportunities and really emphasizing um, the, the community um, element in, in these events. And last but not least, I think we are um, 
we moved beyond the point where we can run events without focusing and insisting on key values such as inclusion, diversity. Um, virtual events are uh, great for that on community building and ultimately uh, sustainability. So um, I'll end with that. Session timer is running out. I'm looking forward to your questions later and back to Shannon. Great, thank you so much, Felix. As a reminder to our audience, go ahead and submit your questions for our speakers in the Q&A chat box, um, and we will move on to the Q&A segment after our next talk, which is by our third keynote speaker, Ms. Kate Whitfield, who is founder and CEO of Zeroverse, which provides strategies and skills for sustainability in academia. She'll be speaking today about equity and, and sustainability of scientific content. So thank you very much, Dr. Debbie Johnson and Professor Judith Klinman for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, thank you also to my collaborators who worked with me on this project. So Thale Jarvis, Shannon Wyman and Angela Ares. And I'd like to extend a particular kudos to Debbie Johnson, Thale Jarvis and Keystone Symposium in general for sharing their data that we're about to see and for hosting this, what I think is a really important conversation. All right, so as scientists and educators, we are proponents of equity and fairness. But what if our business model is not particularly equitable or fair? And specifically, what if the way that we convene our research communities is neither equitable or fair. So let's have a look at some examples. Um, this is a map um, and on the left, you see a, a picture that's typical for an in-person meeting on the topic of tuberculosis research hosted by Keystone Symposium. What you see on the right is that this map has lit up. And these are the countries where participants are based that took part in the meeting when it went fully virtual online in 2020. And 69 countries here are represented. Digging in a little bit to the data, so the WHO identifies eight countries as carrying two thirds of the um, global incident tuberculosis cases. And here they are listed. In a typical in-person meeting in 2019, five of those eight countries are represented, but no one from Bangladesh, no one from Pakistan is there, no one from the Philippines is there. And overall, 51 people are able to participate. In contrast, when it went online, access opened up. We've got about four times more people from those highly um, endemic tuberculosis countries participating. And every single country on that, on that WHO list is there. We've got Bangladesh, we've now got Pakistan, we've now got the Philippines. Let's look at the example of a hybrid conference. So this happened this year. Um, it was in person in the United States and simultaneously streamed live and also available on demand to, for people to, to connect virtually. So in the in-person map, what we've got is participants typically from North America and the global north. The people that stayed and, and accessed it virtually here are largely from the global south. So now we've got people in countries in Latin America. We've got people in countries in Africa and Asia, all able to participate. The picture of this hybrid conference in terms of those eight tuberculosis countries, we've got only two countries that were able to travel and be there in person, um, totaling 14 people. In contrast, again, many more countries and many more people are connecting virtually. They stuck with the virtual option. So 56 people in total, 
from six of those highest um, highly endemic tuberculosis countries. So there are a couple of important elements to justice. One is equal opportunity, and another is equal participation. And unfortunately, what the data are telling us is that our classical in-person model is not particularly equitable or fair, but that when we move to a virtual platform, we offer access to many more people in many more corners of the earth, including where it's arguably most important for that theme of research. Another uncomfortable truth for us and that we should face, I think, is that not only are we not adequately promoting equity of participation, but with the in-person model, we are inadvertently, but now clearly, contributing to climate injustice. So let's look at this data first from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So today we have warmed up the planet by about 1.1 or 1.2 degrees C. So as a consequence today, we are experiencing extreme heat events about 4.8 times more likely than in the pre-industrial era. If we continue to warm up the planet and reach 1.5 degrees C, those extreme heat events become more frequent and more likely by 8.6 times. Those extreme heat events themselves are getting hotter. So those record-breaking temperatures that we experienced this year will be broken again and again. And those, um, those temperatures themselves are getting hotter. The heat waves will be hotter in the future. So what does this mean for us in science and in education? So did we follow a career in, in, in research or education because we had no other choice or we couldn't think of anything better to do? I think that many of us are driven by a passion for a, a subject, a curiosity for the world, a, a, a wish to do good in general, do something good and benefit society. We're motivated by all of this, um, but our goals of advancing progress, of perhaps opening doors and minds through education and knowledge, or wanting to add to and help create a happier and healthier and more equitable world, all of those things are undermined with climate change. And I would argue they're even reversed by climate change. So the chart here says future global warming levels. And the frightening reality is that that future is approaching us faster and faster. So today, we face a 50% chance or 50% risk of reaching that 1.5 degrees C of warming in the next nine years. So how old will you be nine years from now? Where do you hope to be? What do you hope to be doing? And what about for your loved ones? What will a world at 1.5 degrees C be like for all of us? So this is uncomfortable, but I think we need to face it. Um, this is an example of our own contribution to this global warming and this climate injustice. So an average in-person meeting on the topic of tuberculosis research attracts about 330 people. In doing so, it generates about 700 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents. Half a percent of that is from the ground transportation, 3.5% of that is from the accommodation, and here we have it, 96% of that is from our air travel. 
So 700 tons is the equivalent of burning 1,621 barrels of oil. And here is what one ton looks like in terms of volume. All of this, of course, is just the tip of the iceberg. I had to get that metaphor in. It doesn't represent our entire footprint over the course of a year. It only represents one thematic, um, one research theme. It doesn't represent all the conferencing that we do collectively as a sector across all our scientific societies. So does this matter to us at all? Does our contribution to climate change matter? So it matters to Aisha, who wants to study medicine in a university in Pakistan, but her home and her school were flooded and destroyed this year. So it's very difficult for her to study. It's very difficult for her to do her homework. It matters to someone I met last week, Tylo Ward, who had to make sure that the students in his care in his international study program were safe from dehydration um, and heat stroke. His students were in the UK this summer, which experienced a heat wave. He had to make sure that they had access to cooling centers. He also had to make sure that the students in his program in Spain were safe from smoke inhalation and the risk of forest fires. Tylo knows that it was the first year he had to care about this, but it certainly won't be the last. It matters to my colleague, Dr. Bartholomew Ondigo, who is a US Institutes of Health and Egerton University postdoc based in Kenya. So the drought in his country is so deep and so chronic that the land is completely dry. So when flooding happened um, in 2018, 200, almost 200 people died. It matters to thousands of US uh, students who, when they were surveyed, 94% of them said that their universities needed to be doing much more on climate action. It also matters to 233 editors in chief of health journals around the world who last year co-wrote a piece and said, as health professionals, we must do all we can to ensure a transition to a more sustainable, fairer, more equitable and healthier world. It matters to me, and I believe it matters to you too. So do we, do we respond? Do we do anything at all? And if we do respond, what are we set to lose? But what could we be in set for gaining? Um, we're gonna look at the data again. So, the virtual conference more than doubled the number of participants. Twice the number of countries were represented, including every single country um, that the WHO recognizes as highly um, endemic for tuberculosis. And to coin or to, to borrow a phrase from the UN SDGs, this model, the virtual model, makes sure that no one is left behind. From a climate justice perspective, the emissions were absolutely smashed. The virtual conference had more than 1,400 fold less carbon dioxide equivalents. The carbon footprint of that meeting was less than one ton, less than half a ton, excuse me. It did all of this and at the same time maintained a high quality scientific score. So in my view, the case for strengthening, investing in 
expanding our virtual programming is really clear. The virtual conferencing model has equity, sustainability, inclusion, um, access, all wrapped up in one. It's all there. I think that we all, including Keystone Symposium, should be proud of our virtual programming. It's your inclusive and global service. It's also your resilient service. It can withstand global disruptions, extreme weather events. It can withstand travel challenges like pandemics or other challenges. Um, for example, people choosing to connect virtually or other challenges with travel. For example, people choosing to connect virtually because they have to look after family members at home or they have clinical duties in their hospital or they have um, important experiments to run. They may also prefer virtual because of headaches with visas. They may not have the funds or be able to ask someone to pay for their travel. People may choose virtual because they're opting for low carbon lifestyles. So here is a panel from CAST, the Center for Climate Change and Social Transformations. And what it shows is that more people are willing than not to reduce their travel by plane. And that's true in Sweden, in the UK, in Brazil and in China. And um, this survey was over, uh, was over 3,500 people. So let us be inspired by what we've seen from Walter and Felix. Let us be inspired by the huge achievements from Keystone Symposium in 2020. We should be proud of our virtual programming. It's our equitable and sustainable service. And I wish that you also proud of yourselves. The next time you talk about the future, with your board members, with your colleagues, with your students, and also with your family members. Be proud of yourselves that you chose to act and you chose to do something positive. Thanks very much. Okay, well, thank you all for those really illuminating uh, presentations and I look forward to our discussion. Um, I see we're getting some questions into the Q&A box, so thank you, audience members. Um, please remember to vote on others' questions you'd like to hear answered so we can gauge your interests in each one as well. Um, I'd like to start out with a general question for all of you. Um, over the course of the pandemic, how did you see people's perception and opinions of virtual slash hybrid meetings and interfaces change compared to prior to that period of time? Maybe Walter, do you want I'm to? I'm happy to start. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Felix. So, um, in what I perceived as an observer of, of the events market, but also as a conference organizer at that time, there was an enormous spike and an enormous um, increase in, in requests um, and demand for virtual events, obviously, at the very beginning. Also, a bit of a um, a lack of information. Everyone was searching for information on, on you know, how to uh, establish uh, these new meetings best. Um, and I think what we all ex experienced over the course of the pandemic then is that the interest uh, stalled a little bit and then uh, decreased. And what we're currently seeing, and this might be the next question, is this uh, yeah, a huge research in, in getting back to physical events which um, is problematic, problematic when we just heard what Kate told us, right? Uh, so actually there is no going back to face-to-face -to -face meetings knowing what we know, but there's still this enormous drive um, uh, in the scientific uh, world and also in the non-scientific professional business events to go back to face-to-face -to -face events. Yeah, and I was gonna follow up with, oh, 
sorry, if you can all also in your answers include, I think, yeah, we are seeing kind of a fading of that enthusiasm now as we re-enter post-pandemic in-person conferences. So um, how do we still encourage people to engage with these virtual and hybrid formats moving forward? Sorry, go ahead, Walter. Well, I, I agree with uh, Felix uh, from my vantage point. Um, hand in hand with the pandemic was a surge in rolling out of new uh, technology that allows us to be part of uh, virtual environments. And so it's hard to separate how much of the pickup uh, was um, because of necessity and how much of it was because of excitement about new ways of participating in online uh, virtual events. We, for example, we uh, started some uh, fully immersive virtual reality online classes at Stanford. Um, they went really well. Um, some other universities did the same thing. Uh, Case Western, for example, for its first year medical students, had them do their anatomy labs using virtual cadavers and found that the retention of information was superior using the virtual environments as a way of learning because um, they were able, the students were able to learn at their own pace and go back and revisit the information uh, when at any time of the day, which they could not do when they they were doing the anatomy lessons uh, uh, at a scheduled time. So, but it's hard to separate how much of the interest was because of new technologies allowing us to do more and how much it was out of necessity. But either way, there's been a big surge. And I agree with you, because I don't think we're going backwards. I would add to that, Shannon, if I may. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I, I, I mean, I think we've, we've just all experienced that a completely different work, way of working is actually possible. Um, and to imagine that, you know, the scientific community developed vaccines against COVID uh, without these in-person meetings taking place, right? You know, fantastic things were possible. Um, and also just to, to share a co-benefit from the field that, that I've been working in, in global health, you know, we we saw that those of us based in the global north, we were not sort of traveling like mad um, um, as as many of us used to. And it just gave that breathing space for people in the global south to lead their own research as they should be. Um, so some of this behavior, um, you know, is there's, there's linkages with us being perhaps a little patronizing and um that was an interesting co-benefit that we saw and other colleagues of mine have said that they felt that more introverted characters were coming forward with with q a um and a little bit more interaction because it it might be easier for for for, for many of us to do that behind a screen as opposed to stand up and cue you know to get to the microphone so lots of different um, interesting co-benefits as well. That is interesting. We did see that with our Q&A for sure. There were a lot more questions of interest that people submitted from younger, more junior um, scientists and yeah, the engagement across the spectrum of different career stages as well. Um, and it is interesting that you mentioned uh, we were able to adapt to this virtual world for work and i think i you know you see all the articles about people now working remotely after the pandemic and wanting to stick with that even though they can go back to the office it seems like for conferences that is not the case for some reason people are more um willing to travel for those or want to get back to in person versus the day to day office um, tasks. Why do you think that is? And is there something we can do to kind of really remind them, encourage them that the virtual and hybrid options are beneficial and are something they should consider? I think the I answer. Think is... Go ahead, Walter. I'm, well, f from my vantage point, I think one of the reasons people like uh, having some aspect of a conference to go to is to uh, find their their future spouse or their future boyfriend or girlfriend or to connect. Uh, um, you know, there's so much we can do online, but there's some things that we just can't do 
um, unless we're together in person. And uh, so there are some strong motivations for reproduction that I think push us to sometimes get together in person. Interesting. I was uh, go going to say the exact same thing, Walter. Um, there's this missing element that has often been overlooked as a function in uh, scientific conferences. And it's this entire uh, personal motivation of meeting old friends, connecting with the community on a very personal level, hanging out at the bar uh, until the early morning hours. This is what people uh, have been doing and just want to go back to doing. So the question is really how can we or can we replicate this in virtual worlds? And I think a lot has to do with meeting design, with storytelling. Um, and um, I, I've, there are some examples where you know you frame an academic conference in an entire different way uh, as a virtual uh, summit hike, for example, with different um, um, stations in cottages, in virtual cottages, where people would hang out at uh, the campfire uh, and and um, have interdisciplinary conversations that are as much about personal uh, drive and passions as uh, about their um, discipline and their professional interests. So I think we have a lot of tools at hand in terms of storytelling, in terms of how we design these ultimately experiences that can help us replicate that to a certain degree. Not to 100% yet, <laughs> with the, the technologies you mentioned, this might be possible, but um, to a certain degree. Okay, Kate, do you yeah, I would, yeah, sure. I would also add that it, it, it doesn't have to be an either or approach. You know, I think, um, you know, there's still so much joy about meeting in person. Um, and it's not not to demonize in-person meetings or, or demonize flying, but rather we, you know, given what we've learned from the pandemic experience, given what we know about the data and the, and the reality of climate change, it's actually just about being mindful of all of that, being selective about the travel we do, you know, so do we need um to travel every month <laughs> um do we need that in-person meeting to happen annually or could it alternate um you know we it, yeah i think it's just about pre-pandemic for some of us hyper travel was kind of the default um and now you know we just need to think think about it be more selective um in, in what we participate in in person. Great. Um, I'll move on to some audience questions now. Our first question is, um, I find there is a huge inertia in the world of conference design from scientists. A lot of, this is how we've always been doing it and it's working fine. Um, how do you challenge the status quo in a respectful manner, keeping in mind that redesigning conferences requires time and thought? And I think this can apply to both in person and virtual and the hybrid kind of interactive format too. Well, I'll, I'll I think take that. Felix <laughs> might be a good idea. <laughs> um, uh, you know, he he spoke a lot about um, activating, which I thought um, was really interesting. So basically, having empathy for your audience, right? Um, and just, you know, walking yourself through their experience and then innovating, you know, we can, we can try something, iterate, you know, try it and get feedback and, um, you know, an iterative process of, of doing and, and learning. We, we're so comfortable with innovation, it, you know, it's our bread and butter, um, and we should just apply the same um you know spirit to to how we convene and, and 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 partner with others that are willing to you know test new approaches with us and i always um advise uh, organizations when they start rethinking their scientific events they don't have to have to overhaul the entire thing all at once it's sometimes good to just have one experimental module where you try new things um, you see if you achieve your objectives if your participants are 
satisfied with this and then you can expand on that um, i think uh, that would be a respectful way to um, incrementally change but i think this change is badly needed we are using the same blueprints that we are you know have um, brought from the 50s and 60s <laughs> to stay provocative on that end and, and you've seen some of the the photos that i shown these are the general experience in a face-to-face -face event um, all around the world so yeah taking it slow um, but planning strategically showing that there are different routes to achieving the same objectives um, and keeping the zeitgeist changing uh, target groups in mind i think that's a really good point yeah go ahead walter sure. well from my vantage point um i think it's critical that we start um, exploring and um, moving forward with new designs uh, for all the reasons that have previously been uh, discussed uh, for equity, for reducing carbon footprint. But I also think to have more efficient meetings. I think we do need to, uh, I think we need to be a bit more aggressive about this, frankly. I think there are ways that work is changing and uh, it will move over to the conference arena and i think we need to sort of get ahead of it before the disruption that happens that will come from um, the tech sector that will give us new ability to do things but those groups that don't start designing and incorporating it and figuring out what works what doesn't work uh, are are going to be not innovating and moving things forward they're going to be trying to catch up and i think uh I think those groups that uh, see that new ways of interacting are already in place and are evolving and can shape it will we'll be in a better position. So I, I think it's not a matter of uh, um, how to do it uh, carefully. I think it's a matter of how, how to do it uh, defensively because otherwise uh, things are going to, you know, you'll, you'll be left behind. Yeah, I really, uh, that theme of kind of experimenting with new ways to do conferences is a really interesting parallel. And I think that makes sense. Um, and to change one, one or two small, smaller aspects of a full meeting at a time would be more manageable for conference organizations, testing out new things, as well as the attendees kind of getting their bearings. Um, but at the same time, yeah, evolving forward with new strategies. Um, speaking of new strategies, with hybrid events, I think a lot of us have been experimenting with different ways to integrate the in-person attendees with the virtual or remote attendees. Um, and I think we've been successful in being able to offer the science and the content to both. Um, but it seems that the interactivity part is a challenge. And whereas in virtual meetings, the interactivity was all within one audience, which was the remote audience. It seems challenging to creatively come up with ideas to get interactions between in-person attendees and remote attendees. Um, do any of you have any thoughts about how that can be achieved to make these audiences more interactive and more engaged with each other? I, I think we have to look to our colleagues and friends in the uh, uh, online gaming community where they find ways to engage people, uh, leverage the power of storytelling, leverage the power of fun. But there's no reason why we can't have a scavenger hunt, for example, that involves uh, finding things uh, using you know, many people. We can assume people have, uh, to some degree, smartphones. Uh, we could place in the real world virtual objects that maybe you have to team with someone who is in the, the online world to solve a problem, to, to have your team be the one that finds the flag. Uh, but it can be integrating people in the, the virtual world with people in the real world working together to have some fun and to do something. So I think we just have to be creative about how to blend and uh, create fun experiences for people so they can get to know each other, you know, take advantage of each other's skills and, uh, work together to solve a problem. That's a really fun idea. Hope to be able to do it soon with our attendees. 
<laughs> Felix, did you have anything to add? I was very excited about um, the potential of hybrid experiences and, and, and events for a long time. And then I ex was involved in producing some and I found out it's incredibly um, tough to um, deliver a polished hybrid event that is you know satisfies the needs of on-site uh, delegates and uh, online um, delegates at the same time while allowing them to to mingle and exchange um, across these two different media or dimensions i found that it you need to do this properly you need two different um, direction tracks two different schedules basically that overlap at certain amounts of time you need the technology and you can do that but this is then uh, down to uh in, an increase in a production budget that um, most in most cases in the field and organizations do not have available. Therefore, I think you know what was mentioned before, and in the case that uh, case uh, Kate mentioned, um, the broadcasting op option is is simple, is a good way to allow um, remote audiences um, participate participation. You can use, of course, Slido. Um, um, online polling systems um, and other ways to integrate that are a bit higher level than just chat and text chat. Um, this can already be very helpful for um, for activating interaction. Um, but I really want to make a point again and, and um, argue for the distributed solution, a, um, a series of smaller um, networked face-to-face -face events that are connected with online um, interactions over time. And in, in my experience and the organizations that I worked with, this has been extremely successful in bringing people from different continents together um, and giving different opportunities and time to co uh, connect and then still allowing on-site personal um, meetings um, in the different hubs um, so you don't have to travel far. You can stay in your cities desynchronized uh, hybrid solutions, you can call that. Yeah, I think um, I've been I've been thinking a little bit about, you know, if you were hosting a party or hosting, you know, throw, having a wedding and you had, you know, you were going to do it hybrid, it would be a, a real headache, right? You'd have these two audiences. Um, you, you need to offer something special to both. Um, so in, 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 in the vein that Felix was, was describing, you know, setting up sort of um, scheduling one-to-one -one interactions perhaps with for the virtual participants with some of those VIPs that are attending, with the journal editors, the funders, the thought leaders. So, you know, you get a chance for 10, 15 minutes one-to-one -one on, on your Zoom connection or whatever it is um, with some of those um, with some of those people, or um, um, you know, small small group discussions, as as Felix said, at different time zones, um, you know. So offering something special um, to the different audiences, and um, um, you know, not not having the virtual component as a kind of a second class offering, or as a kind of incidental. Our thing, but actually thinking with empathy uh, about what is what is interesting for that audience. Yeah, that asynchronous um, hybrid style is interesting, and actually leads into one of our audience questions um, about how do you overcome time zone differences for global, virtual, and hybrid conferences? Um, are there other ideas you have for kind of yeah bridging those time zone issues? Coffee is a good one. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's like one a.m. for you right now. So <laughs> it, yeah, but it—I mean, it just really helped that I was able to pre-record. You know, just simple things like that. Um, I'm not sure that I really have the answers, but again, you know, exploiting what what Felix is raising—that it doesn't have to be a one-shot. Um, program in, in one period of time, you can have a number of interactions that are more favorable for, for your dif different people in the audience. 
over a few days, for example, that that would help certainly. I, I think if uh, the goal of a conference is to convene, connect, and to uh, inform, the information part, uh, we can leverage the power of uh, different time zones by having different uh, speakers present at different times, have the information be uh, recordable and playbackable at different times in other time zones there, there's a way to leverage and make the fact that people are in different time zones provide more ways of being together and connecting with different groups so i i think it is a challenge but i think as felix uh, has pointed out that design can help us here and we can make make the fact that we have a hybrid if we have a hybrid meeting we can have things be pre-recorded uh, as Kate did, available 24 seven for a conference that goes uh, round the clock with people checking in for different times. It, it's just a matter of sort of changing the way we look at what a conference should be. But frankly, when I fly uh, to uh, another time zone to give a talk, I'm often uh, at a disadvantage because I'm out of sync with uh, the other people who are physically there. So have a conference that takes place over a 24 hour period where everybody can come in when they're at their peak, share information, listen to other information that was uh, presented earlier when they're alert, I, I think would, and, and give their presentations when they're alert, I think would actually be uh, an advantage. Interesting. Yeah, I think a lot of times we do think about um, the time zone issue with virtual, but we forget when we actually have to travel, we <laughs> have the jet lag issue, which is a similar kind of challenge for attendees. Felix. In, in, in 2020, we, um, I was faced with the task of uh, digitizing the conference, this international science conference that I mentioned on my first slide, the Falling Walls Conference in Berlin. It's an annual conference with 800 people, Nobel laureates, high level uh, speakers, young and old. Um, and what we did, basically, we uh, dismantled the entire concept of a, a two day conference and turned it into a 10 day TV program with networking uh, opportunities with online uh, AI powered networking with breakouts, etc. But it was basically over 10 days, 12 hour full program uh, presentations by hundreds of scientists, young and old science engagement uh, professionals with a global hour at a compatible time zone uh, at I think around 1 p.m. Uh, CEST um, so that everyone would get the, you know, the essentials and get an overview of the program that was the offer to all the time zones and for the rest of the time people could join whenever they were able to or watch it all on demand that's of course another beauty of virtual that you can watch it afterwards very true um one of our audience members has a question about the kind of satellite hub and spoke kind of meeting format um, and what would the relative impact of satellite locations be versus requiring all attendees to travel to a single location for in-person um, with regards to maybe carbon footprint and all these integrative features? Okay, do you have an idea of how that might impact yeah, I, footprint? So the location of a meeting relative to the audience, of course, does matter. Um, in my field of global health, um, a meeting just took place last month, approximately 5,000 people. It's often on the east coast of the United States, and this year it was in Seattle. That's just going to bump up your carbon emissions overall, um, because either people are traveling from within the states, and those people traveling from Europe from Africa are just going to be doing what four hours ish more travel so it, it, it does matter um, and then so having your regional hubs can help particularly if those hubs are accessible by overland uh, transportation particularly train that can really help um, yeah, so that, that, that is definitely one, one option. Anyone else? I would also um, 
apply Walter's method of looking beyond our own uh, sector uh, to different industries. And if we look to uh, the corporate world, um, these multi-hub, so-called multi-hub solutions are already um, well established. Um, I know that Siemens here in Germany, of course, global uh, corporate organization, they have synchronized multi-hub events. Um, so they link up uh, um, employees in their global sites uh, at the same time uh, using high-powered uh, latest-gen technology to bring them together at the same time and eliminate any travel costs. So that would you know, lead to the same carbon footprint, I guess, uh, or very similar to a complete virtual event. Great. Walter, do you have anything to add? Well, just that um, I think maybe we'll see people who do satellite hub hopping, where they'll go to one hub for you know one event and go to another hub for another event to un learn virtual, uh, you know, the different regions and their their differences. Uh, no, I, th I think it's an uh, it's a wonderful model that uh, facilitates uh, um, you know the reducing cost and carbon footprint, and yet. Uh, providing a way for people to get together in person, yet also be connected. So I, I love that design. Great. Um, a question that's kind of come up in a few different ways here is um, how, because as we discussed before, some it seems people are getting a little bit more reluctant these days to having to going virtually or doing the hybrid options. How can scientific societies who are holding meetings advocate for these virtual options to both, in our case, we have scientific organizers who they want to have their meeting in person and no, no compromise there. Like we just feel so strongly that we yeah, are not interested in virtual, um, as well as attendees, getting them excited about the virtual or hybrid option. Um, so yeah, not just internally making that decision as an organization, but having our attendees and constituents kind of also be on board with that. Well, I, for, for me, it's a matter of showing, uh, the value, um, and, you know, some of the information that Kate presented, for example, is very persuasive. But also, if we can say this will allow you to reach more people at a lower cost and uh, or put that extra funding into bringing in uh, underserved uh, groups that should be at the conference. I, I think it's a matter of just sort of understanding the value and then presenting it in a compelling way. Uh, and that's how you persuade people. And I think that it's a matter of collecting the data doing the analysis and then thinking creatively about why this will be, be better. And then, um, and if it is better for that particular organization and it then just sell it really. Yeah, I, I agree with Walter. I think there's a lot about how we frame it, how we brand it actually, you know, and going green is the cool thing, right? <laughs> um, it's certainly, you know, different groups are really attracted by the sustainable choices and the, and the sustainable brands. Um, you know, simple things like registration. Um, you know, if you're offering a hybrid, um, event, you know, registration for both virtual and in, and in person, um, tracks is available at the same time. But I, I do think that there can be um, like almost a fear that, you know, if you're a scientific organizer of, a, of, a, of one of these events, you're kind of throwing a party, right? And you want people to come, you want people to show up, you're, you're trying to attract people. So I think there is a fear that people won't come if, um, if it's virtual and, and, you know, that would be a, a huge disappointment, of course. And if you offer this parallel track um, through a hybrid, then people will opt for that rather than show up and you won't have that, you know, nice in-person feeling. Um, so I think s sometimes there is a kind of a fear that people won't show up to your party. And again, 
just repeating what Walter said, that it, it's about framing it in a positive way, branding it, and actually the virtual component, I think is the growth area. You know, more and more people are gonna be attracted to that um, as time goes by. I'll, I'll just add that when it comes to convincing organizations um, in favor of uh, virtual events, I think, um, Providing the choice, but educating about the differences, just like Kate did today. And, you know, this is the exact uh, uh, numbers for uh, the carbon footprint of your uh, physical event and, and for your virtual event. You can choose, you know, but then again, I think on the long term, we'll only convince participants, delegates, scientists with more attractive event formats. And Kate, you mentioned the word party a few times. If we can get across the message that this is um, an output oriented scientific exchange format, right? We're talking about papers and posters and some of the things we need, maybe need to discuss today because digitizing papers and posters and uh, giving access to them on the, over long time sustainably is another um, major advantage of digital events. But ultimately, I'm going back to my main point, we need to make these events more attractive, a little bit like a party, a little mm -hmm. bit like a, a social event you would attend. And, and why not? And um, this dry um, environment with dry presentations, with a matter of factly mood, um, I think we have to see it as a bit broader um, experiment has been mentioned and um, we we won't be able to convince people otherwise if we don't tackle this key problem of um, you know, attraction and incentives mm -hmm. um, that kind of brings us to a question about yeah the fact that we we rely on the in-person attendance often for the financial viability of the conference. Um, and currently the hybrid or virtual attendance is not nothing, but it's not huge. So it can't necessarily cover the costs of doing so. Um, what do you guys see as a sustainable way for organizations to be able to offer that as hopefully that audience grows to be able to then cover its own costs. Um, but in the interim, um, organizations are having to invest more than those options are bringing in um, when it comes to allowing remote participation. Well, for this situation, time is on our side. Uh, the cost of and ways of doing uh, hybrid events uh, will be coming down as technology improves and also as more, you know, as we see hybrid events occur in our work environment more, our educational environment, as as this becomes, you know, something not just for scientific conferences, but for, for the way we do things, um, it will become a lot easier. And I think it really, you know, to Felix's theme, uh, it's really a matter of good design. And I think uh, if one can model out how many more people one can reach and what the right pricing is to uh, be able to cover the cost of reaching and having more people attend. It's a matter of business engineering and also anticipating change and also looking downstream. If you don't invest in making this change, even if it maybe costs a little bit of money now, where will you be vis-a-vis -vis other conferences that people may choose to start going to over yours because they provide greater access? So it's a matter of analysis and thinking and design. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that's absolutely spot on, Walter. So it's a little bit longer term thinking, um, adapting our business model. So innovation again, right? But, but in the business paradigm that we're operating, um, um, I would offer that, you know, in a similar vein, universities and other academic institutions are, th are, are thinking critically about their air travel. Um, and I've seen one really interesting new uh, travel policy from the University of Oxford in the UK. There are a number of things in the 
policy around um, prioritizing train travel, prioritizing virtual attendance. And actually, if people do choose to fly, um, they need to pay a levy of, I think it's 35 pounds um, on each tonne carbon dioxide equivalent that that air travel will, uh, will generate. And that doesn't disappear outside of the organization uh, to some carbon offsetting program that is invested back in to the sustainability agenda and the sustainability program um, of the university. So we could we could take you know ideas like that um, to to help finance some some of this investment that's needed. Um, and I'd also maybe offer you know novel funding streams and novel um, sources of sponsorship out there. So it's not just you know the the academic sphere that's interested in decarbonizing you know um uh private sector your all, all sorts of stakeholders and players are wanting to shrink and reduce their own footprint and are looking for partners doing the same so you know your virtual or your hybrid offering might be a fantastic place um to find novel novel sponsors and and potentially new uh financing streams i really love that um one observation is of course that the cost for travel by plane especially but also with other modes should be higher if we took into account um, the carbon um, uh, emissions etc but they are not yet and until then you know regulations will come sooner or later that will increase the pr prices for for in presence events they are already by the way in the entire meetings events market uh, costs for running events are going up so um i would um agree with walter that time is on our side also in <laughs> in that respect um and i love these creative approaches in in setting systemic uh, incentives you know, using larger platforms like universities, associations to set a new tone, a new culture that will more or less um, equalize the the, um, the current situation in terms of incentives, penalties. You know, this is an opportunity to be very creative. And I think we can get some hybrid vigor, for example, if we were to take the hub and spoke model and maybe co-conference with a adjacent field to a particular theme of a conference where, you know, because we can bring in people to meet physically and also have people meet virtually, uh, why not have team with a few other conferences share not necessarily the content, but share the fun part where you can meet uh, at a satellite physical location, do something with someone who is not in your field, but in a nearby field, or maybe a completely different field. So the recreational socializing part could be more diverse and the knowledge transfer part could be specific. There's, there's ways we can leverage this new way of meeting in a way that allows us to do things that we couldn't do before. And I, th I think that's what we need to lean on in on is what what is amazing that we can do by these new models and emphasize that as a way of uh, of growing attendance and uh, making things more productive. Great. Well, we're nearing the end of our time today, so I want to kind of go through and ask each of you, is there anything that you didn't get to share yet that you really want to share with our audience or any concluding thoughts from you today about this discussion and to kick off the meeting? Well, my only I observation would be, go ahead, Kate. We have a little bit of a lag in here. Go ahead. <laughs> There's a time difference between Japan and Germany. Um, yeah, I would just maybe offer that it, I think, you know, being conscious and facing the difficulties, you know, the harsh realities and the challenges, but framing this in, you know, in an upbeat, positive way, there's so much to be gained. It's an opportunity and let's, you know, innovate. It's what we do best. 
and let's apply it to this challenge. And I would add to that that um, for this initial session, I think uh, the organizers did a really good job in bringing the different perspectives together that are needed to solve this challenge right now. That is the sustainability lens that is uh, first and foremost the one that we need right now, the technology that will bring us a lot of solutions and has already brought us a lot of solutions facilitating that exchange in the future, and then the human side that often overlooked <laughs> hopefully will come back into play even more so um this was a very well-rounded um first conversation i have with you. i think in terms of um things that i did not have a chance to go into uh before i i did some work maybe 10 years ago working with some uh um combat veterans who had post-traumatic stress. And when I asked them about, and we were using virtual environments as for exposure therapy to help treat their, their, um, their clinical condition. When I asked them how they stayed in touch with uh, their friends and their family when they were deployed, I expected they would say, well, we would have phone calls or we would do video conferences. They said, no, we met in World of Warcraft, one of the uh, you know, multi-user online environments. And when I asked, well, why did you meet your mom or your sister in World of Warcraft? Are they gamers too? They said, no, but we could do things. We could go for a walk. Instead of just talking and looking at each other's face or just hearing each other's voice, we could walk around and do something, turn over some rocks or see what's over here. The point is that I think as technology evolves and as scientific conferences, scientists are pretty creative and i think we can take what is new about um, uh, technology that allows us to do amazing things that we otherwise can't do build experiences that are more robust more refined more creative more informative by uh, evolving how we do our conferences uh, as uh, felix pointed out earlier things haven't changed for a long time but now now we can and i think we can get ahead of the curve and be the innovators to show the rest of the conference world, you know, one way to go. Well, thank you all so much. You've given us a lot of food for thought here, um, a lot of creative ideas to pursue. Um, and we hope to see you at the networking lounge and at the other events during the meeting. Thank you so much for your time. Um, now, as we wrap up this session, um, we'd like to show some of the polling results from that we took earlier when we started. Mitch, if you can put some of those up on screen. So we've got a breakdown of who's in attending as a organizer of scientific conferences versus as an attendee or both. And our next poll. And who is willing, who is taking climate change and their carbon footprint into account when deciding about traveling for meetings? Impressively 70, almost 77% of the audience. So that's great. Everyone's got that on their mind. Um, please note that all the sessions for the conference will be available on demand after the event, um, likely by the end of the week. Again, that was all open, open open access. So if you think of anyone who you know who find any of this content interesting or useful, please share. We will now take a 30 minute break and see you back here at 1.30 p.m. Eastern for our next session on best practices, challenges, and solutions for virtual conferencing. See you soon. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to day two of the Reimagining Scientific Conferences e-Symposium. Our first session today is on technologies, tools, and platforms to facilitate virtual conferencing. Today, we will hear from leading innovators in digital platform technologies about current and future capabilities to connect scientists around the globe and beyond. They will showcase their latest technologies and how platforms are designed to optimize connections and collaborations to better recapitulate in-person interactions and outcomes. I'd also like to encourage everyone to participate in the interactive features of this event, including the discussion forums and gamification challenges, which can be found on the main menu on the left side of the event space. Please share your thoughts and experiences with the community and feel free to start your own discussion forum topic. 
Now I'd like to welcome our speakers. As a reminder, you can submit your questions for our speakers at any time into the Q&A tab and vote on other questions you'd like to hear answered. Please specify if your question is for a specific speaker as we will be doing a group Q&A after the next four presentations. And our first presentation today is Bob Valles, the co-founder and CEO of EventMobi, our sponsor and platform for this event. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me today. Thank you, Shannon, and everyone at Keystone, um, and everybody that actually is participating uh, for this amazing event. is um, It's just uh, breathtaking to see so many event planners that want to give up the learnings we've had over the past two years and want to take advantage of uh, the impact of hybrid events and, uh, and virtual events uh, in terms of reducing um, impact on uh, climate, uh, increasing diversity for and um, accessibility by attendees and speakers. So as a tech provider, I'm really happy to uh, to see so many passionate people around this and not everybody is immediately trying to go back in person, even though that is kind of the beginning uh, of EventMobi. So we started as an event app um, and before pandemic, we were probably one of the top three sort of providers globally for in-person events. Uh, so I want to go through this journey and share a, share a story with you uh, and also um, talk about how we approach uh, event technology uh, design and how we work with our customers. Hopefully some of the tips and the stories I share today resonate with you and uh, some insight uh, kind of takes its way back to your day-to-day uh, -day work. But uh, probably the best way, and this is how I used to start my presentations at the beginning of the pandemic. It was a joke to, sh to shed light on the challenge we had all of a sudden transitioning into into an online environment. It, it went like this. It went a planner and attendee and a speaker uh, and a sponsor walk into a bar at a hybrid event. The attendee orders a new login because uh, they can't, uh, 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 they forgot their password. Uh, the uh, speaker uh, is on mute, no one can hear him. The sponsor orders a new, uh, more traffic to the virtual booth because no one's there. And the planner is not even at the event because they got the time zone wrong. So. I, obviously, we fix all these problems, um, not, uh, but uh, in a way, our challenges are very different today uh, than it was at the beginning of the pandemic. It's not, uh, it's really about inability to forecast um, attendance. Uh, some of the sessions I listened to yesterday, um, it, it was very clear that is, um, and, and even the poll results um, uh, was showing that even for people that are attending here, is, it's a wide distribution. And I think as uh, as the economy changes and our situation changes, um, it even adds more complexity. Rising cost, uh, lack of um, staff uh, that have experience running these types of events is a challenge. I know we work with a, quite a, a few associations and nonprofits, but half of our business is actually on that side of the business. And one of the biggest challenges is actually keeping their staff. While all this stuff is happening, uh, have to, uh, you, you have to deal with more technology, uh, you're tasked with running more events because people say, oh, it's a, it's a webinar. Well, the webinars are not like what it used to be three years ago. Uh, there are a lot, uh, they take a lot more to design and implement. Uh, and at the same time, um, lead times have shortened. So these are the challenges and, uh, that, that our customers are facing today. And as, um, and as a tech company, we have to innovate and keep up uh, and address some of these, uh, some of these challenges. So, in 2020, um, we took our event app and uh, we knew we had a we have an amazing platform, very engaging, very flexible to create different experiences. What we really needed was ability to um, help our customers uh, sort of embed uh, live broadcast, uh, interactive breakout rooms, uh, sort of one on one video chat, so we could actually continue these conversations uh, online. Now uh, the world has changed. Uh, and we have to reimagine the way we approach uh, technology, uh, event technology design to address some of these challenges for you guys. And um, we use a particular philosophy, both in terms of the experience that we believe attendees are expecting today, as well as the experience that the event planners um, are, um, are, are going through uh, as it has changed quite a bit. So on the attendee side, uh, it goes without saying, um, you know, it's 
in person. It's a physical experience. We move in, into a grand space. Uh, we use all our senses uh, in an online environment. We have our keyboard, mouse, and screen that we have to, um, that we have to use. Uh, and the way we have to think about the design of these experiences uh, online is adding sort of studios, production, so we can kind of grab attention for attendees. Time is a big uh, difference. Um, being able to allow attendees the option uh, to consume content on their own time uh, is critical, whereas everything for in-person event happens uh, in real time. Uh, there is a huge difference in terms of commitment attendees make. Um, yesterday at the, um, at the last networking session, we were talking about this, and uh, it's very apparent that when you attend an in-person event, uh, there's a major financial and time commitment, so you are invested a lot more than if you just signed up 30 minutes before a webinar begins. But at the same time, there, is, there are advantages um, that I think from a technology point of view, we can leverage. We can run marketing all the way till the event starts, um, but that requires really seamless integration between the marketing en engine uh, for your event and the experience and the way the ticket processing kind of works so that they can kind of log in seamlessly. Uh, their engagement experiences are different um, for remote audiences uh, and uh, in-person audiences. And, uh, you know, talking about sponsorship, you probably have experienced this quite a bit. In-person sponsorship is about brand, um, visual brand marketing that leads into deep conversation and sometimes decision making at the event. That's not really how online events work and trying to replicate that is a bit challenging. Uh, it, these programs have to be part of the program. So building uh, tools from a technology point of view to enable uh, event planners to um, embed sort of sponsors into their content uh, and then identify those attendees that are interested to enable the sponsor to have conversation post-event is critical and is a very different strategy uh, in a way um, for, um, for online events. So that's just half the battle. That's really what attendees uh, really go through on a on a day to day basis, and I think if we are trying to drive a higher adoption of virtual events and hybrid events, and uh, really, especially with this group here, the focus is on um, um, sort of encouraging attendees to uh, participate remotely, so we can reduce the number of events that they have to travel to. We really have to pay attention to these, both in terms of the technology use as well as the event design. Um, but the other half of the battle is what you all go through on the other end as, as event planners. So uh, we had to relook at the way um, the event life, life cycle happens. Um, and uh, over the next year, we're actually dabbling into a few features um, to enable you to bring in, hopefully your Excel sheets into a platform and your team into one cohesive place to uh, have clear event design, communicate your timeline, your budgets, uh, staffing, and I know with most event teams now distributed, uh, this collaborative environment is a really critical part of the event uh, to make sure it's successful. Uh, again, I talked about event marketing. That has been a solution that EventMobi has offered over the past um, decade or so. Uh, we are working on that to enable uh, a seamless uh, integration between uh, the way ticket types work and the way experiences happen on a hybrid um, uh, in a hybrid environment. So lots of sort of innovation that's coming in the uh, in the next year or so. Uh, we've always been really strong in terms of helping you manage content, but this is now becoming even more difficult. Um, Pre-recording sessions uh, for virtual events uh, are new, whereas before you just had to collect abstracts, for example. So there's a lot of development that we hope to um, to uh, release in the in the coming year. But the focus is really enabling you to simplify and automate as much as possible of the content uh, management um, here. <clears throat> as well as the design of your event space, your virtual space, your event app, uh, the live uh, sort of engagement experiences. And then the, the event happens. The event happens and the tools that we have uh, have had to evolve, uh, both for in-person um, uh, planners, uh, as well as the ones that are managing a uh, virtual environment. You have uh, the live stream and the breakout sessions happening while you also your team also needs to manage session check-in for people that are on site. Your digital signage might have opportunities to, um, to connect your audiences, uh, both remote and in person. Polls and uh, gamifications, again, this used to be only for people 
uh, that are attending the event, then it was only for people that are virtual. And then now I, we have an opportunity to create shared experiences. Uh, same thing goes for your sponsors. Uh, lead capture now can happen online on the virtual booth and with their staff that are on site. So how do we kind of combine these experiences so everybody uh, benefits during um, the event? Um, dashboard design is, is a major um, uh, sort of um, focus for Event Mobi for 2023. We've been really strong in terms of uh, analytics, really deep analytics, but sometimes it's just too much data is not good data. Um, so there's a lot of it available now and we hope to make it a lot easier and actually take it a level um, higher. So what uh, we are hoping to do is to bring this level of analytics at your organization level so you can actually have uh, portfolio level analytics. And I think that's really helpful to be able to, to take advantage of the change that's happening uh, within um, a lot of societies um, and associations, which is turning their sort of what used to be event apps then became virtual platforms into a year round uh, community uh, because you can run your webinars and uh, you can actually uh, provide um, access to uh, in person chapter meetings as well as your annual conference all in one place. So it sounds sounds really easy to do, uh, but we kind of realize um, there is a massive amount of shortage of uh, staff within our our, um, uh, our customers, uh, and there was an opportunity for us to help there. So we've actually developed a fairly significant number of uh, different services uh, from a live stream production that you're experiencing here today uh, to helping with on-site video integration if you're using an on-site a video company, um, uh, as well as everything in terms of managing uh, breakout sessions, uh, editing videos, recording content, managing your speakers. A lot of that has actually amplified um, with hybrid events. And we believe having uh, the right level of services is as crucial uh, as our um, technology. So you're looking at this slide deck now and you're like, oh my God, this is what I do every day. and and you can kind of have a feeling of how um, um, demanding um, it, it, it feels when you kind of put it all together. And I think from a technology point of view, there's a massive opportunity to simplify these, uh, make teams a lot more um, uh, efficient in a way that they communicate and they organize uh, this content. So I have another maybe uh, six or seven minutes left. Uh, I decided not to do a demo of Evamobi because you're actually using Evamobi. I mean, this is an, an example of how Keystone is designing for an event like this, but it is very flexible and can change. Instead, I thought I'd talk about two topics that Shannon uh, thought would be, uh, would be very beneficial. Uh, one, um, how do we drive um, meaningful, lasting um, um, uh, sort of connections between attendees? Um, in a way that uh, they're either within uh, the different audiences we have or between uh, remote and in person. And this is not a new question. We've thought about this um, and we've actually thought about from a technology point of view uh, to solve it. And there are four different technology elements you need regardless of the tool that you use to, to really accomplish this. But the, the secret sauce is really you and the way you design the experience uh, to make that happen. So let me put this in a, in a maybe in a different way. So the four different tech technology elements that you need uh, is ability to have a live stream, which is almost, I think about it as the opening keynote. I am almost anonymous. My video is off. All I'm doing is consuming content. This is the best way to warm up your attendees into your community uh, and get them comfortable. And you take them into a breakout session where the video is on. Maybe they're not communicating uh, as um, uh, or interacting as much, but now there is a smaller sort of group setting element. Uh, you can take that into the next level and you can have workshops that's more collaborative. You have whiteboards and so on. Again, that allows people to have more interaction. And, but the key here is to try to build up this comfort level for your attendees. This is true for in-person events. Imagine if you just show up at an event and then the first thing they do is like, go have a chat with that guy over there at the corner. Well, that sometimes happens in a hallway conversation, but it's not really lasting and deep connection. Really what happens is when we have repetition. So we 
uh, see the same person in a different session. We have different type of experiences. And over the days of the conference, or maybe even in some cases, uh, next year you run into someone that you had a conversation. And that's really how these rela relationships uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, blooms. And it's the same thing for online events. I think there, there's an opportunity to curate these experiences um, and not randomize it. Um, and that really lies in, uh, in the power of the uh, event design. Now, the big question that, was, uh, that, that always comes up is how do I connect my in-person and remote audience? And I have a very controversial way of answering it, uh, which is maybe you don't need to do that. And it really depends on your audience. Uh, we have customers that their online community uh, would never attend their in-person events. And they have these um, you know, tens of thousands of um, sort of people that are at the different maybe skill level uh, ability or even the desire to want to participate uh, uh, for an in-person conference. Um, but sometimes you have people at the same skill level that they just make a choice uh, based on the requirements or ability at that moment to be able to attend a conference in person or virtual. So if it's completely separate and you can make that decision, uh, you can uh, kind of focus on these experiences completely separately based on these audiences. And when it, you do need to create these shared experiences, you can use the time that they're live together or create a pre-event uh, sort of experience or a post-event activity for them uh, to kind of create these shared uh, experiences. Now, these are, uh, again, very different for, for each event, uh, but it really lies in a way that um, event planners have been designing experiences. So less about technology, more about uh, event design. Uh, but what is really powerful, I think, in a hybrid environment is that uh, pre-pandemic, uh, we usually, for a lot of scientific uh, conferences, it was either biannual or annual, people attend um, to present and um, you generally have once once a year to be able to meet uh, your colleagues. Now, being able to have these experiences throughout the year and create these micro experiences uh, using an event community is really, really powerful. And I kind of um, uh, I kind of think about this uh, as uh, breathing. Um, uh, event communities are not online social platforms. They don't have to be on all the time. You can use your annual conference, your virtual events your webinars, your, your in-person uh, chapter meetings, all as a way to uh, sort of breathe in and connect your audience and then let them explore the platform and content uh, and interact with other um, sort of um, uh, stakeholders um, uh, on your platform between these events. So uh, happy if anyone wants to connect with me and brainstorm, happy to do that. Uh, we also have Allison on our team here um, attending the event, we're happy to kind of share some of these experiences with you. So I thought the best way to kind of make this 20 minute count is start with a joke and end with a tip on how to save money. So I know this is uh, front and center for a lot of our nonprofit um, customers um, and associations. And, uh, and I've actually shared this with a few, um, with a few of you. So um, uh, hopefully uh, this is not repetitive. Uh, but the first thing I think for um, a lot of um, our customers that are in the nonprofit sector, um, they don't uh, really understand uh, the vendor's cost model. And I think that's the beginning um, sort of part of trying to negotiate and try to understand how you can get uh, a better deal or where where is this technology going to go? Is it getting more expensive or not? Now, if you're dealing with an AV company and your, your agency, their cost model is, um, is massively um, sort of uh, human driven. So as uh, salaries are increasing, their cost is increasing. So there are different ways uh, to negotiate with them. For a tech company like Eventmobi, uh, a huge cost for us, our R&D cost is almost fixed regardless of who we're supporting. The rest of it is sales and marketing. So when you're negotiating retention and ability to keep you as a customer is front and center. So just um, maybe keep that in mind in a way that has impact. Now, the cost of live streaming and particularly hybrid events, um, the labor cost is increasing, but the technology cost is, is decreasing. Um, the, the other thing to keep in mind is, is we're all saying we're all all-in-one tools, you know, from EventMobi uh, to Zoom to small um, entrant uh, sort of new startups in the market, everyone is saying they're all-in-one. So it's, I, I, I feel for everyone that is trying to make a decision how to decipher that, but in, in some situations, different companies have 
focused on different areas. So if you can actually compromise and maybe use the same vendor for multiple uh, actions, I, I definitely recommend that. The other thing that's really powerful is teaming up with your um, uh, other sister organizations or other uh, or, uh, nonprofits that you have a close relationship and increase your buying power. Uh, software companies, are, are, because sales and marketing is a huge portion of it, they can actually offer a better deal if you have a bigger buying power. And the last two points here is obviously multi-year contract. And I know this is very difficult uh, to even hear uh, because who knows what's going to happen even in two months. Uh, but really, that's a big factor um, in terms of uh, cost uh, management for you and be able to negotiate. Uh, and uh, definitely um, try to think about if your provider has professional services to augment your team so you don't have to hire too many people or you don't have to use agencies as the, the way tech companies price professional services is really to sell the software, not really to generate a lot of revenue. So that's a great opportunity to see if they have that expertise um, to help you. Uh, and the last point here is if you have sponsors, look for a platform that allows you to maximize the sponsor opportunities uh, and hopefully uh, reduce the cost of these platforms. Again, thanks everybody uh, for your time. It's great to be here and thanks for your effort uh, and your focus on this uh, critical uh, challenge for our industry. Uh, Shannon, I'll uh, pass it on uh, back to you uh, with the rest of the program. Great, thanks so much, Bob, for those great tips at the end and the whole um, presentation, really informative. Our next speaker is Adam Frisbee, co-founder and chief product officer at SineWave Entertainment, who will showcase their visionary platform. You know what, that is the uh, the very stereotypical way that to start something uh, on an online event. Um, thank you very much for the, the welcome there. Um, and uh, yes, I, I'd love to talk a bit about Breakroom. So Breakroom is a little bit different to most online event platforms that you've seen so far. Um, the platform itself um, is a virtual world, which is a 3D digital environment. Uh, conferencing and events is just one of the capabilities of the platform, but I want to talk about that specifically because obviously that's that's what we're here to talk about today. So I want to start off with a, a bit of an introduction about what is Virtual Worlds, because I think that's that's an important stage setting point. Then we'll talk a bit about why the uh, Virtual Worlds are great for conferences and events and how we can bring back a lot of things that we lost uh, in the last two years as we've transitioned conferences and digital events to um, online. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about Breakroom and, and how some of the features we've got can help solve some of those problems. So I'm going to kick off with what are Virtual Worlds. Um, virtual Worlds are online spaces. They're not necessarily 3D, but they are online spaces where users can log in represented by a digital character, so an avatar that uh, you can use to wander around the world. Acting through the avatar, obviously, you can perceive and interact with the world and the other participants in the world. Now, I realize this, this can even seem a little bit um, unusual, if not a bit more entertainment focused um, than what you typically see for professional events. But by bringing people through an avatar environment, we can unlock a lot of things uh, that enable innate social behaviors. You'll find yourself very quickly acting the same way you would uh, in a real world event. And once we start talking a bit about um, spatial audio, we'll come into, uh, into that. Not every virtual world is 3D, ours is, but there are certainly uh, simpler 2D platforms out there. Um, and the final point I'll just make here is that obviously we hear a lot about things like uh, virtual reality headgear and whatnot. That's not a necessity here. Um, these environments can be accessed through whatever devices users have. Um, so broadly speaking, what we're talking about here is, is online 3D environments. People can wander around, have discussions, attend speakers, but most importantly, it gives you a lot of networking potential. So but with that out of the way, let's talk about why conferences and events and why use virtual worlds for them. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, give a bit of a brief apology to the uh, presenters and organizers here because I'm going to make some comments about online events that are probably not very uh, flattering. So, why online conferences suck. Uh, just listening to a presenter isn't actually a very valuable experience. Um, certainly, I, I'm trying to make this a valuable experience for the audience, but doing things live, you lose a lot of value. Um, if you are just simply playing a video to a crowd of people simultaneously, you're losing out on the ability to have proper captions, translations, uh, and you're also losing the ability for the audience to watch and consume the presentation at their own pace. If you're delivering a highly complex technical topic, it may even be better just to write it out. Um, and a well-written article is certainly going to be more powerful than a video. Um, videos 
often bloat things out. It takes longer to get your message and point across, um, and people ramp along, as I just call myself doing then. So if you've got pre-recorded events, then you've got um, the ability to edit judiciously. You've got the ability to structure content more effectively. Um, so I'm making a very strong case that maybe you shouldn't be doing this stuff live. Uh, and online conferences and events pretty much focus around live delivery of speakers when the reality is that we are actually subtracting value, not adding it. So why do we actually attend conferences and events? It's the audience. It's a really simple point, but it's not one that um, seems to get picked up by a lot of online conferencing platforms. You never go to a conference in order to watch the speakers. You go there to meet other attendees, to learn more about the industry, and to have those co side conversations in the hallways that actually matter. Um, ironically, this is the feature that is the least, least well-developed in most online conferencing platforms. It is almost impossible to pull someone aside and have a conversation with them in an online environment. Certainly, the ability to network with the speakers and so forth afterwards is an extremely limited affair. Sometimes you can, you can set up dedicated environments and events after the fact at smaller places. Um, but what we're missing is we're missing the ability to loiter out in the hallway, have a conversation, and flitter between a few different groups. So that obviously impacts on the, the satisfaction levels of the attendees and the audience attendance rates and so forth. We've seen a lot of uh, statistics from some of our customers and from other people in the industry that shows that these sort of webinar style conferences often only have a 20 minute session time. It's pretty dismal. My comparison, um, some of the virtual world stuff we're going to be talking about, we're talking about six to 10 times higher uh, is what we actually typically see from our customer events. So I want to talk a little bit about um, what actually matters. So conferencing events platforms really should be focusing on these three things. The first is real-time feedback from the audience. The ability to actually read the room as a speaker is really valuable. Right now, I am talking to a picture of myself. I've got no ability to see if I'm losing the audience. I've got no ability to sort of track how interested people are in what I'm saying. That is a really important feature that we, we seem to be missing out on. The second really important thing is obviously the conversations between attendees. Um, as I said, people don't come to attend the speakers. You can go and read a paper if someone's come out with something interesting. You don't actually need to physically attend the conference unless you want to actually hear a bit more about to ask in-depth questions and have those conversations on the side. The third thing that actually matters as well, and this is really for the organizers, but it's what makes things possible, is obviously sponsorships and, uh, and advertisement. Um, as much as we, we don't necessarily like it, those things are what actually pay for half the conference or more. Um, I've worked with uh, people who actually are on the other side of the spectrum um, running conferences, and I can tell you sponsorships easily can add, add up to 75% of the costs of running an event. Yet the capabilities online for sponsors to participate in uh, online events is pretty dismal. You've got yourself a logo in the corner, you might better put your name on it next to a session, and you could probably sponsor a few um, presentations. But ultimately, you're not getting the kinds of things that you want as a sponsor. People that sponsor real world events, they always go for the booth, uh, or almost always go for the booth, because it gives them the opportunity to have uh, interactive conversations with the audience there and make those connections. So those three things, I think, are the things that we actually need to concentrate on as an industry and making platforms that can do what we want them to do. So, without it out of the way, and I'm tearing through here, so we will have a bit of time to, to do a proper comprehensive demo of the platform, I want to talk a bit about what is Breakroom. So Breakroom is uh, something built on something called the ScienceBase platform, which is a general purpose 3D digital environment. Uh, if you think about it, it's close to a web browser for 3D content that happens to have very robust multi-user features built in. So, it's a 3D world. Um, it is uh, unusual in that the environment can be edited in real time. Uh, this means that, for example, if you're doing demos and someone asks you a question, well, what if we change something to a particular way, you can have a trainer or an instructor or someone giving a presentation actually modify the environment in real time in response to something. This could be useful, for example, with training simulations, safety simulations, all those kinds of things where you may want to actually throw a bit of chaos into the mix and, and mix things up. Uh, in order to make your point uh, more clearly. Um, so the great thing is that the platform supports real-time 3D editing. Uh, we have a whole host of functions that allow you to manipulate the scene in real time, uh, and all the attendees will see these things simultaneously. Uh, the tools are all built for um, user editing as well as the, the platform. Uh, we actually provide everything that's needed uh, to edit the platform, the same tools that we have ourselves. And that means that if you do have someone who's got the capabilities of creating and manipulating 3D environments on your team, uh, if they've got some Unity experience or some Unreal experience or something like that, they'll be right at home. They can get to work and start um, working with the platform 
uh, almost straight away. Uh, we also provide some much simpler tools, which I'll show you as well um, in a moment. You can bring 2D or 3D content into the world yourself. Now, this could be interesting. It opens opened up a whole host of opportunities for people who, for example, let's say you were talking about geography and you've got a particular physical location you want to bring in. Well, you can actually import the, the geography and the, and the associated buildings and all that kind of stuff into the 3D environment, presuming you've got the time and skills to do so. Um, it's, it's pretty um, powerful from a from editing perspective. The second really important point, and this is actually... Uh, something that deserves its own slide is spatial audio. Uh, it seems kind of silly, but uh, the idea of being able to hear only the people near your own avatar, plus obviously speakers and presenters, um, enables the ability to have side conversations. Uh, we started Breakroom as a product during the COVID pandemic very early on. And uh, one of the very first things we noticed about the first few conferences that ran on the platform was that people formed the same natural communication groups that they do at a real conference. We see the typical five to 10 people standing around and we see groups and clusters of these across an event. And we see people flittering between the two. If the conversation is not interesting, they just walk on. Um, so lots of people will sit and if there's a speaker or someone else, we'll see lots of people hovering around them, looking to ask their questions and to network with the, with the VIPs at the event. These kinds of things don't typically happen with, with uh, conventional webinar software. And we think this is actually a really powerful um, showcase of the actual power of spatial audio. Um, we also have uh, related to that a number of ways that people can express reactions to the environment without and the speaker without interrupting their, their conversation. Obviously, if we let anyone speak over the top of a, a speaker while they're presenting, uh, that would be chaos. But we do provide a number of options to use your avatar, for example, to express interest uh, in a speaker and a presenter. And we'll, we'll show a few of those things in a moment as well. Finally, uh, we have um, incredibly powerful conference running features, which are designed to allow a conference organizer to organize the event the same way that they do in a real world, only everyone actually behaves when they push the button. Um, we have the ability to move people around environments uh, voluntarily and involuntarily, prompt people, um, and a whole host of crowd control tools that can provide a very easy and slick way of manipulating the, um, the event uh, in action. Oh, this obviously comes, of course, with the usual um, pairings of high quality voice support, as well as live video, screen sharing, webcam, so on and so forth. Unfortunately, I will not be able to present the webcam stuff as my webcams uh, used by the, the current conference software, but I do have a, a colleague who will be providing some, some support and will be playing some videos and things in the platform uh, in a moment. Finally, uh, the last and most important point uh, is accessibility. Uh, accessibility matters, uh, particularly as you get more and more complex and sophisticated uh, environments like these fully 3D virtual worlds. Um, the Breakroom software can run in a browser. Uh, anyone can get in. Uh, you do not need a high quality computer. Uh, unlike most of our competitors, we actually have support cloud rendering, which means that uh, no matter if someone's on a Chromebook or a computer that's 15 or 20 years old, uh, they can still get in and have a high quality, robust experience. Um, we provide uh, streaming close to users in uh, most locations in the world. Uh, finally, we also have a number of features specifically aimed at um, diversity um, requirements. We have, for example, uh, a number of uh, cultural headgear and so forth for, for avatars. We have the ability to um, have prosthetics as well as wheelchairs and all sorts of other diverse features that allow people to properly express themselves. Um, in fact, our avatar system allows a very wide range of customization that really lets people make themselves home uh, in the platform. Finally, we also do have a number of actual direct accessibility features, including, for example, high contrast interfaces, um, the ability to change and plate um, screen UI but control sizes and so forth uh, that mean that you can guarantee that, that a very wide range of users will be able to actually access the platform and get into it. So with that in mind, um, and I'm going to very quickly give a demo. So let me just shift over to here. And so I am now in, um, in Breakroom in one of our Confluence templates regions. I've got my colleague Georgina here, um, who will be helping me with all these uh, test demos today. So very first out, I'm just going to do a quick interaction with her avatar. So if I just play a quick gesture, uh, which can be done a number of ways, but uh, let's do that one. So obviously that's a very simple uh, social animation, but you can do this between numbers of avatar avatars that allow you to express various emotions um, and uh, greetings in a way that's a little bit more sophisticated than, than what you can see uh, in other platforms. Uh, obviously uh, we also have robust voice, uh, so she can hear me when I'm close to her avatar, but if I move further away, 
uh, from her, then she won't be able to hear me as clearly. And that's what really enables these high quality um, social interactions. As I said earlier, the world is in fact fully editable. I've got this little edit region button down here. Uh, and I can actually take this entire location and I can manipulate every bit, bit and piece of the world uh, in real time. So all these changes that I can make will be actually shown to all users who are logged into the platform. We can place uh, new content into the scene very easily. Uh, so if you're familiar with sort of 3D editing tools, this can be really quite simple. Um, so we've just placed that object there, right out of the way, and you can sort of see that's been, that's been added to the environment. All supports for common 3D model formats and so forth can be uh, handled inside the platform. Um, besides, uh, obviously, all these uh, sophisticated editing platforms, we have the ability to sort of import complex uh, 3D models. Uh, so, for example, we've got photogrammetry scans. Uh, this particular thing is just a very simple 3D model import uh, that's been added um, that can be used to highlight particular events. Individual uh, small spaces for breakouts and sponsors can be created. E.g., you can sell these as booths. You can create and configure as many as you want um, for your sponsors. Uh, inside there, you can create, again, you can duplicate uh, objects within here so you can create additional copies of things. So I'll just grab that bit there. Right thing so I can get set Okay, so if I grab that for example, I can create a second copy, put it up on a wall, and then allow us someone else to uh, uh, to configure that. This is a, a little bit more complex when you're trying to speak it and do editing at the same time. But nonetheless, uh, this allows sponsors and booth operators as well as uh, individual um, participants in the environment to create and customize their own uh, environments in real time to uh, their own specifications. Uh, and that obviously is very powerful from a branding perspective uh, on top of it. In addition, uh, you can, for example, that is a web, web page right there. Uh, we have support for video panels as well as things like uh, this uh, whiteboard here uh, that can be used as part of your networking functions. So, um, uh, finally, I'm going to go to very quickly some of the, the conference management tools. We have a quite sophisticated uh, conference managing system for people who are running the event. Uh, one quick example here is that I can actually uh, move everyone to an auditorium, for example, uh, in real time. So I can push this button and everyone will get this message saying an event's about to be in the auditorium. If you actually don't trust the users, you can also force them. Uh, you can, for instance, select a particular group, so it's maybe that particular user, and you can hit teleport uh, to that environment. So uh, here are some videos that uh, my colleague started there uh, in the platform. So we have also live support for pre-recorded and live video systems uh, that are quite smooth, uh, including the ability to optionally use things like spatial audio in these if you want to. Um, finally, uh, if, for example, you've got someone who doesn't know how to use the platform, you can also use these same tools to, for example, teleport someone onto the stage. So I took that particular user, I'm going to put them onto the uh, speaker stand, hit teleport, give them a second. I actually push the button. Yeah. Um, so now they're moved on to the speaker stand, for example. So if you've got someone who doesn't particularly know how to use the platform, um, it's very easy for a third party who's running the event to be actually able to manipulate these environments and answer those questions. We have support for integrations with a number of third party things, including uh, software such as Eventbrite um, for ticket management uh, and a host of other things, including a full API and scripting system for completely custom content. We have seen, seen people build everything from simple to complex games. We have seen all sorts of things built inside the platform, uh, which is sort of a testament to the power and customizability of, of it. Uh, on top of all of this, we have a number of other bits and pieces. So for example, I can put uh, Slido, which is one of our little integrations here. This is just simply a web page. We can embed that inside the actual environment itself. So you can use this, for example, asking questions. Um, so you can put quizzes and all kinds of things in there, um, as you can see here. Uh, they can also be used for Q&A with, with events. Finally, um, we were talking about audience participation and feedback. Well, we have lots of buttons on the side. Uh, so for example, we can do a, a clap where you can see your avatar uh, focuses there. Uh, we can also do what we call 3D emojis, which are great when there's a huge crowd as a speaker. You can, for example, see that uh, the whole crowd is speaking by a volume of, of little pixelated emojis that appear uh, in the environment in real time. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm going to jump very quickly back to my slides. So I'm just going to take off my screen share. Just put my uh, isn't timed up, which it has. And we do next uh, next slide. All right. Um, so I want to talk very very quickly in the 
small amount of time I have left is about a few things that are sort of hot topics in the event industry. Um, hybrid events, uh, one of the things that we've been focusing on has been uh, building good quality virtual events. Our experience is that hybrid events often split the audience and there's no good solution to that. And the simple reason for that is that people who are at the real world event rarely want to sit in front of a monitor um, to participate with people who are not part of that event. Uh, that can be a real problem. Uh, you can obviously always stream the environment into the, into the online event, but trying to get participation between the two groups doesn't really work very well. Uh, the best strategies we've seen um, with our customers has been things like doing virtual only networking sessions afterwards uh, that allow the real participants and the, uh, the virtual participants to be on the same footing uh, and looking at ways that you can try and get those two groups uh, logged in simultaneously. Uh, that does seem to be the best strategy at the moment. I'm absolutely open though to, to observations from other people if they do have good solutions to this problem because we've not seen any yet ourselves. Um, obviously, the, the most important thing we think is just focus on delivering a solid experience in both locations. If you are going to do a hybrid event, consider running both simultaneously uh, with separate uh, teams managing each so that you don't try and stretch your resources too far on, on that particular topic. Finally, uh, implementation uh, sweet spot for us is about 50 to 500 person events. You can do bigger, you can do smaller, um, but those are, the, those are the good ranges. We can put hundreds of users in environment. The environment you're seeing right there uh, was optimized for about 200 users, but we have in regions that are designed for 500 or more users, uh, including much larger auditoriums and much bigger networking spaces. Um, the two to three month lead time on planning events is really optimal. I know that's quite long. Um, but there is a heavy amount of customization that is available to people in this environment. We've had everything from tropical islands to the ruins at uh, Mount Parnassus and Delphi. Um, those are just some of the locations that people run events on the platforms. We've got templates and things that can sort of help with that one. Uh, we do have online training for small events, and we also do have educational discounts available for people who are running those events. Um, finally, uh, if you want to learn more about the platform, go to breakroom.net. Brilliant. All right, great, thank you so much, Adam. Our third speaker today is from a platform we've all become very familiar with over the course of the pandemic. Sami Ahmed is a senior product manager at Zoom, focusing on healthcare applications. He will share with us how Zoom is customizing its platform for biomedical users and interactions. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this conference. I'm happy to be here talking about scientific conferences reimagined and uh, going through various technology platforms on Zoom. And with this, we have uh, a few uh, things that we'll go over that might be forward looking. So you might see plans for products, including development, as well as things that we announced as recently as last week in our own conference, uh, annual conference last. Uh, uh, that talks about products, features, and functionality that is preliminary and all future rela release dates are tentative and may be subject to change without notice. So with that, let's uh, talk about what we are going to discuss today. Uh, we, I will take you through the Zoom platform and then focus on hybrid events I thought would be meaningful for today and really talk about some foundational elements around privacy and security and then give you a few examples of what happens after an event. How do we help transform life sciences through the capabilities that we offer during the event? So let's jump in a little bit about myself. I work on a product uh, dedicated to the healthcare vertical as one of the four that we lead at Zoom. Uh, you can reach out to me to chat about building products, unified communications, and I come from a medical devices background. I've spent time on three different continents, uh, and you can find me here on LinkedIn. With that, let's dive into the Zoom platform uh, that you all have seen and heard and probably experienced on your own uh, through the meetings uh, product that we have had that really brought video to everyone, especially during the last few years when the mobility was an issue and in-person in events were really not happening. But Zoom is so much more than that. You have both synchronous events like we are doing right now, as well as asynchronous through team chat uh, capabilities that we have. Then there's the plain on phone on your desk or in your office that uh, Zoom also offers through the cloud. In addition to all of this, we have dedicated hardware devices 
devices that go into conference rooms, into patient rooms, into uh, classrooms, depending on where you are, which are really optimized to meet that uh, infrastructure needed within a room for uh, for a conference and i'll talk more about that uh, in relation to hybrid events later on and then you have webinars and events that we are uh, developing and using day to day for larger uh, platform uh, requirements such as these and uh, we recently launched the contact center so think of that as a way to uh, reach back when your customers want to contact you back how can they can be routed and uh, you know appropriately uh, service based on their needs depending on where you want to go after the conference so let's dive into some tools and platforms that we have uh, zoom for you really brings uh, teams together it helps reimagine workspaces whether they are at home or in the office yeah, it allows you to engage new audiences and and ultimately delight your customers all on the zoom platform that you know and love so zoom is here for you uh, i'll take a, f a few seconds here to talk about uh, what this means all right on the top we have the zoom one which allows you access to all the tools that i just talked about from webinars to phone meetings chat and then we have uh, hybrid tools like whiteboard and the events platform but there is more to it with the zoom uh, ai that empowers conversations behind the scenes whether it is uh, for uh, conferences whether it is for chatbots whether it's for analysis during a call that you'd like to get after uh, it uh, after it ends because just recordings uh, don't really do the job uh, to enable all this uh, with an ecosystem, we have Zoom for developers that allow APIs and software development kits, a marketplace for you to publish your apps uh, that allow uh, your customers to access Zoom along with other capabilities that you might want to offer to them. Uh, then comes Zoom Contact Center that allows uh, multiple mediums to interact uh, when uh, reaching out. Uh, this means uh, you can have chat phone or a video first approach so directly from your website you can go into uh, the the queuing capabilities that contact center offers to enable those interactions and all this comes with zoom spaces which has not only the conference room uh, devices but also uh, things capabilities in, in built into them like workspace reg reservation, digital signage that kind of completes your whole suite of tools that uh, allow you to get your ideas across to communicate and get more done together. Let's now dive into the topic for today, which is hybrid events. And hybrid events uh, are really the way that we are moving forward in today's world where you had completely online before the pandemic and during the pandemic it moved uh, to online events and now we, we see a kind of a, a mixture of the two. And they provide a bounty of benefits from sustainability to cost savings uh, to extensive brand reach and higher attendee uh, capacity. So what do hybrid events uh, need? They, you, you need to create digital-centric elements. When uh, virtual events uh, are providing you their benefits, you would also like to see things that are more engaging and meaningful overall. And hearing and seeing presenters from both in-person as well as online adds that variety and drives energy and engagement. And uh, the future events is uh, hybrid, as I said earlier, this is easy to see because it allows you to create uh, much more innovative ways of communicating with your attendees. You know that to stay competitive, you need to offer that experience that are unique and engaging. And much like many of our daily activities, they will feature more video components uh, going forward. So two will traditionally in-person events. So let's see how this all pans out when you go through a conference and one of the first things uh, that uh, we we talk about is really focusing on the virtual audience which means you want to put the virtual audience on the screen in the room how do you do that well with the rooms devices that we have that have cameras on them you are allowed to 
have uh, the ability to not only have uh, you know one view that covers everyone that probably misses some people who are in the back versus those in the front it uh, we have this capability called the smart gallery view that allows the virtual audience to be uh, presented equally and it helps remind the in-person attendees of the online audiences because you're really trying to give equity between the two. Another thing that we would uh, recommend is really create that digital centric element, which means that uh, when you have uh, uh, a virtual MC, then uh, you really are developing a content that your primary host virtually gives representation to your virtual audience and as a constant reminder that your event is hybrid. So we recently did this at an analyst event and de developing these digital uh, centric elements allowed us to be more engaging and uh, having a more meaningful event. Uh, when we, what we did was having the host, primary host participate virtually, gave representation to a virtual audience and uh, it, uh, it really allowed people to feel more engaged and a pro tip that we have for you is uh, to have someone in the room available to communicate with the MC throughout uh, the event through uh, something like chat. And, and another thing that the virtual MC can get benefit from is having a live camera feed from the room that allows them to engage with the in-person attendees and really make sure that you're not just looking at a slide or a video or a demo, but really seeing that interactive uh, audience and, and can respond to that appropriately. For the virtual presenters and panelists, uh, the convenience and ease of Zoom removes a lot of barriers for the presenters and panelists alike. This means that in, at any key moment of your event uh, where there is a panel discussion with three Zoom customers all participating uh, virtually, we are able to secure and create a memorable se session without asking them to travel and sacrifice additional time. Let's uh, see what the future, why the future events is hybrid and the hybrid reality that it uh, represents. Uh, according to Bloomberg, uh, a recent report said that almost 39% of workers would rather leave their job if they didn't offer a flexible work environment. And that number co uh, continues to climb, especially for millennials and Gen Z employees, to 49%. A similar sentiment is rippling across the events industry uh, where there is a demand for more flexibility and uh, engaging experiences which is now becoming standard. So according to Frost and Sullivan, the global webinars and events will eventually continue to boom in a hybrid work uh, as hybrid work becomes mainstream and recent analysis finds that the long term sustainable and impact of hybrid work and adoption of digital channels are creating an unprecedented uh, wave of virtual events. The global webinars and events market is projected to reach four and a half billion by 2025, up from one and a half in 2020. So you can see the huge, tremendous opportunity that you have. The incredible amount of innovation uh, over the past two years, as you just saw with the past two presenters, has really been driving this growth. Uh, event managers now have many more solutions that are easier to use, uh, provide greater access, and come stocked with features for networking, as well as advanced data reporting and analytics. Companies are also learning that virtual events uh, require the same high quality production and, and content creation that uh, was used to broadcast TV, for instance, and live events there, which are really engaging and memorable to us in order to have a comparable impact and return on investment. What this means is think about the last time you experienced a virtual event uh, and uh, chances are the, the event had more of an impact on you. This is because humans are social, social creatures who crave interaction and engagement. So just like uh, TV programs, uh, which include a live audience, live events supply the content necessary to increase the engagement, while remote viewing audience continues to uh, enjoy it and, and add to this advances in communication technology over the past two years uh, that 
develop the tools that we need to create such experiences. So hybrid events are becoming more of an effective and profitable event strategy because they combine the intimacy and engagement of live events with the interactivity and flexibility and global reach of virtual events. This promising approach combines two of the powerful experiences that can complement one another. And, and there are tools that are uh, available to, to enable this. And one of them is the Zoom whiteboard. So the Zoom whiteboard offers a single cloud-based solution that can be accessed regardless of location, device, or time zone, providing a flexible and intuitive collaboration features that you need to succeed. So uh, it's really easily shareable. It can be seamlessly shared within uh, the meeting or outside of it, uh, allowing you to collaborate bef both before and after the meeting. And you can add resources to it, flow charts, uh, diagrams, pictures, allowing you a digital space to really interact with everyone. Let's now go into the privacy and security part, uh, which might be a boring and complex topic, but believe me, it is fundamental to your success. Uh, reason being that unless you have these key security features enabled uh, with encryption, compliance, and privacy, you will not get the participation that you need. And uh, tailored encryption options are necessary. Uh, you can go for end-to-end -end encryption, uh, as well as platforms that allow the capability for uh, for multiple encryption protocols to be available. Uh, it can be something as simple as an authenticated login. If you do not have single sign-on, then multi-factor authentication adds an extra layer of security, especially if your uh, viewers are uh, needing to share scientific confidential information. It'll give them that peace of mind. Uh, you can also enable open authorization processes, so enable uh, logging in through Google or uh, other uh, IDs that might be available, like Apple. And um, making meeting ask passcodes mandatory allows uh, you to control better who is accessing the tools and uh, knowledge that you are providing in that event. Uh, HIPAA compliance coming from healthcare is especially useful and necessary for uh, sharing when you have patient related information and as well as complying with uh, regulations like GTPISO, PCI. So, all these attestations really help build that confidence. And prioritizing user privacy allows uh, all the participants to make sure that the information that they're sharing is secure and safe and will not be misused uh, so that they don't start getting, you know, uh, spam after uh, they finish the, this event. Now let's go into a use case of transforming life sciences uh, through, uh, through virtual events. And I wanted to point this out because, you know, once we do events and we we enable them and we have a great what a uh, great experience what happens after now uh, taking the example of virtual collaboration in life sciences suppose a vaccine approach was discussed in one of your virtual conferences how uh, how would that really transform into uh, success later on and some of the things that we have seen our customers do are things like decent centralizing clinical trials, which means participants may be familiar with the burden of traveling uh, to the study center, times many hours or even uh, countries away, and uh, tem temporarily having to relocate in, or in order to participate in a trial. Well, with fully decentralized trials, you can now conduct those, uh, those uh, events uh, through remote monitoring and other tools and communication with the patient, checking their progress and tracking adher adherence to trial protocols. When trial and remote enrollment no longer involves uh, the need to travel, it really opens up access and gives you a more diverse pool of uh, participants regardless of location. Uh, and this allows uh, really uh, much more equity, much more uh, complexity to actually take uh, complex procedures to be conducted at the trial because you're no longer bound by a physical location. Uh, 
once the trial uh, moves towards manufacturing, again, virtual access helps the team get prepared for uh, availability of that vaccine. You can vastly cut down on costs because you time spent waiting for somebody to show up on site before manufacturing starts. Now, the manufacturing obviously has to be on site, but there are so many things that you can do before and after uh, to make that vaccine available. You can avoid actually travel restrictions that have become the norm during the pandemic. So, pharma biotech companies are now using virtual inspections with regulatory agencies. And even if the inspection itself cannot be conducted over a platform, like Zoom, uh, global staff can still collaborate virtually to prepare for those inspections happening. And then finally, uh, once you take that vaccine, that product to market, uh, even your sales interaction it from uh, all the stuff that you have been doing from the virtual conference to the trial and now taking it to patients and doctors. And what uh, it allows uh, uh, us to do is have the face-to-face -face time where time is really of uh, is a critical uh, you know resource and uh, and you get a few seconds with the doctor so this allows us to enter a new era of virtual sales uh, that our customers talk about where uh, you can uh, have video sales calls that can sometimes be even more effective than a drop-in approach. We have studies that suggest that a virtual meeting through Zoom is almost twice as valuable as an in-person meeting because it's a scheduled meeting. You have the doctor's undivided attention using your content and having a conversation that the doctors value because they're giving you that scheduled time. It takes uh, a much more efficient and valuable interaction between the reps and their doctors. So using this example, you can see, uh, you know, going from a conference, enabling it through a hybrid uh, approach, then uh, making sure that the benefits of the conference are realized in product development, and finally to product delivery. So let's take a quick look. Zoom is more than just uh, meetings and events. Uh, use all the tools available and make sure that you are uh, ready for uh, benefiting out of this hybrid approach. So back to you, Shannon. Great, thank you, Sammy. And last but not least, we have Dr. Dorit Denoviel, the Director of the Translational Research Institute for Space and Health and the National Space Biomedical Research Institute, both at the Center for Space Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine. She will share with us how digital platform tools and technology can be used to connect scientists remotely across space and time to facilitate collaborative advances. Her talk is titled, Working Like Astronauts, Lessons Learned from a Virtual Space Health Institute. Hi, thanks for joining us today. My name is Dorit Donneville, and I'm really grateful to the organizers for inviting me to talk to you about how we reimagine doing scientific conferences in this new world of ours where we're working virtually or remotely. Things have changed so much for us over the past few years, but I think we can really move ahead having some lessons learned from unusual places. The places that I'm going to tell you about today are number one, outer space, and how as a virtual innovation institute, we are innovating for how to keep humans connected and working and productive, even when they're very, very far away from everything that they know here on Earth. Those lessons learned have been applied in our virtual institute model. And I'm gonna tell you about how we've been able to be successful, some things that were not so successful and how we learn from those things. So let's talk about how we're working like astronauts and how as a virtual institute, we can actually enable scientific collaborations to occur. So I have to first introduce you to the organization that I represent. I have the pleasure of leading a small but very lean group of uh, individuals. When I say lean group, I mean a lean team of individuals. Uh, we are the Translational Research Institute for Space Health, or TRISH for short. And we are a consortium based at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. But we have uh, consortium partners, Caltech in Pasadena, California, and MIT uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And we have individuals in those institutions. 
Our job is to think about how to make sure that humans stay healthy and extremely productive wherever they explore space, whether it be in low Earth orbit, close to our planet, going on the moon, which is coming up with NASA's Artemis missions in the next couple of years, or in the next couple of decades, where we're going to be exploring further destinations such as Mars. So our mission is nothing short of relentlessly seeking and funding innovative solutions, psychological, technological, scientific, medical advances that are state of the art that will enable any human to explore deep space safely. And I say deep space because the further that we get away from Earth, the challenges become more extreme. So we are partnered with the Human Research Program at NASA, and they are an intramural program that also funds some people externally in order to look at the different challenges to the human body and mind as you put these humans in an extreme environment. And they fund research at NASA, and they're making steady progress to reduce these risks to humans in space. They wanted an agile, innovative institute to take risks, to invest in things that may seem high risk in terms of the nature of the, um, the projects. So things that maybe give you a little bit of a queasy feeling, saying, I'm not sure that's going to work. But if it did work, it would make tremendous advances and help NASA keep humans healthy in that very challenging environment. So Trish reduces risks by taking risks on very innovative science and technology. So what are the challenges of spaceflight? And we'll get to what this has to do with the Keystone Symposia and how to do uh, scientific collaborations and conferences in a virtual environment. I'll start to the right and just give you a quick overview. Deep space radiation is really quite challenging. We can't shield for all of it, and it's going to affect every system in the body. So we have to keep humans resilient. The distance from Earth creates all kinds of challenges in terms of the further you get away from Earth, you can't have resupply, you can't have people abort missions, and so you have to be extremely autonomous and resilient, much like individuals working in their own homes and far away from their team members. The hostile enclosed environment, what do I mean by this? If your toilet breaks, if, you're, uh, if you have a leak of ammonia in your environment, um, if you're not able to reclaim all the water that you brought with you and recycle it, those are all challenges that we have to think about as we move further away from, ho from home. Again, being autonomous. The gravity fields present a problem. Our bodies have uh, gotten used to having a normal gravitational field, and that is what's needed to keep all our our uh, uh, organs of the body healthy. But as you remove gravity, you start to have challenges to your heart. You have problems with your bones, your muscles, your the way your fluids are distributed in your brain and the rest of your body. And so we're solving for all those problems. And finally, and I think most relevant for this discussion is the isolation. So the further we get away from Earth, the more communication lag we have. And that means that when we're actually on the Mars surface or orbiting the planet, we may have up to a 40-minute delay in communication back and forth. That means if you say, hey, Houston, we have a problem, it may take 20 minutes for that signal to get to mission control at Houston. And then they may respond to it, and then it would take another 20 minutes for you to hear it if you're on the Mars surface. And so having communication delay really creates a problem in, in the sense of the humans that are going to be exploring space having to communicate with the rest of the world, much like the world that we live in today when we have virtual meetings, we may have problems with internet connections, we may have delays in communication or video feeds. And so all those communication delays and challenges are not unlike what some of us are dealing with today as we move towards a more virtual platform for many of our collaborations. So when you think about humans sitting on the Mars surface, these are big, big problems. And so, as I mentioned before, they require innovations. And to have an innovative institute operating virtually and finding the best solutions in the world in order to fund them and bring them forward to the NASA program for them to consider 
really requires um, constant, effective, bi-directional communication. So what do I need? What do I mean by that? Because NASA is an applied program, the missions that they're going on, the risks, the needs are constantly changing and our knowledge base about them is changing. And so as an agile innovation institute, Trish, our organization has to communicate the needs of the organi- of NASA to our research community to make sure that the solutions that we're sourcing from that community really fit the need exactly. Conversely, we need to take the innovations that we find and fund and communicate them in such a way to NASA so that NASA understands how to integrate those things. We need to connect the dots. We need to explain how something like synthetic biology that can deliver pharmaceuticals on demand or food nutrients on demand can fit a challenge or a need for NASA in keeping the humans healthy. So being able to do bi-directional communication is really important. So here's the challenge that we face as a virtual institute and some takeaways for this community and thinking about scientific communication. We fund 146 projects. Each of those is led by a team from all over the country. We fund 93 institutions, universities, companies, government labs, 27 states. We have a very lean staff, 14 people, and they're spread across six cities with three time zones. So we have to manage this giant diverse portfolio and talk to each other and talk to NASA in this bi-directional manner. How the heck do we do that? Well, here are some of the challenges. As I mentioned before, our management team is geographically dispersed. We have a highly dispersed funded research community. Expertise is all over the place. We have radiation researchers. We have psychologists. We have people who are developing new medical technologies or trainings uh, on how to perform medical procedures all over the place. So how do we also not only communicate among these different experts across different sectors, how do we also keep track of all the highly evolving um, fields of medicine, technology, and science? These are big challenges for any institutions, but particularly for a lean, small virtual institute that's working with a highly um, operational customer. So what are some of the lessons learned? Um, on how to be an effective science institute in a virtual world. I want to start by telling you a story. Back in 2017, I was a brand new uh, director. The institute started on October 1, 2016. So this was six or seven months in. We normally put out solicitations and people respond with scientific proposals and we We have scientific merit review that's done by experts. We take all of those review outcomes and we bring them forward to our scientific advisory board. These are highly intelligent individuals that represent different fields, the best of the best in the nation. And they advise us on which of the proposals that are highly meritorious scientifically really are best to fund. We meet with them. We meet with them and present some of these proposals and they give us advice. This is stipulated in our federal funding requirements. We were scheduled to meet on August 30th, 2017. Some of you may remember that in August, on the 27th in particular, Hurricane Harvey hit Houston. And what you see here is downtown Houston underwater. So we saw the storm coming. We told our board, we can't meet in Houston. We need to move virtually. And you know what? What we learned from that experience is that we can meet virtually successfully. We all got together virtually during that storm. And because of that positive experience, our scientific advisory board, our SAB, now meets mostly virtually. People really liked the way we did things. And it made it easier for them because they didn't have to travel. They didn't have to take a couple days out of their lives. They were able to participate in a meaningful way. So what were some of the things that made this a possibility? One is the staff prepared the materials well in advance. We were highly organized in the way we presented the materials to the board. Our team members had to huddle together because some of us didn't have power or internet, but we made it work. And finally, and probably most importantly, 
is our scientific advisory board, much like any science community, had to be highly engaged and motivated. So how does one arrive at a community of scientists that's engaged and motivated? How do you keep these intelligent and super busy individuals prioritizing what you're doing and do it in a manner that's year round? So some of the things that we've learned is that because virtual is now the norm, our very few in-person meetings, we've had 30% of our meetings have been in person over the last six years. They're very infrequent, but because they're infrequent, they're highly valuable. So we really think through about optimizing the experience through curating really good content. We make sure that the speakers are highly diverse, that they've all been vetted to be very good speakers. We hold to a strict schedule. We optimize discussions over long presentations. We really kind of force that so that people are engaged and not just sitting there, you know, checking their cell phones. And really importantly for those in-person opportunities is to offer very unique play opportunities that are also relevant to the subject matter. So to give you some ideas, in Houston, we're lucky to have the Space Center Houston. So we offer them free access to the museum, some tours, some meet meetups with astronauts. Or very recently, uh, last April, we had the ISS virtual experience. So it was an immersive experience called the Infinite. And we offered them uh, tickets to go see that. And so going through that with a couple of our uh, board members who are astronauts was incredibly unique for these individuals. And so having those opportunities and curating them being very thoughtful was really important. When we do have virtual meetings, we keep them very short. We know that people can't sit on the computer for a really long time. And you'll see that our meetings, everybody's on camera. People are not turning off. If they need to go, they let us know and then they immediately come back. The materials are always provided ahead of time so they can prepare. And we also tell them exactly what we need them to do. I need you to listen carefully to X, Y, and Z and make a decision on Z. So we clearly articulate what the expectations are. So if they need to walk away, they're still able, able to provide the feedback that we need ahead of time. So they know what they're missing and they're able to still contribute. Now, the other thing that we do is we make sure that year round, we connect our community, community members to each other. We know that the value add to them is not just the content, but the ability to network. So we help them recruit people to their teams if they have an open position. We disseminate their content if they're actually um, sponsoring a workshop. We connect the dots for them when they're, they're actually collaborating with each other, but they may not know about it. We introduce them to investors and potential collaborators. And then we send them articles or news that are relevant to them. So that takes a while for us to get to know them and what interests them in order for us to give them highly curated content. This is Networking 101. And then the other thing that we do is we make them feel very special. Our community gets a head up, heads up ahead of our press releases. So anytime we have an exciting news release or an exciting program that we are announcing to the world, our community gets a heads up first ahead of everybody else. The other thing that we do for people in our community, whether they be our advisory board members or our scientists, is we offer them opportunities to talk about their work or their role as our advisors. We offer them opportunities to talk to reporters that wanna to talk to us and also authors thought leadership pieces either with us or on their own, but we make those introductions. We offer both monthly newsletters as well as virtual community meetings with thoughtful expert conversations. Again, not talking heads, but a chance to to engage with our experts with a Q&A and hear to people talking with each other about important topics. And we provide them with uh, access to funding opportunities and uh, new workshops and things that we announce within the community in our newsletter. So that's how we keep these folks engaged. And so to sum things up, I want you to think about humans wherever they are, whether they be in deep space or even in their own homes, trying to connect to others to stay engaged and really continuing to do meaningful work. 
And that is a key term for our astronauts. These are highly motivated, highly intelligent individuals. On that long duration mission to Mars, it may be up to three years where they have communication delays with Earth. We have to think about how to provide meaningful work for these individuals. But not only meaningful work, but human connections in the absence of having immediate communication back with Earth. How do we keep people happy, productive, and feeling connected to each other? In order to learn more about some of the technologies that we're putting in place in order to enable that on a mission to Mars, you'll have to tune in to another lecture by me. That's a whole other topic. But I hope this helped you understand how our virtual institute thinks about the global problem and even in deep space, connecting humans to each other in order to continue to innovate and do important work. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dorit, and all of our panelists. Um, now we have about 45 minutes of panel discussion and audience Q&A. We've got a few audience questions, but please do continue to submit your questions for our panelists as we continue the conversation. Um, to kick us off, I'd like to ask you all a kind of general question about what were the biggest challenges you faced in adapting to the new needs of the community during the pandemic and now moving forward after the pandemic as people kind of are changing their perceptions of virtual interactions, virtual meetings, and their interests in engaging in those technologies. Maybe Bob, do you want to start? Oh, Dorit, yeah, go ahead. I'll kick us off. Uh, one of the issues that we faced as a team is, is you had to be so purposeful in your communication that you ended up filling up your entire day with, with Zoom meetings, right? And so everybody got kind of fatigued uh, being on the computer all the time. So, um, you know, I think that, that we, we, we almost swung the other direction and being over communicating to the point where people said enough, but then there was still a need to communicate. And so a balance of, you know, going on a, on a chat, a group chat versus having those interactions uh, on camera was, was sort of where we ended up. What is the perfect balance? And it really varies between organizations of, you know, doing it via text messaging or, or the actual uh, in, in real time discussion via video chat was sort of critical to arrive at the right the right sweet spot. Yeah, I I would echo that. Uh, we we don't always want to be on camera live all the time, uh, but uh, and have a healthy mix of asynchronous uh, tools and capabilities. That's why uh, you know and and use that online camera time uh, judiciously. Record it, uh, you know transform it, use clips within it, and then use that as, uh, you know, a, a resource that, that can be deployed later on so that you get quality time when you're, uh, when you're online and you get your own me time when you're offline or asynchronous to, to interact, to engage through chat, through uh, video clips, through, uh, you know, whiteboarding of tools and capabilities that need to be used together. Great. Yeah, I think there's a good case to be made that actually some of these tools are designed to be disruptive almost. Um, plenty of instant messages and things are obviously designed to pull your, your attention away, but if you've got things like large group chats and uh, video calls, you're potentially wasting 30 plus people's time. Uh, it's very, very easy to have a, a call where you've just spent six or $10,000 in salary talking about nothing for 15 minutes. Um, I think that one of the other things you need to do is, is get your staff used to the idea that you can just log off if they're not actually gaining anything out of the call and it's not a uh, social faux pas. I think there's a, there's a lot of pressure to maintain that connection when you don't actually need to be there. Uh, that, that's a really good point, Adam, but uh, maybe one other thing I wanted to kind of mention uh, that I might have um, uh, hinted during uh, my presentation is this concept of separate audiences. Uh, before uh, the pandemic, when you, you think about conferences, everybody is experiencing the same thing in the same place at the same time. Then the pandemic happened, then everybody started experiencing the same thing almost at the same time virtually. 
But in the case of hybrid, what we are trying to do and the immediate reaction of a, most, of our com, most of our customers is exactly an event that we're having today, which is, uh, well, this is not hybrid, this is fully virtual, but let me run a live in-person event and live stream the same experience so that people that are not there are able to experience. Well, I kind of challenge that assumption in a sense that, well, that is that may not be the best experience to consume that content and interact virtually. So to to and I think that takes some time um, to be able to build this skill set and experiment to be able to get there. But there is a case to be made that I don't think our industry has figured out is how to run effective asynchronous um, hybrid meetings, meaning you run your in-person meetings for your live audience. And then you run a separate meeting for your virtual audience, and you try to um, maybe even pre-record some of the live um, content pre, uh, but um, basically pre-event, but made for the virtual audience instead of just trying to record the in-person event with a camera in the back, and then basically just adding the recording on-demand recording. So there's there's a little bit of a different thinking, and in some cases, in terms of resource management, I think for a lot of our customers might be easier to have one team to focus one week on the in-person events and maybe the next week even, uh, I mean, ideally you want it to be uh, maybe not more than a few days apart, but even next week running uh, running that uh, event for your remote audience. Um, I, 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 I'm passionate about this sort of concept of separating audiences and not creating an experience that, that um, basically feeds into the lowest common denominator experience, bringing virtual audiences and then trying to put them in a box in a room where the audio is not good well if i spend all that money and time to go to a conference to meet people in person why are you putting me in front of a screen uh to look at someone that's sitting remotely i just don't think that's that's the experience that uh, that really feeds into the best um the best level of engagement but by separating them i think we have a better chance of uh creating the right experiences for the right audience and i know a lot of people are are, are I can't see the chat, but I'm sure a lot of you disagree with this. It is interesting, and I did oh, want to oh, explore. This. Oh, sorry, I did want to explore this idea of asynchronous oh. events um, and how to design those. Maybe who is involved in which pieces of the asynchronous events? What the timing should be to optimize interactions within groups or even between groups and how that can be utilized for hybrid events. So Adam, go ahead, you wanted to add something. Well, actually, if we are talking about this, this asynchronous versus synchronous, I think that the, the, the interpretation I have of these online events, and I talked about that before uh, during my presentation, is that conferences are all about the attendees. It's all about the audience. Um, it's not about the speakers. It's not about the content. I think that if you if you frame it in the way you're thinking that the speaker is the most important thing at the conference, you're missing the point. Anyone can go on to YouTube or wherever and look up a talk by someone and they will get a great experience watching that talk. When you've got a conference, what you're caring about is the audience. And I think that uh, trying to build an asynchronous communication across audiences is probably not going to work because you're not going to get that spontaneous development that you want. At that point, you might use some forum software or something if you really want to try and approach that particular problem. I think if we're talking events, we are talking live. Um, and I think that we just need to structure them in a way that allows the audience to participate with the audience, um, because that's ultimately what matters. Yeah, that is true, because I think that was the perception when we started all going virtual. It's, if it's about the speakers, there's plenty of talks online. They're free. Like, why isn't a virtual meeting free? And so perhaps that's the key is um, these interactions between the audience is what's offered in the meeting versus more of a, yeah, I'm just watching this YouTube talk and that's it. Sammy, did you have something yeah, I really, to add? I, yeah. I, I really agree with Bob uh, about creating an experience that's, that's really with your with your audience in mind so really keeping them almost separate but maybe overlaid where you do think about the experience of the user like you were saying sorry sammy go ahead no no you're 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 all on it i think it it really involves being empathetic and uh, and having uh, tuned audiences for 
virtual first is is always good uh, but having that live component in it and make it be not you know a simple meeting uh, so what what did you do before what did you do during what did you do after and and having uh, sometimes the virtual audiences tend to have a much richer experience because of the capability to do that but then there's always the uh, serendipitous uh, opportunities that you get while you're in online how can we replicate that uh, you know virtually that is a factor uh, how can virtual audiences uh, you know engage more better uh, that's always uh, tricky uh, and we tend to you know lean one way or the other depending on uh, what the event is focused on and regarding the audience when you're designing a conference for a smaller meeting a smaller audience versus a larger audience what considerations do you need to take into account regarding designing the programming or the interactive features things like that that maybe us as conferencing organizations haven't really been able to put our finger on so i really feel that um talking at people is really not a good way to communicate <laughs> I've I've done it myself. I've I've spoken too long and I've talked at people and I'm the feedback I always get is that people learn more, engage more when there is more of a discussion. So, um you know, enabling so keeping the remarks really short. Like what's worked really well for us is that, you know, we we kind of force our speakers to limit their remarks to 5 to 10 minutes, really hitting the high points, you know, the main takeaways. And then all the technical detail can be provided later if people are interested or there's material that's posted online, kind of like you see the supplementary information in, in scientific publications. And so it really helps the, the audience, the, the participants, walk away with some takeaways. They feel they've gotten something out of it, you know, that, that they weren't just buried in the details. But also it helps people sort of um, engage because there is the time to have a discussion. And so enabling platforms that have done Q&A really well are the ones that I think are most successful in engaging a virtual audience. So I think, I think that's my big lessons learned. Great. Um, Bob, what about you? I'm sure you've worked with various organizations and designed various size events what do you guys have to take into consideration on your end when it comes to customizing for that kind of size of event um no that's a um the way the word was explaining was was right on I, I think there's a big difference in terms of large events and small events in terms of the content uh so there is for example um a webinar uh, or a single track uh event there's not a lot to navigate through the the event space or the virtual space or the event app, even if this was a seminar in person, it's fairly easy to know what the next talk is. Uh, you, you know what to, uh, what to pay attention to. And if the size of the event is also small, um, generally it ends up being a more interactive opportunity and, and you might want to use breakout session instead of live streaming because that, that tends to have a better um, sort of uh, key for people wanting to participate. Uh, and not just turn off their videos and do something else on the side. For larger events, I, I think there's a uh, there's a much more interesting opportunity to create different experiences with on-demand content, so people can go and pick and choose what they want to what they want to listen to or read, and maybe fast forward uh, gamification. Maybe they they get bored and they want to answer some questions to get some points and prizes. Um, being able to choose a variety of different uh, sessions. So that uh, navigation of that experience becomes really important. And to some degree, I was talking about this. It really depends which session it is and which day of the event it is. I, I tend to like conferences that the first day is all almost like live stream and I just get a vibe of the event and what's really happening. And you know, I don't have to like turn on my camera because I don't really know anyone. But as soon as you kind of see the chat following through, you kind of get a feel of, oh, these people are cool. Like they're, I'm, in, I'm in the same sort of space and I can participate. And then the next day, it's the workshops. I feel much more comfortable participating 
Um, so I think for those larger conferences, uh, kind of splitting these type of experiences over time can be really powerful uh, rather than I've seen some conferences the first day, it's like it's a session and then all of a sudden I'm like a random meeting with a random person. I, I have no idea. It's very difficult to participate uh, because I don't even know, you know, what's what level this event is for me to be able to uh, to have. So it it really depends on the event. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm now babbling on, but uh, I wish we could ask the audience because I'm sure the other side of the screen, there are people way more experienced than, than I. Um, um, and uh, it would be great to hear that. I think we have a session at the end of the day uh, that's an interactive breakout room. So I'm excited to learn more from, from everyone that's listening to, uh, to us today. Yeah, that if is I interesting. Can, yeah, go ahead, Adam. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I think that there's a there's a big big difference between very small events and everything bigger than that. So I think twenty people is about this about the, the breakout line. Um, zero to twenty, you may as well put everyone in one room. Uh, it might be able to get a little bit crowded at the higher end of that spectrum, but you can certainly have a discussion among a group of people with 20, 20 videos on the screen. That's certainly doable. Past that point, you need to figure out ways you can actually divide the audience into into groups that can associate with each, other, with each other. So it's a question of how do you either provide the starting point that gives everyone the introduction and the, the comfort to actually step in and speak up. Uh, and ice breaking is a really difficult problem in this space. It's probably the biggest problem we've got with virtual events is the idea that no one wants to speak first. So you need to have one very extroverted person sitting at the center of every conversation that's going on simultaneously. And then you need to think about how can you structure that so that that occurs naturally is it that you've got some kind of prompt uh, and that doesn't always work because not everyone wants to actually follow a prompt uh, from something that's automated, particularly if the less human it is, the less likely people are to follow the instructions. Um, but you need to figure out how can you actually structure people, whether that's, for instance, in our case with, with our environments, they are full 3D environments. So you can put a sign up around a particular topic and expect people to congregate in that area and they'll eventually strike up a conversation on that topic. Um, you've got to think about those kinds of, of issues. But um, ultimately, going back to your question, I think there is that division. There is big and there's small. And for small events, it doesn't matter. The conversation will happen anyway when you've got 20 people in a room. It's bound to. It's when it's bigger that you've got to start thinking about crowd management and audience management and all those kinds of things. Because, again, it's all about the audience. Mm -hmm. And Sammy? I think, yeah, we... I think technology can really be an enabler uh, across the spectrum of uh, of, uh, of these events. So uh, small events, like you said, you know, just simple in in event chat or or just people talking with each other when it's convenient and and you know once you've done introductions or familiar if or you're familiar with each other words. As the size grows, then you definitely need to be more tuned to making it a more democratic experience so have like a uh, chat enabled only with hosts instead of everybody to avoid spam you would have q a sessions that allow upwards so you really get to see okay even though i think my question is the best but really it is uh, bob's question that got the most upwards so that should be the one considered first uh, having uh, captions available at the bottom so even if i'm not following you know live i can i can uh, uh, or having audio pro problems i can kind of look at that uh, translation makes it even more uh, equitable to uh, you know if i can uh, read uh, in in spanish while the conference is going on in English, maybe that's more meaningful to me. Uh, so different uh, tools and tips, I think, that, that allow you to scale between the two, ease of use, simplicity, all those things make it, make it much more meaningful and relevant. Uh, and, uh, you know, large conferences obviously require event management services, but, you know, small and medium should not. And that helps, you know, make it easy for the organizers. Uh, all those things help, uh, I think, uh, make it more balanced, more uh, participatory and, and more inclusive. Great. We actually have a related audience question, particularly for Ahmed, but um, Dr. Ahmed, if we have he, um, the audience says the smart gallery feature seems like a great tool for optimizing smaller group conversations like work meetings where some participants are together in a room and others are remote. My question is whether this is scalable to larger hybrid meetings. 
Um, so do you have any comments about that or thoughts about how you might scale that idea? Um, and our other speakers might think about that as well. So yeah, so what Smart Gallery does is if, you know, six of us are sitting on a table, then you get normally like one camera in the middle that shows like a bowling lane uh, of everyone. And and, and that's not really uh, very helpful. Uh, so Smart Gallery allows without any additional technology to pick up the video feed and focus on the faces uh, to bring out, you know, them individually rather than all together where you can't see the person far, far this far. Uh, to take it further, yes, we are working on it. Uh, we've got, uh, again, uh, uh, working with our technology partners on the hardware side uh, to have multiple cameras in a room so that you don't depend on only one. So the size of your room grows beyond, you know, a dozen or half a dozen uh, to 20, then you really need more than one camera. And then each camera has its own perspective that allows them to pick uh, the right angle or or perspective to capture and even for me if i'm sitting uh, on my chair and I, then i get up and and interact on a whiteboard maybe the same camera uh, that was focusing on me at the beginning is not the appropriate one so the other camera helps bring the right perspective when i'm actually on a whiteboard or uh, say a touch device and kind of uh, walking through that so yeah uh, smart gallery type of features are really meant to break that barrier down between online and in person uh, attendees uh, up to up to the extent possible so it's not perfect but it's definitely a step in that direction mm -hmm. and maybe like adam had mentioned prior you could adapt it to yeah. breakout groups yeah. or something yeah i think that there's a there's a problem with with hybrid smaller events in particular in that you've got one group of participants who are innately disadvantaged whether that's by latency or just the facts that you can't kind of tell the body language of the people in the room and i think there's a fundamental problem here that if you've got someone in the room who's quite important let's say the ceo of your company is sitting in the room and you've got those people that to some people can be perceived as a problem not only just as a as a communication issue but it's also does that impact your career advancement that you're dialing in remotely for these kinds of things those kinds of considerations need to be taken into an, into a, a account and i honestly think the best solution to this one is to go all or nothing um, I, I really do feel like that hybrid is a solution that is going to disadvantage one group over the other and if you want to avoid that scenario and be democratic you've got to lock to one or the other that means either flying people out or or you keep the number of remote attendees down to such a minimum that the person is big on the screen and is um, feels equal enough. Because if you've got 16 people on a Zoom call and five people in the room, there is a natural disconnect that forms between the two. Uh, and I think that that needs to be considered and addressed um, because I don't think this is a, a technological problem that can be solved by technology. I think this is purely a matter of logistics and there's nothing you can do about it. So you may as well try and plan around it and avoid the problem in the first place. Yeah, we, ha we have a hybrid team. I mean, it's a small team. It's not the problem of the large conference, but um, yeah, we, we did, especially in the very beginning of the pandemic when we started working so differently. Um, uh, they felt that there was FOMO, right? They were always, they always felt like they were out of the loop. And so it actually made the team dynamics worse, right? Because there were some individuals that were closer in proximity than, than others. Um, we really struggled with that. And I think you're right, Adam. Um, what, what we did to solve it is that we, we did bring them in occasionally so that they felt more integrated to the team so there were like the personal connections between the team members were strengthened through those very infrequent in-person interactions so that when they were away they still felt connected emotionally to the team but how you replicate that with stranger strangers is a real problem bob anything to add from your perspective um i uh, yes, I mean, what I've heard of this, but uh, not a lot of our customers are using it. I'm kind of curious, especially on the medical um, side. Um, <clears throat> I hear a lot of conferences adopting uh, in Europe, in particular, a multi-hub approach. Uh, the doctors and the patients are actually in the hospital, and if they have to attend, they just get in a conference room and they attend. So then you end up having sort of seven, eight sort of hubs to be able to participate together. 
I, I, I think that's really exciting. Uh, I think the technology is there to support it. Um, I just don't know much about the success factor of that in terms of connecting people that are not in the same hub. Because if you're in the same hospital and you work with the people that you know, it's almost like coworkers. Uh, so you, the tendency is to converge in that in that hub and not really participate with people outside. So uh, I think that's a really interesting event design um, opportunity. Uh, it's been around for a while. There's actually um, books written about it uh, pre-pandemic, um, uh, and it would be it would be interesting. I kind of see that as a really interesting model for hybrid because you have smaller in-person teams um, and they kind of come together as part of a as part of a bigger event. Maybe there is a bigger conference happening. Um, you know, somewhere else, but at least there is this notion that I'm not alone in my in my office by myself, sort of attending this event. And at least there are other people I can I can share that experience with. Mm -hmm. One thing that we found really effective uh, to do the icebreaker, um, particularly in the beginning when people were still getting used to being virtual, is to have them do problem solving together in a fun way. So one one experience that we brought forward is uh, we did like a, a scavenger hunt, a digital scavenger hunt where there's there's actually companies that offer these services. They're like you do a scavenger hunt through like a museum, a virtual digital museum where you're looking for a particular um, you know artifact in a um, a work of art or something like that, or you're or you're going through a natural science museum virtually, and as a team you have like groups of people, and you problem solve together. You have to solve questions or problems or riddles, and then you start to really kind of bond with people virtually. And so we found that incredibly effective to do sort of the the, the team bonding virtually and so maybe if you're if you're trying to connect people with other people and you're you're strangers maybe doing something like an icebreaker like that an activity where it helps you really kind of problem solve together with somebody else uh across the world um you know may be really effective adam have you guys done any problem solving or scavenger hunt type things in your virtual world we have actually. Um, actually, I have to say that the, there's all sorts of ways that people can uh, can do this. Now, the virtual world part of it is actually optional. Yes, we've got a fantastic 3D platform that you can bring anything into. So that stuff, yes, fits in naturally. But uh, even doing just conventional video conferencing platforms, we've, we've had success with that too. We did our company team building last year online, uh, which was a rather interesting experience. We didn't, didn't quite know how it would go down, but we had a, a troop of actors uh, who, who came in and role played this whole James Bond scenario with their whole company. And it was great um, having these people in there who could really read and control a room and get people into the mood of things. It translated. Uh, and I think that, that was a, a great experience at actually getting the whole company um, to have a bit of fun as a group uh, online in a way that you wouldn't really think that uh, would work, but it actually turns out it does. Uh, and obviously then if you've got the 3D environments, you can add games and all kinds of stuff into that as well. So it's not just one or the other, but I think that there's, it's all about bringing people together ultimately. And if you can do that, then there's lots of opportunities for each of these things to happen. So what if you entered, uh, stuck into your virtual meeting, uh, a professional comic or a comedian that was sort of light in the mood or maybe pick up on some things that people are saying and, you know, make it like more fun for people. I, I love the idea of actors. That's brilliant. Yeah, no, it was brilliant. Uh, they were all out of work because of uh, COVID uh, and came in and did our, our, our team building. It was fantastic. It was good for them. It was good for us. Uh, it works. I suspect they're probably still doing it, and even now that the restrictions have all been lifted. So we, we did right. that, Adam, at Event Mobi, and um, our employees kicked them out because they thought our account was hacked. They didn't realize they were actors. <laughs> <laughs> they knew something was off. <laughs> That's great. Um, we do have another question from the audience for Adam. Um, could you bring a high resolution 3D, perhaps atomic scale model into one of the break room um, situations? Absolutely. Can the attendees yeah, yeah. who are people behind manipulate it um, to kind of yeah explore the 3D yeah. model? Yeah, no, our, our platform was built uh, well before we started doing conferences and events, and we were built about a general purpose 3D content delivery platform. So that one of the, the side effects of having that ancestry means that we've got really robust tools for bringing in all kinds of content into platforms. 
Uh, we've had people bring in actual cab models and all kinds of stuff to do uh, live shows of particular things. Scientific data is not much of a stretch from there. That's, that should be quite simple. If you can get it out into a standard 3D model format, you can get that back up into the platform pretty easily. And then if you feel handy with scripting languages, you could even write some interactivity on it uh, that's specially customized, or you can record animations, include those in the 3D models, and that should survive the upload process. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing we love to see as well as people actually looking at the platform saying, what are the actual capabilities of this platform beyond what, what other things offer and how can we take advantage of that? Uh, those kinds of customers are absolutely my favorite. We had envisioned actually running our, our conferences in a in what we call the fidgetal world. So to create like a space-like or a spaceship environment and run our conferences inside of like a digitally created sort of 3D simulation of a space flight. So that was something that we actually kicked off. And uh, unfortunately, the company we work with I never quite got it right. And so the, there was difficulty in, in audio and video synchronization. And so uh, within this, uh, what they call the fidgetal world, uh, it never came to fruition of what my vision was. But I think I would love to take a look at some of your uh, capabilities to see if we can make that come to life. I'm going to butt in here and uh, just interject because I think there's actually a, another project that I worked on many, many years ago. So this was actually about 15 years ago that I worked on this project. Uh, we had um, a virtual world that would let you export the whole world and NPCs, like non-player characters inside the world, uh, could be included in that export. And I know that NASA actually was testing it out as a as a possible solution to the long communication delays on space flights. I, if you're out by Mars, then you could be 25 minutes video delay. So obviously okay. real-time communication is out, but they were experimenting with the idea of actually taking entire 3D worlds loaded with content and characters and transmitting those instead as a way of providing sort of a bit of human uh, touch that you couldn't do in real time anymore. Interesting. What about our other platforms? Were there ways that you can do kind of interactive model exploration or even demonstration? So one of the companies that we work with um, actually makes medical games for doctors. So it is, uh, it's, it's a real um, engine, a simulation of a human body, right? And, and doctors can actually can collaborate even doing a procedure, like maybe it's our arthroscopy or something like that, through remote uh, participants working together, collaborating together on a medical procedure. And we need that for space flight for the reasons that Adam was talking about. We, we may not have the communication with Earth, and so we need to be self-sufficient. So, so um, I think it's, it's critical to think about the applications beyond just entertainment, obviously, of collaboration tools, you know, real collaboration tools. So you can envision even you know, scientists working on a on a, a computer problem, or maybe they're working on a rendering of a protein model, or and and being able to virtually collaborate in real time, moving maybe protein models around, or you know, having that exchange. Those capabilities working in real time, and you know, digitally moving things um, and sharing those kinds of experiences, uh, like the medical gaming company that's doing that. Um, I think is the future. We, we're definitely looking at those things for space flight. Great. Yeah, the Zoom whiteboard is kind of a tool like that, easy to use. Um, it's it doesn't <laughs> you don't have to learn CAD CAM design to 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 interact with it. You can draw shapes, and, and we give uh, customers the ability to create templates. So you know, um, my colleague might create a nice uh, whiteboard, and I can then just pick that as template and deploy it to other places. Uh, share it across the board, limitless canvas, so that you can you know continue working in on one end while call, uh, another team works on the other end tagging each other, sharing with each other. Um, those those capabilities help. Um, we were talking about fatigue on video, so converting your video into an avatar is something that we are experimenting with uh, so that, you know, it helps uh, not only be live, but uh, don't have to worry about what I'm looking like that day or what I'm wearing that day. <laughs> or, or sometimes younger uh, participants may not be comfortable sharing their uh, live stream. And so, uh, yeah, there, there can be m many approaches to this and uh, it has to be easy, intuitive and uh, 
interactive enough to be meaningful. I mean, some of us are on camera all day long, it seems like, right? And so uh, even taking a bio break, I, I when I turn off my camera, I feel like like people would think that I'm not interested, I'm not engaged, or I'm away from my computer, but maybe I'm just eating, or maybe I just had to get up and you know go to the restroom and I, I came back and it's just it, it's people people need uh, an opportunity to take a break for a second without communicating that they're not interested. And so I like what you're saying, Sammy. Is there a way to what, what would the avatar do? Is it just a picture? Would that avatar actually be doing something while you're while you're off camera? Yeah, actually, it's pretty cool. Uh, it it can be an animated character, uh, like an animal, or or a human animated character that you can choose and customize. So you know, I can be uh, without hair and with glasses to suit my uh, you know uh, profile, and and then uh, when I speak. Uh, the mouth moves along with uh, head gestures and and eye uh, blinking. Uh, so you know at least it is interactive in that sense, and it's not just a static image. Um, and you can uh, you can you can use it while flip turning off video. So you know uh, I may have to walk across the room to pick up something, but I turn off video and I can still speak or hear, and and the avatar will mimic as if I'm speaking uh, right there without having my. Video video on or like you said if I'm taking a break initially we started with just these little filters like I can put a mask in front of me and and then eat my sandwich or soup uh, but then we said you know that uh, that that's not as helpful so we, we are trying avatars now see if that uh, is uh, more uh, you know easy to use and and still allows that interactive element great I wanted to touch on the idea of sponsors, and Bob brought up in the beginning of his presentation um, the joke that how do we get people to visit the sponsor who's virtually when in person, yeah, everyone's kind of drawn to find out what it's all about somehow. Virtually, that has not converted. Um, so maybe we can all talk about ideas that engage audiences more with those sponsor booths or incentives what ideas do people have to because sponsors are a big part a lot of funding for these platforms for nonprofits and government and various organizations that have to hold these meetings cost is an issue so how do we get the sponsors to get out of the meeting what they need to I'm happy to pick that one up if that that's good. Um, so the the crux of it is that sponsors really care about collecting leads. I mean, that's ultimately what you sponsor a conference for. You want to you want to get leads. You want to get people you can talk to that you can then sell products to. That's broadly speaking it. Uh, in the the real world, that's sold mostly through booths. Uh, both booths seem to be the the de facto way that every conference runs, and that's how the sponsors get their value for money. Um, usually the bigger the booth, the more expensive it is, and so on and so forth, um, but it's ultimately about foot traffic. The problem you've got with online events is that for the most part, you are just getting yourself a, a branded element somewhere in the event, and that doesn't cut it because for the same amount of money that they're spending to get that branded element, they could easily um, pay for some online advertising and probably get a far better return on investment. Um, so you're competing against digital advertising when you're online. And the problem is that you don't have the high engagement value that you do um, with uh, just a, an image or a logo or a shout out from a speaker. Uh, you actually need the ability to have your salespeople speak to the crowd. Um, that's really what you're paying for at a conference and that's what you want to see. Um, and that's the great thing about online uh, environments, uh, particularly virtual worlds, is that you actually get the ability to do that because you can make people literally walk through the sponsor arena before they get to an auditorium if you want to. You can go down that level. Uh, and that means that you've got the ability for the, the sponsor to have sales reps in that thing and the ability to go up and approach someone and say, hey, are you interested in product X? And they get all the same benefits they get from the real world and they don't have to travel people out there. They don't have to spend a whole bunch of money on on uh, overpriced conference uh, booth equipment, i.e. if you want to rent a TV, it's $2,000. It's kind of cheaper to buy a new one than it is to rent from most of these places. So you get to take all of that out of the equation 
And I know having run conferences as well, um, it's not the conference organizer who gets that money. It's always the venue. Um, so you can actually take a bigger cut as the, as the organizers um, from the sponsors. They can get the same value. And I think you're actually cutting a whole bunch of middlemen out of the way in the same process. Uh, so it's sort of a win-win-win for everyone, uh, except for the conference venues, of course. Um, and I think that that can actually be one of those areas where virtual world platforms like ours can deliver a lot of value um, to conference organizers. Um, I, I'm happy to kind of chime in. I mean, I, I did talk about it a bit, but I think there is an opportunity, but it's a shift in a way that we approach sponsorship for events. In majority of events, um, I mean, for pharma events, for example, you can't even have sponsors. There's uh, regulations involved. But for other types of trade associations, for example, sponsorship is key. The way sponsorship was played uh, or is still played for in person event is huge branding. So um, yes, there's a huge element and, and focus on lead gen, but if 5,000 people, 10,000 people are attending a conference, having a big booth, uh, having a big banner on the side, like these are branding elements as from an advertising point of view, um, and it's important. But really what ends up happening is that the, the sponsor is sending the best salespeople to go on site, to shake hand, and to be able to um, answer questions and so on. I think there is another opportunity with virtual event and it may not require the salesperson, but the expert in that company that developed that product or is involved in the research to be part of the program. Uh, and, I, and I call it as an opportunity because it requires a different way of thinking for a lot of organizers because naturally they don't tend to go to the vendor to get content. They go to the consultants, they go to the researchers, they go to universities. And I think there's an opportunity to make sponsors part of the program. What that ends up happening is you don't have to have virtual meetings at the event to bring value to the audience just by providing, hey, these were the people that were interested in your uh, session, or we ran a poll and this is what the response came back, or actually it's an open uh, sort of lead form. People that are interested says, follow up with me. So it's, a, it's sort of a permission driven, um, almost like lead forms online that, hey, contact me, but I don't want to spend you know, the three hours I have in front of TV with a salesperson that I don't really know. And I don't, I don't know how, I mean, in, in a real environment, in, in a booth, um, if you don't like what that person is saying, you come up with an excuse, you look at your watch, it's like, you know, nice to meet you, I gotta go do something. You can't really do that virtually. I mean, it's really rude. Right now, I'm sure Shannon wants to stop me from talking, but like, it's really hard to, <laughs> to kick me off the screen, right? So, so we have to kind of rethink the way, um, you know, sponsorship is played to bring value to sponsors, but also to attendees and think a little bit differently from a legion point of view. Maybe it's not making one hour meetings happen while they've been happening. Maybe it's just providing a list of, these are the people that opt in to want to be contacted and then they can kind of take it post event. Great. Um, I also wanted to come back to the idea of how to make these events more affordable to put on and ways to optimize engagement while minimizing the cost. And Bob had touched on some of this in his presentation. Maybe we could all expand on that and from the view of different platforms as well. Um, for organizations that are nonprofit or just yeah, don't have as much funding, um, how do we engage with these tools, um, but in an affordable and sustainable way so that we can continue to offer these things for our audiences um, for years to come. I mean, yeah, uh, I would say uh, the wrong. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Mommy. I would say the fundamentals are ease of use and ability to scale. So you don't need, uh, you know, very specialized tools to do what you want and, uh, and really take take the tools available all the way from small meetings to larger ones to huge events and multi-track uh, uh, you know events that that are happening all on the same platform and the ability to complement it with tools within the platform all those things help um, to make it you know sustainable uh, with the uh, models that are available in the SaaS world, you know, software as a service, subscription versus one-time purchase, those elements help. Sorry, go ahead, Doran. 
Yeah, I mean, I, it's really key to understand that you have to really kind of do a combination of asynchronous communication and synchronous communication, right? It can't, you can't just give everybody this giant bolus or meal of dense material all at one time. And I think we're all limited in what we can take in, right? And so, you know, you recognize that if you want to convey information or you want engages engagement with with a sponsor, there's it's a combination of sy synchronous and asynchronous communication. So materials ahead of time, materials after, just the right amount, not bombarding, right? Because it's really a sweet spot. Like if you send out too much information, people just like tune out. If and so you you really have to kind of learn what is a good balance. And then when you do convene for the synchronous communication, it's 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 as short as possible and really in engaging and entertaining and to the point. And so I think I think that's the key is is not to cram too much into those uh, synchronous virtual real time uh, events. Adam, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll finish uh, finish off on, on on just saying that the cost of an event isn't the technology. I mean, software is relatively speaking cheap. Um, yes, it can get pricey in certain cases, but broadly speaking, it's not the the cost factor. A well run event though is expensive because you've got people. A well run event has someone organising the program, wrangling the speakers, making sure that the content is compelling, along with all the on the day support where you've got people helping other people. Uh, or you've got people running discussion groups and all that kind of stuff. All of that stuff is the expense on a conference. And I think that the, um, there's probably two ways that you can save money. Uh, the first is obviously to cut back on that stuff, which is not a good idea. I, I think that that's, that's really the, the wrong approach. The second thing is to start reusing materials. I mean, building all this uh, materials for something that is going to execute just once means that you've put a lot of work into something that you're never going to be able to use again. You need to think about how can I change the nature of my conference? Do we actually have to have just one event a year? Could we do 12 events, one a month for a smaller audience? And then we can reuse lots of those materials. Yes, we're using a bit more time, but I think at the same time, uh, you've got less prep time involved, less execution time, and there is an economies of scale from running these kinds of things. And even that can run across departments. You can have one group who, for instance, are running, running conferences for a whole group of different people who have got very familiar with the tools, the platforms, and the, the show routines that are needed to execute these things. And that's how you get your savings. And that's how you keep things going. Because really, a online conference should not cost more than running a real world conference. Venue hire and things is expensive. You should be able to do these things for a fraction of the cost. The question is then more about how much do we have to invest in custom content for each of these things? And how much does that cost to produce? Uh, and then working out how you can reuse as much of that as possible. And Bob, do you have anything to add? Um, I think it's a little bit more complicated. Um, you know, the profit margin for in-person events are higher uh, for, uh, especially for uh, trade associations. Um, there is an aspect of sponsorship that you can really um, materialize to the same level for for online events. Um, but at the same time, I, I agree with Adam. There is a value perception for technology. Um, like I think. When Apple came out, people have a, had a hard time paying 99 cents to buy a game uh, on their mobile device, but they would go out and spend six dollars on a latte. That they, they would basically they could play the game for a month versus drink that latte for in like five minutes. So there's a perception around um, uh, the value of software. Pre-pandemic, I remember the data from PCMA was showing the spend on event apps and Wi-Fi technology was less than two and a half percent or three percent of the total spend of an in-person conference. So you can kind of see like where we kind of started. Now virtual events happened. Well, all of a sudden, all that budget that was available kind of went into sort of um, virtual event companies and they could charge a lot more. Um, and their margins were really high and a lot of you know companies made a lot of money. And then now uh, there is basically a, a challenge by how much can I charge for my virtual event? Um, and when you kind of look at that, the cost of a virtual event is also software. So software is uh, for especially smaller events is is a big portion of the cost. Uh, but the staff 
staffing is a bigger cost. Uh, and I think, um, you know, at least from EventMobi's point of view, I think the, the biggest value that our customers can get when they start using EventMobi on a year round basis and this, they move away from a uh, single use software purchase, uh, which is very used to be very common within the event industry. Uh, so how do you kind of bring all your events under one umbrella and then uh, basically use the same software over and over again? And that's how you get value. Um, I think Zoom has a exact same model. I mean, they came in with this model into the industry and that the adoption for uh, for events that are uh, you know small, medium, and they can kind of run their own conference is is a very effective uh, you know uh, pricing model, um, but not for conferences. I mean, we work with large like Fortune 500 companies as well. Sometimes they like to pay more for buying separately because they can't get the company to agree on doing one purchase order for the company. So they keep buying individually for each event because each event has a different purchase order. I, I like to say that should not be the case for nonprofit associations. And I think there's an opportunity for a lot of um, nonprofits that are kind of work together, maybe to team up uh, and actually use the same software um, for, for their organizations. And they have a better buying power with a lot of software companies um, so that's that's one tip um, in terms of usage of software. The more you can use it, the bigger value you can get uh, throughout the event. And sometimes you have to compromise. For example, EventMobi has webinar capability, not as good as Zoom. But if you're using EventMobi for an in-person event, can you use Zoom? Or it's the other way around too. So you're using Zoom every day for your for your corporate meetings. You really need to go and buy a different piece of software for that single user conference that you're running. So it's a decision that a lot of organizations have to make to be like, maybe we don't need to have the best tool for every single thing we do. Maybe we need to compromise and then just use one tool to simplify the workflow. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we're going to have to wrap up. Uh, it's the end of our session time here. Thank you all for these really insightful and informative discussions. I think we learned a lot here today. Um, I'd like to remind our audience that all the sessions will be available on demand for free after the event, likely by the end of the week. So stay tuned for that. Um, I'd also like to take a look at our poll results before we wrap up. So our first poll that we deployed, we see that um, generally people are pretty either mediocre or disappointed with the event. So we need to improve on the virtual conferences that we're we're putting out there. And number two, when organizing a virtual or hybrid meeting, the most important factor we consider is cost, interactive features, and technical support team are pretty evenly distributed, and there's other factors as well. And our third poll. Have costs to provide hybrid conferencing options exceeded revenue generated by remote registrations? And it's evenly distributed across the board there. So I think it highly depends on the platform and the events. And um, so we'll see how that evolves going forward. All right, we'll now take a one hour break before reconvening to report on the outcomes and conclusions of the event at 2.15 p.m. Eastern time. If you've been invited to participate in one of the breakout discussion groups, please report to your group meeting in about 15 minutes at 1.30 p.m. to discuss what we've learned over the past two days. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you again shortly. And welcome back to our afternoon session on best practices, challenges, and solutions for virtual conferencing. In this session, we will hear from scientific societies, government, and nonprofit organizations who will share their experiences and lessons learned in virtual conference organization and implementation. We will begin with presentations from four of our speakers, followed by a group discussion and Q&A. Then we will take a 25-minute break and conclude this session, conclude this session with the final four speakers, again, followed by group Q&A. You can submit your questions for our speakers at any time into the Q&A chat box and vote on questions that have been submitted. Now we welcome our first speaker, Ms. Lori Wingate, Chief Operating Officer at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. 
Hello, I'm excited about the opportunity to present at this conference and to share some of our learning with you. I'd like to start uh, by giving some context around the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, which we often refer to as NASM. We are mission-driven. We're a nonprofit organization that provides expert advice on some of the most important and exciting challenges facing the nation and our world. All topics from agriculture to earth sciences, engineering, all the way to transportation and infrastructure. They're all uh, disciplines and divisions uh, that, that we support here at the academies. The National Academy of Sciences was created by a congressional charter signed by President Abraham Lincoln in 1863 as science really began to play a, a, uh, an ever-increasing role in national priorities and public life. And it, this NAS was eventually expanded to include the National Research Council, which is the operating arm of the academies, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Medicine. So the NAS, the NAE, and the NAM are honorary uh, member organizations, and these are members who are elected in recognition of their distinguished and continuing achievements in research and practice. Membership is a widely accepted mark of excellence in their field and is considered one of the highest honors that a scientist, engineer, health professional, or researcher can receive. And many of our members have been awarded Nobel Prizes or other prestigious prizes from their disciplines. So in order to perform our mission, which we're going to talk about uh, in COVID and after, after the pandemic, in order to perform this mission, the academies bring together leaders uh, who are top experts in their field from academia, industry, government, and other sectors, as well as members of the academies to provide unbiased, evidence-based advice to the government and to the citizens of the United States. So I'd like to, now that I've set the tone on what our organization does, I'd like to talk a little bit about what, how, how they go about doing their work, which is uh, very, um, very important when we talk about how that work has changed during uh, the pandemic and, and on. So the types of activities that the academies uh, perform are, well, in their traditional workspace, it spans a, a multitude of convening activities. These bring attendees from the thousands to the tens of thousands and, and, and annually may include workshops, conferences, and other gathering of members, volunteers, and staff. Uh, volunteers can contribute to the work of the National Academies in many different ways, including serving on one of our consensus study committees, serving as a member of a board or a standing committee, participating in workshops or symposia, or participating in our rigorous uh, peer review process. In addition to this, we also publish. So the National Academies publishes um, the National Academies Press, over 200 reports and proceedings each year on a wide range of topics. And the National Academies also published the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS Nexus, and several other journals and periodicals. Now I wanna talk a little bit about how COVID changed our world. Now, up until March of 2020, all of the activities that I have described in the previous slides uh, were performed on site. In fact, it was our hallmark, uh, so to speak, and part of our success paradigm to hold in-person, face-to-face convening and collaboration sessions. As with everyone else during COVID, um, all National Academy activities were moved to online venues, meetings, conferences, workshops, uh, as well as daily operations, finance, human resources, information technology, all of these moved online while the facility staff kept watch on the buildings and they watched them empty and then they sat that way for two and a half years. And so um, printing of material stopped and travel stopped and the culture really pivoted and, and basically moved forward without hesitation. The organization con continued to experience solid performance and completing contracts for the plans, and adding new sponsored work without, uh, without, well, without any um, deviation. As a matter of fact, saw more projects coming in 
than in the past. Some of the um, key initiatives that emerged from our, um, our implementation of how we do work during the COVID time, uh, these evolved most specifically since June of 2021. In that time frame, in June of 2021, we started to move into what we considered a hybrid mode. We invited staff back into the office at whatever pace they really deemed appropriate and incorporated a combination of technologies and methods for both internal and external participants throughout, throughout our facilities and in particular throughout our conference rooms. Keeping safety at the forefront of our minds and of our actions, we implemented things like social distancing, masking when risks were high, we required vaccinations in order to come into the facilities, and um, we limited conference room occupancy to minimize the risk. We also developed a path forward to evolve our facility spaces based on an understanding that our staff really wanted to retain the flexibility of remote working at least some of the time and we also needed to address growth. So that path forward included a few things. We started with a move back to on-site events and activities, but always providing a hybrid option. And in some cases, continuing to fully remote. We added functionality like videos, polls, voting, um, other types of collaborative, you know, um, collaborative activities like moving um, individuals from room to room virtually and had a lot of lessons learned around that hybrid option which was very challenging so, uh, as far as making sure that all of the individuals whether they were in the room or off-site were able to participate and be heavily involved much of that we did um, by having everyone log in to the virtual event, even if they were sitting in the room. So in addition to that, we also um, created some new physical collaboration spaces. Uh, we wanted to give the staff the opportunity to try new things and to encourage them to come in to the facilities while maybe working in a different way, coming in to collaborate, coming in to meet up and have impromptu conversations. So the move to, we also took uh, another step of moving to hoteling spaces throughout our facilities. We wanted to um, provide those, provide a space for staff that were only coming in irregularly or didn't need to be in full time and uh, didn't have a need for a full designated space. We wanted to have the opportunity to convert space to other um, more collaborative uh, locations. So we also adopted new technology and methods to facilitate communications and, to, and interactions. The National Academies considers itself uh, in an experimental phase of flexible hybrid work. We are considering how we want to work and what will work best with our members, our volunteers, and our staff. We are still what I would consider slow walking up to in the office time, allowing staff and their supervisors to make decisions about what is best for them and for the organization. We've polled, surveyed, had open sessions and town halls, provided public email folders, and opened other mechanisms to solicit feedback, which we could then evolve from. And we continue to make changes to our policies, processes, and technological environment with new capabilities that address evolving needs. Understand this, we are trying to understand the state of travel and meetings in this new environment, and this is challenging. In some instances, um, our, our staff and members strive to attend in-person meetings again, and hybrid meetings need to accommodate members who cannot or are unwilling to travel. The overall number of meetings for each activity seem to be lower in-person meetings being used earlier in studies to develop group coherence, for example. But we've started to see trends towards an increasing number of in-person meetings over the last year. While the virtual environment has been a challenging one, 
It has also enabled the academies to reach an unprecedented number of uh, breadth of audiences and more successfully to engage the public with our work. We've had a large number of successful virtual and hybrid events, including in-person events, uh, three academy annual meetings, which, which included two of those, including indoctrination of three years of members. Um, so thousands of people uh, were brought together to our facilities over the course of this year. And this has allowed us to draw upon and glean useful information about um, lessons learned, platforms, and technologies. So we're still recovering <laughs> from the pandemic, I would say. Our current on-site office space is dominated by individual offices and workstations. And moving forward, we believe that staff desire building spaces that are more flexible and adaptable to suit um, their informal meetings and collaborative work when they're in the building. And we're starting to see as more staff and visitors enter the building, more of the in-person time being spent on networking, innovation, idea sharing, and impromptu uh, collaboration. And the on-site workspace may need to transform um, according to that work. We're going to continue to experiment with hoteling, modular office spaces, and other flexible office arrangements and uh, continue to use the virtual meeting technologies, which increased from 30 a day from pre-pandemic to over 400 a day in September, and that number just keeps rising. Um, while, you know, while we're seeing this, this uh, number of virtual and hybrid meetings grow, we're watching that very carefully and monitoring to make adjustments all along the way. We're striving to create this new normal as we emerge from the pandemic, um, and we have a new perspective. It's provided us the opportunity to rethink how we do things and to consider how our work impacts the environment as well. We desire to reduce our carbon footprint and at the same time, more staff are commuting and our volunteers are traveling to us more often. How we balance that going forward was gonna take work and innovative thought. And NASM is a traditional organization and vectoring back to in-person for the act those activities that are ripe for innovation Freeform discussion, ideation, social interaction, etc., is really important to us. Although, um, as we do move into these areas, we're looking for ways to broaden our opportunities for engagement. So, I just want to point out a few, wind up by a few talking points about some of the lessons learned. Now, I think you probably have felt this as well, but fully in or fully remote is easier than hybrid. Hybrid meetings require one to be extremely thoughtful attentive and present. Technology has improved vastly, but there are still challenges. You know, face-to-face -face meetings and face-to-face -face interactions build social capital and they fill a voice, a void uh, in human interaction. It's very different in person and, and we need to have that social capital because that uh, allows us to excel at what we do. So our rapid and effective adjustment to the pandemic demonstrated the workplace model that includes a significant video component. And that's, that is the way we're going to be moving forward. Um, the fully remote and hybrid environments opened up opportunities to broaden our reach, invite volunteers from a more diverse background and provide unprecedented flexibility to our staff. And, the, and with the impact of the environment front of mind, we actually need to move very carefully and, and, and give thought to what is the right answer. So I want to thank you very much for your attention and I hope you are enjoying the uh, presentations and I look forward to our open um, Q&A coming up after the next speakers. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Lori. Our next speaker is Dr. Richard Gallagher, President and Editor-in-Chief at Annual Reviews, who will tell us about virtual and hybrid editorial committee meetings for Annual Reviews journals. Thank you, Shannon, and hello, everyone. Um, I want to say I really appreciate um, the Keystone organization uh, putting this meeting together. It's great to share the issues with um, people who are in similar situation, and I'm hoping that we'll all learn a lot from this. I'm going to talk about the particular set of meetings that Annual Reviews organises, and I thought I would start with a little bit of background about our organisation. 
We are a small non-profit um, publishing company based in uh, just outside San Francisco. It was founded in 1931 uh, by a group of scientists, biochemists actually, who felt that there was information overload in biochemistry and they needed an annual review of everything that had gone on. Uh, so it was founded by scientists, for scientists, and has continued um, to, to follow that model, uh, adding more and more journals over the years. We only publish review journals, 51 of them in total. Um, for what it's worth, 35 of them are ranked in the top three in their field. Though we share a lot of the same uh, volunteers that the that uh, Laurie talked about uh, for the National Academy, our authors and our editorial um, board members are uh, from a similar group. Um, although we uh, solicit globally and, and not only from within the United States. The content of our journals are 100% invited. You don't submit a paper for consideration. <clears throat> so the editorial committees and the editorial committee meeting is absolutely the um, center of, of everything that we do. Our editorial committees uh, comprise of 10 to 15 people and uh, they serve five-year terms typically. So there's a cycling through of new members uh, constantly. Annual Reviews is working on becoming an open access publisher in 2023. Uh, we've developed this new model called Subscribe to Open and it looks like it's uh, going to implement OK and, and all 51 of our titles, we hope, will be open access from uh, next year onwards. We also publish a general science magazine that I won't talk about uh, any more today called Knowable. Oh. So I'll go through the pre-pandemic arrangements. So this covers, the, I guess, the first 90 some years of annual reviews existence. Uh, we each journal has um, every year a uh, one day, so actually sometimes more than one day, but typically a one day in-person editorial committee meeting, which selects the journal content for the upcoming issue. Historically, these meetings have been held in uh, the United States, sometimes in other um, uh, places in, in North America, but mostly in the United States. But well, increasingly, as we've um, diversified the geography of the committee members, the meetings are held in other parts of the world. And that's typically in Europe, but sometimes also in Asia and um, sometimes in Latin America. In the pre-pandemic era, we occasionally had um, remote participants. I guess it was somewhat frowned upon. It was audio only, and it was just in circumstances that people couldn't make it to the meeting. They, they, they would dial in, at least for a period of the meeting. Uh, our committee saw the in-person meetings as essential to their task uh, for high quality interaction and, and uh, discussion about, about their subjects. Also, the meetings were considered to be a major perk, and still are considered to be a major perk of, of being on the editorial committee. Uh, it's often described as um, you know, the most useful meeting that they have in the whole year because they're sitting with only a dozen or so um, experts in their field and they're teasing out these uh, uh, very interesting uh, issues, um, discussing all these topics and, and who might cover them. Um, there are also, as has been mentioned, important social events. People get to um, uh, gossip, catch up and so forth. Um, I don't know that anyone's met a spouse at any of our meetings, but I guess that's a possibility as well. Uh, on the negative side, the costs of these meetings were continuing to rise in the pre-pandemic era. And of course, we were aware that this was the major source of greenhouse gas emissions for our organization. Um, we started to um, collect data on our carbon footprint in um, 2019 and, and uh, buy uh, carbon offsets to, um, to, to cover that. But nonetheless, uh, this is a, a major source and a problem for, for the organization. We did a few problems with meeting timing because everybody went to the same location. And other than those who had a bit of jet lag, um, it, it all worked perfectly. Uh, during the pandemic, of course, all of the staff were remote. All of the editorial committee meetings suddenly had to be completely virtual. 
And after some trials with different platforms, we settled on Zoom, principally because it was the one that most people were familiar with. And so it didn't involve any training. They were comfortable to join. Initially, we uh, really replicated the in-person format, which was quite unsatisfactory. You know, to sit, as, as we've already heard, to sit for a whole day uh, on a Zoom meeting, uh, only speaking rather occasionally, um, was, was not really good. It was far too long. People were really insufficiently engaged. Um, also, as, as we have committee members around the world and the meetings were organized, usually around times that were most convenient for East Coast US, which is where most of the committee members still tend to be based. It made it very difficult um, for, especially for Asian and Australasian participants who were sometimes joining the meeting at two or three a.m., sometimes working through the night. And despite that fact, we've increased geographic um, participation through the pandemic period in part because it didn't cost us any money to have guests from different parts of the world, so long as they were prepared to dial in at awkward times, we were delighted to have them. Uh, moving to a remote um, format did put new committee members at a disadvantage. They, didn't, they weren't able to see how things worked. They, it wasn't obvious to them how, how to uh, interject and so on. But we've gradually adapted to the medium. The meetings have become shorter. Uh, we've introduced um, uh, changes to how the meetings are run to make them more equitable so that everybody gets a chance to speak um, regularly during the course of the meetings and so forth. And these uh, virtual meetings, I would say, have been effective. We haven't had to delay publication of any journals. But I think there's been less enjoyment, less sparkle uh, to the events uh, as, as they've been virtual. It's um, saved us money for sure, and there have been environmental benefits of not flying people around the world. The current arrangements, I'm not trying to suggest that we're not still in the pandemic, but I want to um, look at this current era of uh, where we've moved to more hybrid, a hybrid kind of approach. At the moment, most of our meetings are hybrid, and there's a minority that are still fully remote that depends on the editor's preferences. Um, now we have rules that in person, even for hybrid meetings, uh, we have new committee members joining that will only participate um, virtually fr fr from now on. And uh, the committees have, of course, been happy to accept that. But most of our committee members prefer in-person meetings. And I think it, it affirms the importance of the fuller engagement that you get when you, when you spend the day and in, in the evening uh, with, with the people on the committee. Uh, some of those uh, new committee members especially have uh, committed to remote um, participation, whether it's for family reasons, uh, for um, uh, reasons to do with climate change, for um, impositions from their, from their institutions. Uh, we're, we're happy to have them join remotely. And we've introduced, and I want to give a call out to my colleague Jen Jongsma, who's also on this meeting, who has done a lot of the innovation here. We've in introduced uh, strategies to make sure that all participants, whether they're in person or remote, or remote, are on an equal footing. And I can talk a little bit more about that perhaps during the discussion. We do tend to have uh, frequent late withdrawals from in-person participation, uh, whether someone's just had a positive COVID test or for various other reasons. Um, there's a lot more churn in the arrangements than there, there were before. And uh, these timing issues um, are definitely exacerbated by participation across time zones, um, even in Europe, but especially participation from people in Asia and, and Australia. In general, as was mentioned earlier, the meeting costs uh, where we are in person seem to be much higher than they were pre-pandemic. Flights are more expensive, hotels are more expensive, and so on. The outlook, and uh, uh, this is the final slide, um, I think, is I, I don't think that I see a consensus on what the best way forward for us is. That's why I'm so excited about this meeting, because I'm really interested in hearing about other experiences. We are um, exploring 
going to a situation where we do alternating meetings one year we do completely remote and then the next meeting we do hybrid so that we still get the benefits of the in-person um, uh, exchanges but that we have some of the of, of the cost savings and and uh, carbon uh, uh, output savings of, of of being remote we're also doing more pre-planning so that the meeting is much more efficient when it does take place. We don't start off at 7 a.m. and intend to finish around 5 p.m. We try to do a lot more of the work ahead of time, and there's definitely good ways to do that. One of the things that I've noticed is that I've certainly interacted a lot more with the editors since uh, since the start of the pandemic. Um, it's quite ironic, really. I didn't have much contact with the editors maybe once or twice a year, um, and I'd see them at the meetings. But now um, I tend to have, uh, Jen and I tend to have meetings every quarter or so with our editorial teams. And I think that's a huge benefit. And other members of the staff are all also interacting more with the volunteers. Um, uh, we've been working on uh, workflow changes and DEI initiatives. So we've actually been changing the way that we publish and we've been changing the nature of um, of the output uh, we've we've had uh, in parallel with the changes to the meetings we've had a very strong DEI initiative which has resulted in us becoming a lot more diverse at the committee level and at the people we invite level. Um, I'm hoping that uh, that the way forward will see will be at least budget neutral for us. Um, there are huge concerns around increasing costs and hopefully we'll make savings. Um, if, but certainly be budget neutral. And whatever we do, we want to see re reduced greenhouse gas emissions over the all in person approach. In fact, um, if our meetings went to all in person again, our greenhouse gas emissions would go up because we're flying more people from uh, more distant parts of the world to participate. So that's a, a, a consideration that we're also very interested in, um, in taking into account. So that's where things are with us, and I'm looking forward to hearing um, how other organisations are are addressing the issues and and to hearing some uh, some smart solutions that we can apply. Thanks very much. Great, thank you so much, Richard. Our third speaker is Ms. Jennifer Pesinelli, Executive Officer at the Biophysical Society, who will tell us about balancing culture and accessibility the impact of virtual meetings at the Biophysical Society. Uh, thank you very much, Shannon. I'm happy to be here today to share with you what the Biophysical Society has been doing, um, but also, as Richard said, to learn from you all um, and to have some great discussions. So I want to share a little bit about uh, what the Biophysical Society is and what we've been doing with respect to meetings. Um, and cannot help but to give a shout out to my director of meetings, uh, Dorothy Chaconis, because she and her team have been leading our charges on this. So the Biophysical Society is uh, an organization, an individual member society that operates at the interface of biological uh, life sciences and physical sciences. We just underwent a strategic planning process this year to update our strategic plan. And I'm sharing with you our goals here because our goals um, from the strategic plan as well as our prior plan really drive what we do and how we operate. Um, so fostering a diverse and inclusive global community is our number one priority, um, as is investing in the future of biophysics, sharing knowledge about biophysics and advocating for biophysics. So how we meet, where we meet, um, and what we do is, is very important in, in terms of uh, achieving all of these goals and making sure that everything that we do is accessible to our members um, as best as possible. But there's a lot of complications with a meeting like ours. A little bit more about the society. We have about 7,500 members, primarily in academia, some in industry, but others uh, in government agencies. A third of our members are outside of the United States, so this is very important in considering uh, how we meet and when we meet. 35% uh, of our governing body, our council, is also are also international members, which is great because it's it makes it easier for them to be very mindful of our members 
um, and how we present ourselves and, and what we do. We have a large annual meeting, which I will talk about in more detail. We also have uh, several small meetings throughout the year. We also have a large journal program, uh, large meaning importance to our organization. We publish three journals. We have an eBooks program, we have 18 subgroups, uh, which are a key part of our meeting. Our subgroups are like special interest groups for some other organizations. We have 47 student chapters. Uh, we do a lot in terms of education and career resources and have a fairly decent advocacy program for biophysicists as well. Uh, we have 17 staff. Uh, we're small um, and very busy. Uh, in terms of our meetings, um, so I'm going to focus mostly on our annual meeting today, but also did want to mention our thematic meetings of BPS conferences in a little bit more detail because they are part of how we serve our international community. Um, also, we had a few virtual symposia and networking events, which is not the best name for them, but I'll explain a little bit more about them and how they have really helped us reach out to our membership. But concentrating on the annual meeting, so this is the profile of our meeting pre-pandemic. Um, it's a five-day meeting. We have governance meetings on either end of it. Uh, we have um, uh, workshops. We have also um, uh, other events leading up to the meeting. So it ends up being more than five days for most of us. Um, but it rotates uh, West Coast and East Coast. We have a lot of members in Asia, so our West Coast meetings are very have been historically very accessible to them um, and very popular, which is why we've been doing a rotation with two on the West Coast and one on the East Coast. We've averaged uh, about 3,500 attendees over the years. With uh, I'm sorry, 5,300 attendees with 3,500 abstracts um, over the years. Uh, we have 112 average in invited speakers to our symposia, plus 100 subgroup speakers. Um, we kick off our annual meeting with a subgroup Saturday, we call it, where all 18 of our subgroup uh, each host a four-hour symposia. So we have half of those in the morning and half of those in the afternoon, and those are very a big draw for our annual meeting because that's where all of our members get to really dive into their specific areas of uh, research and content. Um, we have 24 symposia and 64 platforms usually, and we're running nine concurrent sessions. We have over 50 uh, organized sessions from committees, meetings, or other events that occur during our annual meeting, um, and we've been averaging 130 exhibiting companies. So it's a very large meeting, and we were fortunate enough to meet in um, San Diego in February 2020, just prior to the world shutting down. So unlike some other organizations, we were really lucky that year that we were able to meet in person. Um, and these are photos from that year. We have a very connected community. There's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of networking. I'm sure with uh, those of you who have similar types of conferences, you know that very well. There's great conversations going on throughout the meeting in the hallways, uh, in the exhibit halls, in the rooms, in before meetings, after meetings, et cetera. So, being together and being in person has always been a big part of our meeting culture. Um, in 2020, as I mentioned, we were lucky enough to meet in person. It was February and our keynote speaker was actually from China. He was the winner of our BPS annual lecture award, which is our largest society award. He was not able to travel as uh, shutdowns of our tra travel from China had already begun occurring. So we actually Skyped him in um, and that was the first time that we had ever had a remote speaker uh, at that level of a session in any one of our meetings. And little did we know that that was sort of the beginning of um, what our entire meeting was going to look like the next year. In 2021, uh, along with everyone else, we had an entirely virtual meeting. We kept a five-day um, event, but we had a different format. We only had five symposia, where we had many more in prior years. Um, we did focus on our subgroup symposia and, sorry, we had four live symposia, which were sort of main event, main speaker sessions. Uh, we did keep all of our subgroup symposia on the first day and our platform sessions. And part of that was to prioritize the individual topic areas as well as our younger members who tend to speak more often in the platform sessions. So we had concurrent sessions. Uh, we had online poster gallery with live text chat. The vendor that we used for that did not have um, video capabilities at that time, but got that shortly after our meeting, uh, which was in February 2021. 
and we did leave the content available for eight weeks following the meeting. We had fewer attendees, unlike some other organizations who saw a big spike in their attendance when they were virtual, um, we had a drop in attendance um, and far fewer abstracts and exhibiting companies as well. I was asked to share vendors that we worked with, so this is just a quick snapshot of who we worked with for that meeting. Um, Cadmium CD was our main meeting platform, and they did our e-poster gallery and our virtual exhibit hall. Um, they were modifying their platforms and technology along with a lot of other vendors before, during, and after our meeting. So I think we had a lot of good features and, and more came after we, we met with them. We did use Remo uh, as we we're using for this particular conference to do some of our networking events. We, we went ahead and had our um, poster competitions for our students and our undergraduates. We also had several general networking sessions um, and meet the editor sessions, and Remo worked very well for us. So short of being able to meet in person and do those things like we usually did, it was, it was a good solution, and I think our attendees engaged quite well in that. And we relied heavily on our uh, audiovisual vendor, who was uh, formerly named VAV, but is now part of Inspire, and they did pre-recording of our um, uh, anchor and platform speakers and our subgroup speakers. We did have live Q&A. Um, but all those talks were recorded. They produced our live sessions and then they streamed and recorded our um, live Q&A sessions as well. So in terms of feedback for our virtual meeting, of course, there was a mix, but these were a couple of the themes that rose to the top is, is people did like the ability to attend the meeting while working from home. Uh, there was a flip side to that, that people said they were distracted, not as uh, able to concentrate as fully on the meeting as when they're there in person. But they did like to be able to switch easily between sessions. Um, some people preferred to ask questions via chat rather than in person, so, so that was nice for them as well. Um, but we did get a lot of feedback that people really missed the in-person interaction engagement that they usually have at our meeting. Um, and I think you know, we, all, we all felt that, but we're, we're pretty pleased with the way that the meeting went overall. In 2022, though, we were able to meet again in person, and we met in San Francisco this past February. But we did not want to move entirely to in person um, because we still had members that were unable to travel either due to the pandemic, travel restrictions, inability to get visa, or just the expensive things. So we did have an on-demand option as well, where we recorded um, certain sessions, and we had our poster gallery online again as well. Uh, our attendee, our attendance numbers and our abstract numbers were not as strong as they were in 2020, but they were better than uh, they were for the virtual meetings. We did have a number of COVID protocols in place, of course, like vaccination verification. San Francisco was requiring the booster leading up to our meeting, and that was really a barrier for a number of our attendees, um, especially international attendees, to get the booster. So that had a big impact on some people's ability to attend. Um, we did cancel a major social event to help keep it safe. And while people missed that, I think they were, uh, they understood that for sure. So we were back in person, but with a little bit of a mix in terms of having an on-demand element as well. Registration, however, for that on-demand event was not very strong. Um, and the components that people could use prior and during the meeting, such as the online poster gallery, um, were used a lot then, but not used as much after the fact. And we actually only got about 80% of the um, poster presenters loading their posters up in the poster gallery. Somebody had made a comment before that scientists sometimes don't want to share uh, in a hybrid event, uh, in a hybrid environment, and that was certainly the case with some of our attendees. They did not feel comfortable posting, posting the information. So we felt, too, that the People who attended or participated in the on-demand only were definitely missing some of the content from those who were there in person. Um, but in terms of financial impacts, prior to the pandemic, the annual meeting was a very nice revenue generator for our organization, and, and we depended on it quite a bit. Um, we lost money in 2021 with the virtual only. Again, attendance was down, exhibits were a fraction of what we had before, and, and costs were different, right? We didn't have all the expense of the in-person meeting and the travel, um, but we were still paying for new platforms and technology. Then with 2022, moving back to that in-person, but having on-demand, 
um, between on demand and um, COVID precautions, we had quite a few more expenses that we normally do. Uh, so again, we had a net loss this year with our annual meeting. And for 2023, we are doing in-person only. We are not repeating on demand for this meeting. We do not feel that it was successful enough um, to warrant the costs. Um, and we're budgeting to break even. We are concerned about some accessibility issues because there are still those who are concerned about travel for a, a number of reasons. Um, visas also remain a challenge for some of our members and we know that will impact them as well. But we look forward to um, seeing how we recover with the 2023 meeting and then what we can do uh, moving forward to make our events more accessible. The, as I mentioned, we met in 2020 in San Diego. And then when we met again in 2022, a lot of our members said that our meeting was the last thing they attended before the pandemic and the first thing they attended after the pandemic, which was, which was kind of nice um, to be back together. But, you know, to follow on to uh, some of the comments that Richard made, you know, even though our annual meeting itself has moved back to primarily in person, we have moved a number of our governance events to uh, to virtual, including one of our annual council meetings, a number of our committee meetings, an advisory board meeting. So we never had any of those things virtually prior to the pandemic, but we did learn that those types of meetings, we could be very successful and effective. Um, so that gave us an opportunity to save money um, as well as do the business that we needed to do. We have also um, continued to do our small meetings in person. We rescheduled all the 2020 and 2021 events because of the pandemic. There's always been discussions about should these small conferences be um, hybrid? Should they be virtual? But the intent of the thematic meetings in the BPS conferences was to help serve uh, international members or members in locations who weren't necessarily accessible to our annual meeting. Uh, so they're small meetings, they're member organized, and they have typically about 100 to 120 people attend each of them. And there's been just an overwhelming sense from organizers, attendees, and even our leadership that these need to remain in person. That said, we have had some virtual symposia. Our first one was addressing COVID-19 challenges. Another was to celebrate the Protein Data Bank anniversary. Um, we also have what we call networking events, and again, probably need to be rebranded because prior to the pandemic, these were member organized um, sessions, symposia, half day workshops, et cetera, in Africa, South America, Europe, just all over. And we do about 12 of those a year, and we give the organizers the chance, the opportunity now to decide whether they want to do it in person or virtually. Um, and those are very popular and very well attended and make our content accessible to members in, in remote places throughout the world. So I'm wrapping up here, but uh, look forward to the discussion with the panel and look forward to hearing any questions that you all might have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. And our final speaker in this group is Mr. Derek Orr of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. He is Division Chief of Public Safety Communications at the Communications Technology Laboratory. Today, he will tell us about the integration of virtual content in the Public Safety Communications Research Annual Stakeholder Meeting. Great. Thank you so much, Shannon. I appreciate it. Uh, it is great to be here. Um, it's very eye-opening going last, recognizing uh, that we really aren't that different than anybody else that has uh, talked before. Uh, we didn't know that uh, as a program. We felt like everything that was happening to us was unique and our challenges were unique, but <clears throat> ends up that we sound very similar to everybody else. So uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, my name is Derek Orr. I'm the Division Chief of the Public Safety Communications Research Division at NIST, the National Institute of Standards Technology. Uh, we are under the Department of Commerce in the US government and serve as the United States um, Measurement uh, Laboratory. So keeps the nation's time, keeps weights and measures. And my division specifically is focused on supporting uh, the United States public safety community, fire, police, and EMS. Uh, and helping them improve their communications capabilities 
uh, especially uh, after 9-11 when there was a significant uh, recognition of the shortfalls of our public safety's ability to communicate in disaster. Uh, our organization really took off at that point and uh, became a focal point for research and development to help public safety take full advantage of communications capabilities in order to be able to respond more effectively and more safely uh, to both day-to-day -day events and uh, large-scale events. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about and it's going to sound very similar, so I, I, I'll, I'll be careful and not wade too deeply into things that have already been talked about. But um, I'll talk about what our, our past has been uh, very, very quickly. We, we typically gather our stakeholder community, which is made up of public safety. Uh, so as I said, fire, police, EMS uh, around the United States and around the world for that matter. Uh, we also bring in industry, academia, and other government uh, federal organizations to come together and to discuss everybody's contributions and, uh, and capabilities in addressing public safety's needs for advanced communications. We've done uh, a in-person annual meeting for 12 years now, and it has been a cornerstone of our year. We've really used it to hold ourselves accountable to our stakeholders. We've used it to, to, to read out on all of our projects and programs, uh, to provide hands-on demonstrations of the technology that's being developed in-house or through our grantees or prize, prize uh, challenge participants. Um, so it has been an important element of our program to really show the community uh, what we're working on and bring them together so that they can uh, find better ways to collaborate and make new connections. So, as we've heard on in, in every talk today, um, uh, we were used to this in-person event. We typically drew around 500 people a year uh, and, and had uh, a very hands-on experience, especially around technology demonstrations, sometimes as many as 70 technology demonstrations. And then these, this is not a, um, this is, uh, this is not a vendor, um, uh, exhibition. These were more like uh, science projects um, uh, being uh, displayed by researchers, uh, many of them uh, 10, 15 years out and, and becoming commercialized. So, um, so as you can see in the top right corner of this slide, uh, many of them are on tables. It looks more like a science fair than it does a more typical, uh, I would say, um, uh, CES type of event or something with booths uh, that, that didn't exist in, in these uh, areas. So COVID hit, obviously, like everybody else talked about, we were only, we typically hold our meeting in June of, uh, of the summer. And so COVID, uh, COVID shut us down in March. So by then we were already prepared to hold our June event. We had a location, we had an agenda, we had our speakers lined up. Uh, we did not typically do any online uh, content. So we were three months out from a, a date for a uh, stakeholder meeting and had to pivot quickly uh, to create a virtual event so we could maintain um, our effort of reading out and bringing our stakeholders together and ensuring that they're uh, participating and bought into the work that we're doing in our program. Uh, what we did, because we had so little time, uh, we didn't have a lot of time to figure out what it meant to do a virtual conference. So really what we did is try to recreate as much as possible uh, the actual conference. So we, from the ground up, created a scratch uh, PDF environment of uh, an interface where people could come and go to on-demand sessions that were recorded during that spring by all of our researchers that would have provided live sessions. Uh, we did hold a few live session panels. Uh, we also created mechanisms to do technology demos, whether they were pre-recorded or in a virtual environment. And that was all experimental on our part. Uh, we created a networking lounge to try to, to try to still foster the ability of people to get together and, and, uh, and communicate and meet. Uh, and then we had a section uh, focused on our open innovation prize challenge uh, programs. Uh, so that was our initial effort uh, at creating or at least maintaining our annual meeting uh, during COVID. Uh, so we did create a, 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 a 
significant amount of digital content in a short period of time, both in the online sessions and in the demonstrations, and had to create a whole mechanism to help people uh, with help desks and tutorials and be able to, to navigate uh, during the time. Um, so the, the biggest change for us is because we're the US government, uh, we have to be cost neutral in running our conferences or else we have to pay out of pocket out of our program costs. And so we try to, uh, we try to raise enough fees through our conferences to cover the cost of the conference. Um, so traditionally, our conference had cost, it's still a very inexpensive conference compared to many, but typically our conference fees were somewhere in the uh, 350 to 450 range uh, for a two to three day conference. Um, so going fully digital in this experience changed one thing significantly, which was we were able to provide all of this for free. So our conference in, uh, in 2020 was totally free to participants. And that made a significant difference for us. We saw a more than doubling of our attendees from the typical 500 to over 1,000, um, which was, was, was fascinating. We saw that most of that uptick was in the private sector uh, who uh, joined and may not have typically come to our conference. Um, so that was a significant change for us to see that type of a jump in our, in our attendance from going from a, a fairly inexpensive paid in-person, although there is the expense of traveling and hotel costs, I understand that. But, um, uh, but w once we went free, um, we significantly increased the participation rate um, from, from people coming. So getting the feedback from people after the conference, uh, we found that um, one, I think the fact that COVID had hit and uh, people were recognizing that we would be home potentially for a long period of time uh, and a lot of events were being canceled. They were in a, I would say a, um, a willing, they were in a willing state of mind to play in this space and just happy that something was still going to happen instead of everything being canceled. So I feel like we got a pass in the first year in that people were just happy there was a meeting. So um, uh, our overall ratings were high. Uh, people appreciated the ability to get access to the on-demand on content, to see some of the demos. Um, but certainly, like others have already talked about today, uh, we just could not recreate not just the um, not just the networking capability. We couldn't recreate the energy around Q and A's of, in, in individual sessions, uh, whether they were live or on demand. Uh, and so that was something that we were surprised about, especially the Q and A piece, because we did create mechanisms to do that. Uh, it just was very difficult to get that interaction. Um, so, in preparation tw uh, for twenty twenty one, when it became obvious that we were going to be uh, uh, virtual again, we actually began uh, working with a more traditional virtual uh, uh, web interface, uh, developing the entire program with the idea that it was going to be virtual, and we had a year to do so. So we did spend a lot of time on the interface and the content. Um, we did see a decrease in, it was still free in 2021. We saw a decrease in attendees. And really that's, I think that's about that because it was free, a lot of people who otherwise would never come came and found out that's not the place they expected to be. And it, they didn't really have a purpose for being there. And so they didn't come the next year. Uh, but we still saw a typical increase over our in-person meetings. Um, and we did see, again, uh, people were happy with the event, but still, even after trying to re-engineer how we did Q&As and um, tech demos and, uh, and networking, it still fell short of what everybody was hoping for, and that was feedback we continued to get. So uh, moving into 2022, we were one of the first NIST programs that was actually able to go live again. So we did plan for a live meeting in San Diego, uh, and we held that in June of this year. Uh, and we tried to bring together the best of both worlds of everything we had learned from our event, uh, our, our events prior to COVID and our virtual events during COVID. And what that meant for us is that um, we did continue to create 
on-demand sessions uh, that um, people could get access to if they weren't able to make it in person. Uh, but we also created a very, um, I would say, hybrid approach to in-person meetings. Now, this wasn't a hybrid meeting. You could not watch the meeting live virtually. You could, uh, you could access the on-demand content, but you could not participate virtually. You either were there or you could access the, uh, the, the digital content. Um, so uh, we created a mechan uh, mechanisms to enhance the ability for people to interact uh, while on site. So we created, we went away from the more traditional push of information to attendees and traditional PowerPoint settings and instead created things like campfire sessions where people sat around and it was a collaborative uh, facilitated session getting feedback and, uh, and ideas from our attendees that help drive our program in the future. Um, we, we had 331 attendees, which is down from our normal number, but we were happy with that given the fact it was most people's first time out from uh, post-COVID. Uh, and we are planning for our June event this year, and we expect to probably be back to normal, if not above. Um, so uh, what we really focused around this meeting was creating a more uh, hospitable environment in the COVID world. So those campfire sessions, we, we uh, had the ability to hold a number of our sessions outdoors. So we did that and that made people feel much more comfortable. Uh, San Diego allows for that oftentimes. Uh, so again, we did see a decrease in attendance, but that was really one of the first outings after COVID. Um, so we weren't surprised. We did see people uh, much more excited. The energy was back from those uh, two years of, um, of uh, virtual sessions. And they truly appreciated having a, a less push uh, um, traditional push uh, of information to attendees and, 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 and instead being able to fully participate in the discussion in, in live, um, uh, live facilitated uh, uh, sessions. So that's something we definitely want to continue leveraging. And we went back to hands-on technology, technology demonstrations, which made all the difference in the world. Obviously, it means something to actually be able to put a headset on, see a heads up display, uh, hear audio of, of communications and understand the impact on the first responder versus seeing it virtually uh, or pictures of what we're working on. And you can see the results from feedback we got from our surveys, our post uh, surveys from the conferences uh, in the two on the left are our virtual ones. And people were talking about that it was good information, a good way of uh, you know creating um, the ability to digest information through on-demand sessions. But then you go over to our 2022 meeting, and everybody was talking about networking, collaboration, innovation. Um, so you, we really saw the importance of that element to our attendees. Um, uh, we also created a virtual lab tour um, so that people could visit our site here in Boulder, uh, given the fact that COVID really shut down that capability. And so now people can walk through our 360 degrees degree space and come visit us anytime they want. And that's kind of this, this need to, um, to, to give access to people uh, in a virtual environment. Um, so looking forward, we are going to be focusing on networking, tech demos, Q and A's, uh, interactions, and uh, we probably won't do as many on-demand sessions, uh, but we will definitely be focusing on our live event experiences. Uh, and I hit my 15 minutes, so uh, I will just quickly say that we are certainly learned from the virtual environment and the need to create a hybrid environment uh, when you are mixing tools, especially in our day-to-day -day operations. So we, we, we do have live meetings, but we also all are facing our, uh, our laptops so that we're talking to people um, uh, as, if, as if they were there and not relying on cameras at the end of the table uh, where people feel disassociated from the conversations. So it definitely changed our perspective, but we also understood and found that the, the, the power of a live meeting um, couldn't be replicated. At least we weren't able to replicate it. Um, in, a, in a virtual environment. So um, I appreciate the time. I look forward to the Q&A and uh, I, I appreciate the perspectives of all the other panelists. So thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for those really interesting perspectives about how you all adapted to the changing environments during the pandemic and now as we attempt to do hybrids and things like that. Um, 
As a reminder to our audience, you can click on the Q&A tab and vote on other people's questions if you'd like to hear them answered, as well as that's where you can submit your questions for our panelists. Um, I'll start our discussion today by asking each of you overall, how do the benefits and challenges of putting on virtual and hybrid meetings pencil out for your organization? And we've already heard from some of you if you plan to continue in the future, but how do those considerations go into your plan for the future when it comes to this coming year and more long term? Lori, do you want to start us off there? Sure. Um, so I think that, like everyone else, it's, it's really been this has been great hearing from everyone else, and we are we are in very very similar situations. And I think you know we we want to walk up to this slowly um, and and see how things play out. But we are offering as much as we can. Um, we're going to continue offering hybrid <clears throat> opportunities and during um, our events. Um, some some types of meetings, like board meetings and and that type, um, might be all in or all out. Uh, but I think for for most of our and and member meetings, you know, they can be required to be in. So I think it's a mix for us. It's a mix, and we're we're really open to getting the feedback and understanding how we want to evolve. Richard, any thoughts from you? Yeah, um, the costs of in-person meetings were going up anyway. They're going up even more now. E even not taking anything else into account, we have to find a different way moving forward. I think the answer for us is probably that we do um, fully remote meetings one out of two or two out of three years. But we still want to hang on to the idea of getting people together in person it's it's really important for it's really important for the culture of of our of our journals it's important for us to stay connected with the people that are our volunteers so i suspect that if i was to say how things are going to develop unless there's some substantial breakthrough in in making virtual meetings give us that X factor that we get from the personal interactions then we'll, we'll be looking to alternate. Mm. I like to, in your talk, you call it the sparkle. <laughs> yeah, it's tough to, tough to get that sparkle in the hybrid and virtual environments. Um, Jennifer, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I think uh, one thing I didn't really get to address was the, uh, you know, the idea of doing hybrid with our annual meeting. It's just, it's so large. Uh, the expense is quite, you know, astronomical. Um, so that was why we decided last year to do the on-demand, right? We recorded, not even all of it, but certain segments that we felt were important to offer those. Um, and then even just looking at it for 2023, just the costs of internet access and AV for the in-person alone, let alone to stream anything is just really um, unaffordable for us, um, mm -hmm. kind of outrageous will in some respects. So I really think that, you know, we'll have our in-person meetings, but develop a lot of those virtual, you know, online only events as well with doing the symposia, the virtual local networking events and things like that um, to make sure that we have content available for, for members who can't join us uh, for one reason or another. And, like, and again, like Richard is doing, moving some of our meetings to um, virtual only that makes sense uh, one out of the three council meetings, uh, certain committee meetings and board meetings, that gives us an opportunity to reduce costs and make sure it's they're very accessible. Mm -hmm. And Derek? Yeah, um, you know, an interesting element that, that surprised us, or I guess we hadn't thought about, is that although our meeting became free in the virtual environment because we weren't we weren't getting space at a hotel and people were traveling and we weren't doing reimbursable travel for public safety. What we didn't think about is that it was not free for the program. Um, so I'm a division chief of a division of scientists and engineers and the amount of time it required us to 
plan and then have all the scientists and engineers record and prep and then and then um, publish all that material that's time they're not actually doing the research and the science and we found that um, one their stress levels increased significantly they felt um, even though we thought it'd be easier for them to pre-record and, and present and so they weren't we wouldn't have the pressure of presenting live the, the there was a lot of pressure they, they felt in the recording sessions and getting it right because they could and they, they had the time um, so uh, we have found and are working towards an environment where we're going to try to reduce as much as possible the the stress and load on the scientists keep them in the lab as much as possible and that's probably going to be focusing more on that um, that that engagement style of those fireside chats and other uh, other types of engagements where they're not having to do a lot of preparation ahead of time but they're there to talk to the to our stakeholders and and share information live um, but that was that was an element we were pretty surprised about yeah, it, um, I think we found that here too at Keystone Symposia. It seems simple to put together a platform if you've never done it before, because it just, as an audience member, it's all just appears there. But um, there's a lot that goes on in the back end when it comes to setup and troubleshooting yep. and coordinating. And, um, and it's a learning process as well. So it's not going to go that smoothly the first time around or maybe even the second time around. But then as you kind of do it repeatedly, it can become easier and less stressful, but that's first the adaptations are a little challenging for the organization. Um, Jennifer, you made an interesting point about the cost for your very large meeting was exorbitant and just unattainable versus some of the smaller meetings. Can you talk a little bit more and maybe all the others can also contribute to comparison of costs when it comes to virtual or hybrid and how that relates to the size of the meeting and the format of the meeting right well you know certainly we found with our meeting we are in convention centers right we're too large to be just in a hotel space so we're paying for internet av techs uh, local labor um, things like that and those costs have they've always been high but they've gone up a lot um, since the pandemic and so to be able to set up a room to do streaming or something like that at our annual meeting is just it's something we just simply can't afford. I mean, even select, we'll record our annual lecture this year, but we won't stream it, um, for example, because we go from you know a few thousand dollars to tens of thousands of dollars for one session. Um, whereas our smaller meetings, like our governance or our committee meetings, if we can have those at BPS headquarters or say our president's home institution, um, if we can do them in university facilities or offices, typically the costs are a lot lower and a lot more manageable. So that's that's easier easier for us to do. Interesting. Yeah. So the facility charges is the issue there, not necessarily the platform itself cost. Right. Right. Got it. Does anyone else have any insights about different sizes of meetings you've held or tried to hold? I would say, you know, there's always a cost, right? The cost is either in the facilities, getting the facilities set up or getting IT set up or both if you're in a hybrid. And if you're in a hybrid, you have almost the worst of all worlds. You have to pay for the IT and you have to pay for the facility. So um, trying to figure out what the right model is, where you want to put your money, where you're going to get the most return for your volunteers or for the participants where's that return going to come from? And I think many um, of our uh, of our speakers here spoke of what worked and what didn't work. And so figuring out where you want to put your money on those to get the most bang for that buck is is going to be a really important exercise. And we will do the same thing. Some of, uh, of our larger meetings, which do cost a lot, um, they're you can't do those any other way because they're, they're you know, to recognize or award or and that just doesn't come across the same over a zoom call or something like that it's hard to recognize and 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 make that a very special event so i think it's just going to take some um trial and error to see what works for each of our organizations in each different scenario mm -hmm. and i will just add i 
to back up Jennifer's point, um, we've been very surprised by the amount of cost increase that has occurred just since COVID uh, to the point where we're going to have to consider what impact that has on our events in the future uh, because there's a limit of we have to we have to cover all of our costs with fees but we're really reaching out to a community of firefighters and police officers and ems we can't charge them a thousand dollars right so uh there's an upper limit that we will we're going to be able to go um and that's going to at some point that's going to force us into you know pivoting in some way to address that rising cost so uh, it's, it, it's a it's a, it's going to be a problem and if it continues to move in that direction mm -hmm. Richard, did you raise your hand for something? Yeah, I wanted to make a comment as a meeting attendee rather than as a meeting organizer. And uh, I, have to, I have to say that I really love the opportunity to participate um, online in meetings. I mean, this meeting is a good example. Um, if if you'd, you guys had sent out a call to um, come to Colorado for this meeting, I don't think that we would have got the size of crowd that we have here. There are some, there are some huge advantages to participating in things that maybe are not your absolute core, but they're of interest. And so in a lot of ways, I think that um, the opportunity to participate relatively cheaply uh, in this case, without any charge at all in, in a meeting is make, makes you hugely uh, more broad in, in, in how, in who you, are able to speak to and in the information that you can get. And uh, we're very focused on the people that are our core um, attendees and things like that. But there's, there are these other shit, you know, groups of attendees that are maybe not core that might be drawn into participating in part of all of the virtual meetings. And that's a huge plus, I think, of, of virtual meetings. Yeah, and Derek had mentioned they had a lot more people attend, at least the first fully virtual meeting. Um, Jennifer and Laura, did you guys see increased general attendance to virtual when you did hold that? Yeah, ours we did not. Um, and maybe it could be because we were a, you know, a full year after the pandemic started when we had our first virtual meeting. And I do think we were hearing from some people that there was already some Zoom fatigue, right? Um, but our attendance at our entirely virtual meeting was uh, almost 2,000 lower than our in-person. So, um, and we had, you know, we, we still charged a registration fee, but it was greatly reduced compared to the in-person. And of course, people also didn't have travel expenses, but it didn't, didn't have the draw that some other organizations experienced. Mm -hmm. I would say ours was mixed. Um, you know, we, we would have more people, I think, sh uh, res register for events, but it's a whole lot different to sit on Zoom all day long in a conference rather than moving from room to room physically and seeing people in, in the interim. It's a very, very different experience. So I think that more people anticipated having the opportunity because it was free or it was lower cost. Yeah, this is a great opportunity for me to attend, but then capturing in them and holding them throughout the entire event was also very, very, very challenging. That's true. We actually looked at some of the data of um, how many people logged in, but also for how long and for which sessions for both our on-demand and live stream and virtual meetings. And it is interesting. They seem to, one or two sessions they're like really there for and then they maybe they intend to watch the rest later and then don't get around to it which is often my problem but <laughs> um yeah it's uh it's hard to gauge how engaged that audience is throughout the conference and and often in a conference in a physical conference people will go to a session because they want to hang around afterwards and talk to the speaker and you know, make some connections, and that uh, is harder to do virtually. Mm -hmm. Seems to be harder to do virtually. Um, speaking of that, I there's an audience question here, and I also wanted to touch base with you all about, uh, Jennifer had mentioned the Remo sessions. Um, what kinds of platforms and strategies did you use to do uh, poster sessions or networking sessions, things that are diff more difficult to do virtually? Did you use any creative platforms and how did you kind of envision that and 
did the rollout of that go smoothly or not? Maybe Jennifer, you can expand on um, what you mentioned in your talk. It's like, and Derek, I'm seeing Derek shake his head. No, it didn't go smoothly, but yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, we worked with Cadmium for our online poster gallery. It was, it was a nice platform. I think, um, you know, not having had experience, I, I had a hard time wrapping my head around a virtual poster hall, um, considering we have thousands of posters, um, but it worked fairly well. And as I mentioned, you know, they were continuing to evolve their technology. So there were there are features that they have now that we would have loved to have had during our annual meeting, um, such as the ability to do sort of Zoom connects with poster presenters or you know video connects. Um, what actually happened was some of our members uh, just shared their own Zoom links, public Zoom links, um, which worked in some cases, in some cases didn't because they weren't secure, they weren't within the platform. So we actually um, experienced some harassment from one of our members because other people glommed onto that Zoom link and. Um, just created an unfortunate situation. Mm -hmm. But we used uh, Remo for the networking events. And that was, it was, it was neat and fun and new to our members. Um, it was something that they hadn't done before. I think most of the feedback from those people who engaged in those sessions was, was pretty high. They just kind of liked the concept. It was fun. Uh, it was fun and different and it worked very well. Yeah, Derek, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll, so, you know, we are a R and D shop. We do look 10 years in the future. One of our areas is virtual reality and um, augmented reality. So we like to try to leverage that kind of capability. So we did build in some uh, aspects of virtual reality and, uh, and augmented reality into our demonstrations in that first year to try to give people almost like second life kind of um, uh, uh, interface in which you would be in a room with other people and you had an avatar, you go see their demo, you could talk to them live. Um, yeah, people did not do that. So it was us standing around in our virtual uh, rooms uh, for, you know, for hours uh, floating in space. But uh, so it, it was really hard and otherwise the only other way to do it was just doing a dip you know a video of a demo which loses a lot of that um uh, engagement that occurs during demonstrations uh so you know we tried but it it was really hard to get people out of their comfort zone uh and and try something different and new um so yeah that was that was a lessons learned for us that did not reoccur in 2021 so mm -hmm. Laurie, did you have anything to add? No, I just I thought that was really uh, interesting because you know it is it is uh, challenging to get people to try new things, and uh, just something like that. I had thought about that myself. Of you know, what if we did it this fun way? But clearly, uh, you have a mindset around what you're willing to do in a work environment or and and that doesn't uh, often bleed over into sort of the gaming kind of mentality where you're doing more fun things. It's it's hard to make that transition. We had uh, you know, we, we kept our big our big meetings and conferences in in person and there were very specific things like we didn't do the, you know, poster sessions in the way that everyone's talking about. We just had, you know, certain certain pre-recorded or or recorded uh sessions that people could call into and i just don't think as as mentioned here that they're very popular uh some people will do them but often they like the idea of it but the execution is um lacking so i, I did i did appreciate that derek get that visual uh i won't i won't bother to try that one <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think we saw an interesting adoption as well with the are we did Remo poster sessions as well and networking events. And it also depended on the group. Like we host different topics of meetings and it seemed like some communities were like super into it, really wanted to give it a try. And others were like crickets and just like not, not wanting to give it a go. It also took some adaptation on our part about not just getting the platform set up in the best way and most user friendly way, but how to communicate to them how to use it and where the kind of gaps were in our communication to them um, as to, yeah, how to 
eliminate some of those hurdles and things like that. Um, we have another question about uh, vendors. I know a lot of organizations use vendors as a way to finance meetings in person. How does that work virtually and in hybrid formats? Jennifer, I see you nodding down there. Well, I was, yeah, I was just thinking as we were talking more about the technology, you know, that we did a virtual exhibit hall and uh, it was half the size of our in-person and that did not work very well. I mean, it, the, the platform was really cool and really neat, but our members, attendees just did not go visit exhibitors. So the exhibitor experience was very disappointing. I mean, they had, they got to do all kinds of neat things to set up their virtual exhibits, but it didn't draw and it didn't hold. Um, so that was really disappointing. And the exhibit hall for us is a, a huge source of um, income for our annual meeting. So, you know, we, we again, they paid a fraction of what they would pay for the in-person experience, and even that was disappointing to them. Um, so that certainly hurt. And then, you know, with the return to in-person in 2022, we had some good return on exhibitors coming back in person, still some challenged with pandemic travel restrictions and things like that. But, um, but yeah, I think it's the feedback from our from our community anyway is in person is is definitely valued in that in that area. Yeah, we had a very similar experience with the uh, vendors, although we do a lot fewer than most um, when it comes to our meetings. Laura, did you no, guys do vendors? Our big our biggest uh, one of our biggest meetings is the uh, Transportation Research Board their meeting, and we did a very big uh, we did the the first one was virtual right during COVID, and then they did a in person and it was um we did have a lot of vendors that come in for that and it seemed like there were fewer than you know much fewer and they it takes a lot of effort to set that up and i think the challenge is you're usually getting the vendors who are going to present at and be there at the next one so you need to have them there to make sure that you have fully populated vendor spa spaces in the next one. And I think that we're going to see sort of a residual effect over time of um, trying to catch up on these because we'll do that annual meeting every year. And, you know, we're every year we're trying to get them to commit and sign up to the next, you know, what spot do they want? And if uh, they're not seeing that result, it, it was really kind of disheartening to see how there were people there from all around the world, but it was still disheartening to see so much space between, you know, people weren't weren't at the vendor spot. So I think we're going to see some residual lag in that, and uh, that's going to be challenging. Mm -hmm. Richard, anything from your point of view? With um, no, we have no experience with vendors. I wanted to say something about posters, though. Um, mm -hmm. Posters were always um, a kind of very different way of conveying information at meetings even before um, the pandemic. I think there might be an opportunity there. What I never really liked poster sessions either to present them or to go through the hall because you felt this kind of pressure to say something smart to anyone that walked past. <laughs> uh, and similarly, you I'm felt the up. obligation to engage with someone whose work you might just not have a clue about. Uh, uh, virtually, you could be much more selective about who you go to. And if the posters were available in advance, and I think this about um, presentations as well, I think that one real benefit of 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 a virtual meeting could be that you've already you've already listened to the person's talk or looked at their poster, and the session is more of a discussion. It could be like uh, the type of um, campfire thing that somebody talked about. I think it might have been Derek, um, where. We're having a discussion about a piece of work rather than you're hearing about it for the first time and all your energy is is taken up with just understanding what's going on. You've been able to think about it, digest it, and learn something about it. And I do think that this idea of broadening out what you listen to, so long as we can find ways of marketing our stuff to different audiences, someone from the someone from the National Academies might be, who's not a biophysicist, might be really interested in some of the things that are going on in biophysics. Maybe these virtual meetings should include a very general session that would be a call out to all scientists, or maybe a call out to other groups in society. I think there's lots of opportunities to think about 
how to convey scientific information even beyond the beyond the immediate community here. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, we're nearing the end of our time here, so I'm going to conclude by asking each of you to give us maybe some wrap up thoughts and what is the biggest challenge for your organization moving forward in deciding on virtual hybrid formats and how to implement and accomplish that in a cost sustainable way. Richard, do you want to take us uh, off? Well, to be frank, the, big, the biggest challenge is, um, is we think that we, we can see what we need to do, but bring in the, um, I don't know if I'm on mute. Nope, I can hear you. Oh, bring in the, um, bring in the editors along with us is the problem. They're more conservative than we are. So I think that, you know, that's, that's the real challenge is, even now getting people to realize that there are good reasons for us to change and um, finding new things that we could do that that really um, that they buy into is 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 the biggest challenge that's a good point yeah Lori um I think that's probably two pronged along the lines of what Richard said uh, you know there's a lot of culture and process and policy and everything around what we do and getting that to evolve is a real challenge it's going to be a really a uh, challenge going forward not only for you know everyone who's used to doing things a certain way and getting certain results and then looking at how much things cost and uh, how technically challenging it is to the individuals who we say, well, we want to have it in person and they say, no, we're not interested in doing that. So it is going to take some balance and nuance and, and sensitivity to meeting everyone's needs and, and yet still pushing, um, pushing things along in a way that you can evolve and be more, be cost effective and efficient. So these are the challenges. It's it's a it's a systemic issue that we're all facing. And my my guide, my only um, recommendation or, or thought to leave everyone with is we're all in this together. <laughs> so you know we have to find ways. Now that we we've actually talked about how similar things are our our situations to find um, broader approaches that will help us all move forward to a to a new way of doing business. Thank it you. is interesting. It forced us all to be creative and be accepting of new ways of doing things and to adopt those. And now as we kind of exit the need for that, um, you can definitely feel people kind of recoiling from the, uh, the change and adaptation necessary back to old ways. And it would be great if we can continue to push those boundaries to some extent. Um, Jennifer, did you have some wrap up thoughts? Yeah, I think, yeah, we just have, we, we have communities that need uh, accessible options. Um, but for us, I think cost is the biggest challenge, just given the size of our event currently, which is, you know, why the littler events are easier to focus for those, but it's, it's not equitable, right? So we need to try and figure out how to resolve that. Yeah. And Derek. Yeah, I think uh, I think one of the things is we're gonna people are gonna need to continue to be innovative and uh, take risks uh, as we move towards this post-COVID era, uh, hopefully. And um, uh, however, I think we have to be open to being honest about what works and what doesn't work, and constantly reassessing and changing and adapting. Uh, you know, to Richard's point, um, we did do the. Um, the, the fireside chats, we we provided an on-demand session for every one of those, hoping that and made them available two weeks in advance. Very few people took advantage of it, but it didn't stop them from coming and fully participating in the fireside chat. So it's things like that that we have to kind of step back, analyze, okay, that was a lot of time we spent on that material. So if we didn't get the hits we thought, then what should we do in the future to maximize um, uh, you know, that time in the sessions? 
So I think it's just going to be, I think in the past, we all operated off of things we've been doing for decades. And now we're learning year after year. And uh, it's a good thing, but it's something we're going to have to be open to. That's true. It leads to a lot more benefits, as we've seen with kind of diverse audiences and reach. Um, but it makes for a little bit more work on our end. Great. Um, well, we now have a 25 minute break. Um, first, I'm going to go through some of the poll results that we uh, took during this session. So, Mitch, if you could put up poll number one. So, we see that um, for those organizing scientific conferences, in-person attendance this past year compared to pre-pandemic levels um, kind of distributed evenly, whether they saw reduced, greater, or equivalent attendance. And our next question. In the past year, what percentage of conferences did you attend in person versus virtually? We see a lot more um, in person. 25% attended in person and um, some only virtual. So. Um, thank you all for participating in the polls. We'll have a few more for you at the second half of the session. And thank you to all of our panelists. This has been a great uh, start to considering the challenges and benefits and um, how to kind of figure out what the next steps forward in the post-pandemic era are. So we'll see everyone back here in 25 minutes. Welcome back, everyone, for the final presentations of the day. I'd like to remind everyone that after this session, we will be hosting a networking lounge where you can mix and mingle with our speakers and other audience members to continue these conversations. The Remo virtual platform allows you to jump in and out of small group video conversations as you would at a coffee break or cocktail hour. We encourage everyone to join us to see what the Remo platform has to offer and to connect with fellow participants after this session concludes. Now on to our presentations. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Thale Jarvis, the Chief Scientific Officer at Keystone Symposia, who will tell us about the impact of virtual conference formats during the pandemic and beyond. Hello, everyone, and thanks to the organizers for the in invitation to speak. For those of you that um, missed the introduction that Debbie Johnson gave us this morning, um, I wanted to introduce Keystone Symposia. So our focus is on the life sciences and biomedical sciences. Our conferences, um, typically we hold about 50 to 60 different topics per year. We focus on really top quality scientific content. And our conferences are on the small side. They range from about 150 to 600 participants and with an average of about 225 participants. And this would be pre-pandemic. Um, they have quite a global reach, and that's both in terms of the speakers who come from around the world and also, also attendees. And in fact, where we've held conferences in the past includes 19 countries. Um, we are a nonprofit organization, and, and I say that in part to emphasize that when we think about sustainability of our business model, it's, it, we, we do need to be able to break even on our operations, but our, really our focus is, are we serving our scientific community to the best of our ability? And as Debbie mentioned this morning, uh, we are celebrating our 50th anniversary year. So we're drawing on many, many years and decades of experience with honing in how to do a great scientific conference. So let's focus on those first 48 years before the pandemic. Our primary events were all conducted in person, sort of the traditional scientific conference format. There was no recording or photography and a really strong emphasis on unpublished results, super important um, for this type of meeting. Um, the experience was really immersive, highly interactive, and, and we found that attendees were reporting really high frequency with which they spark collaborations and sharing of data after the conference. I will mention, however, that we did launch a virtual Keystone Symposia initiative actually back in 2015. The content prior to the pandemic was, was really focused there on more open access material. There would be e-panel discussions. We had some public lectures that were um, community lectures and a small collection of what we called SciTalk primers, uh, talks on different scientific topics. We used that 
experience to to really leverage moving into virtual formats as we got into the pandemic. But here's some visual images of, of what a traditional conference would look like. And uh, despite the fact that maybe there's some press around um, people not liking traditional scientific conferences, we find that our community loves these events. And so that's part of the um, situation that we're in right now is, is figuring out how do we adapt to a changing world while still satisfying um, what people value and enjoy about our events. So moving on to the pandemic, um, that was an opportunity certainly to, to pivot to more, more virtual events. And in fact, um, today I'm going to be comparing and contrasting our virtual events to what, what happened in those, those first 48 years, and particularly focusing on 2019 data, where we held 59 conferences. Um, there were over 13,000 total attendees and an average of 230 per conference. Um, then the virtual events that happened during the pandemic, for about an 18-month period, we held a knee symposia series that included almost 50 events totaling um, over 20,000 attendees collectively, um, so an average of a little over 400 per conference, which is almost double our average in person before that. And then finally, a little bit about what we've been doing this year, focusing really on the first half of this year where we held uh, 33 events. Uh, they were a combination of in-person, but also offering virtual access options totaling about 7,000 attendees and, and split almost equally between those who attended in person and those who attended virtually. So, so the e let's talk a little bit more about what we did with the e-symposia events. Um, as I said, we leveraged our experience with virtual Keystone Symposia. Um, about 60% of our attendees at the e-symposia events reported participating in, in the interactive features like the chat, the Q&A and the discussion forums. About 25% of them presented posters, which is a little lower than normal um, for what we'd see in person. About 10% of them were actually um, uh, speakers in sessions, so about 1,100 of those being the invited speakers, and about 800 short talks selected from abstracts. We had about 140 countries represented. Uh, we estimated that it was five to tenfold less expensive to attend if you include the cost to travel and, and have a hotel compared to a traditional conference, and um, at least a tenfold reduction in carbon footprint and, and the collaboration that we did with Kate Whitfield, as you heard in her keynote address, um, um, by her calculations, as much as a thousandfold reduction in carbon footprint per attendee. Um, so, so the e-symposia series most of the organizers we found responded constructively. This was during the pandemic, and obviously there weren't a lot of other opportunities to share science. We did need to go do some coaxing and cajoling in some cases, but typically they were willing to embrace the opportunity. Um, we found that more than 95% of the invited speakers agreed to participate when we switched to a virtual format. Um, and, and we were really pleased with the amount of sharing of unpublished data. That was something that we've been concerned about in moving to a digital format. And, and yet we found that our community responded really positively in that spirit of, of sharing. We, our, our communications team really pulled out all the stops to try and make these as interactive as possible. We had a facilitated um, chat bar, um, similar to what you're seeing in the event today. I did want to highlight, um, we did a one-on-one -on -one connect feature um, where we invited speakers to, to volunteer an hour when they would be available and they were divided into 10-minute slots and attendees could sign up for a 10-minute slot. It was all very easily facilitated on the platform so that somebody could schedule a time and they'd get a Zoom link and then be able to talk one-on-one -on -one to a speaker. We got tons of favorable responses from that feature um, that that people found helped to bridge that, you know, that inability to interact directly with speakers that we get in person. Um, our poster sessions were inter interactive. We used the Remo platform. I think this has been mentioned earlier. Um, we had virtual networking lounges like we'll have at the end of uh, today's session. Um, and, and we also had interactive events like career roundtables and meet the editor sessions. These were highly attended. Um, some of the career roundtables had 70 or 80 trainees tuning in, and that was via a Zoom platform, so very simple um, to manage. Um, we, we did have the opportunity for 
people to submit questions in the chat bar. And again, you've seen that in, in action today um, and the ability to upvote the questions. We certainly did observe that, that more of the attendees, um, more of the junior attendees um, felt it was less intimidating to be able to submit a question that way. And it also removed some language barriers um, where people are maybe more comfortable writing a question in English rather than um, standing up and speaking into a microphone. So, um, so a lot of participation in the Q&A. Um, and, um, and the Q&A often went beyond what we could cover in the live sessions. And, and so I wanted to actually um, share a little bit about what we did with these um, session forums where we, we would take the questions from the Q&A and move them over into a session forum that was available to anybody at the meeting. And this is an example of what a session forum would look like. Um, this was from our our vaccinology meeting in June of 2020. Here we have Daniel Ellis and Barney Graham responding in great detail and, um, and scientific substance um, to questions that have been posed by attendees. And I would say that this was um, a, a way that we subtly democratized access even within the conference attendees where now everybody could see the Q&A and, and the responses as opposed to just having a sidebar with a speaker on your own after a session, which would typically happen in an in-person meeting. And these discussions would go on sometimes for, for weeks or even months after the, the conference, so really extending the benefit of the virtual platform. Um, we had so many positive remarks kind of in the moment when we surveyed people right after the event. Um, I, I don't have time to go into all of these in detail. Um, uh, but but it was really gratifying to see how positively the community responded. Most people very surprised at how much kind of fun and interactive it was. Although everybody was willing to say it was not as fun as, as going to meetings in person. They really felt like there were a lot of benefits. Um, let me talk a little bit more about participant demographics and some survey outcomes. Um, so as Kate alluded to in, in her talk, she shared the data specifically with our tuberculosis meeting. Um, but here's data from, from the whole of, of the e-symposia series that happened during the pandemic and comparing it to 2019. Um, we had over a 50% increase in the total number of countries represented. Um, and that included, you know, in 2019, we had um, 46 lower middle income countries represented at our conferences. And we saw a doubling of that in our e-symposia. And I would mention that we made all of the virtual material available for free to scientists from low and middle income countries. And we are continuing that on today with our virtual formats. Um, and, and so in terms of the percentage of LMIC scientists among all of the attendees that, that almost tripled um, with our virtual formats. And we're seeing similar results with, with our current meetings. So much more global participation possible. Some other interesting demographic trends though um, we found. So this is looking at all attendees and I would emphasize that you don't need an application to register for a Keystone Symposium meeting. So we don't have the organizers are not filtering and choosing who's gonna attend. So we have an open um, policy in that respect. And, and this is just looking at gender representation among our attendees. So, so in the years leading up to the pandemic where we were um, fully in person, um, we we're close to gender parity, maybe 43% of our attendees being, being female. Um, and we saw a sizable jump up in, in the percentage of women. So up, up to about 53% um, of the attendees being female when we went to the e-symposia. And then, and then the gray bar on, on the right of that graph is, is looking at the virtual attendees in 2022. And, and again, seeing higher participation by women. This is something we had always hypothesized might be the case that women may to some degree self-select and not travel as much professionally. We saw a similar effect with um, underrepresented minorities. And, and so for both of these groups, for a variety of reasons have been somewhat traditionally underrepresented at in-person events um, were better represented when we went virtually. And finally, I'll note that um, our, our um, demographics in terms of career stage, we did see some decrease when, in the virtual formats with full professors, 
um, but really across all other career stages, all the way from graduate students up to associate professors went up in proportion. It was really just the full professors, you know, maybe somewhat of a generational divide there that we observed. And um, in looking at survey results, there, there was a question on, on, about Kate's uh, data on um, uh, scientific format that I, I'll get to, um, or content that I'll get to here in a minute. But just to drill down a little bit more on what how our formats differed, uh, the in-person meetings, we all know what they offer. The e-symposia, as I showed you, we tried to replicate a lot of the interactive features. Um, but with, with the um, dual formats that we've been doing in 2022, we've tried both a live stream and, and just an on-demand package that can be viewed later. Um, these have many fewer interactive features. Really, the only interactive feature is has been for the live stream people could submit a question but beyond that they really weren't a comparable product to the e-symposia and i think we'll see that as i share the um the survey results um so quality of science is shown on the left and this is what we were getting at that kate showed for the tb meeting this morning um this is just asking people um how did you rate the quality of the scientific content so the percentage of people that rated it as at the top two levels, excellent and very good, we're up around 90%, and that stayed consistent regardless of the format. So it's an excellent mechanism for disseminating quality science. When we get to interactions between junior and senior investigators shown in the middle, we see a little bit of a drop with the e-symposia and then a substantial drop with the live stream, not surprisingly because we didn't have those interactive features with the live stream. And finally, the one on the right is showing um, we asked, did you make a contact leading to the collaboration or sharing of information, data, or techniques? And we certainly suffer in the virtual formats down about twofold for the e-symposia compared to in-person events. Um, and then with the live stream, another step down altogether. So, so here I would say, you know, there's there's both good and bad. The the e-symposia are certainly less interactive, um, but with 40% reporting. Um, a positive response to making making a contact, and you multiply that by twenty thousand people. That's still a significant number of contacts. Um, and and finally, we've we asked the attendees um, who came remotely this year when they had the choice of coming in person or remotely. What were the reasons? A lot of the ones grouped at the top were clearly related to COVID, so concern about risk or institutional travel restrictions or active illness. Um, but uh, there were a lot of other reasons why people chose to come remotely this year. That included the, the cost of attendance being cost prohibitive, schedule and workload issues, parenting responsibilities, um, and carbon footprint were all cited. And, and then also meeting topic being outside of their main focus. So we're bringing in maybe a larger community of interest by offering virtual formats. So we found that quite interesting. And, and I'll just conclude by um, giving some reflections that we've had. Um, we really see both the in-person conferences and the e-symposia as fulfilling important needs for the community. Both are really um, strong at disseminating science. Um, both are able to promote connection and interaction, not to the same degree, but they are both achieve that. Um, and and we found that the e-symposia certainly offer broader access at a lower cost, and that's both economically and in terms of the carbon footprint, importantly. Um, however, they are more limited in terms of the interactions that they spark. Um, the dual or hybrid formats are still a work in progress. Um, we have found that the live stream, as many people have commented today, are, are both um, technically complex and, and quite costly to be do as an add-on to an in-person event, and they're much less interactive than the e-symposia. So, so we kind of feel like um, it, it's not cost, um, it, it, it's really cost prohibitive for us to do the live stream. So, so at the moment, um, those uh, activities are pretty much on hold for us. However, we are continuing to offer this on-demand package because it's much um, simpler and relatively cost-effective to produce a package of, of uh, talks 
Uh, they lack the interactive features, but they still give the dissemination and the democratization of access. Some of the questions that we're pondering are um, questions about whether um, in-person attendance will return to the pre-pandemic norms. Does, does the community even want that? And, and what would that look like? And, um, and another question is, is will we get scientists to embrace e-symposia beyond the, the pandemic? And, and really, I feel like there, there was a lot of willingness and a lot of enthusiasm to, to give it a go during the pandemic. And we saw a lot of positive engagement and positive results during that period. However, we're, we're sort of in a, in a period of backlash right now where the community is, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of people just basically saying, I'm not, I'm not excited about virtual. I'm tired of it. And, and so there's this kind of reversion to the norm happening right now. And we kind of see a place for the potential, for example, you know, maybe we can alternate between these hybrid and, and, and purely virtual events. And, and some of our previous speakers have alluded to that. Um, so with that, I'd just like to finish with my acknowledgments um, to thank the Keystone Symposia staff. Um, they did an incredible job pivoting under really stressful conditions to, to change to a completely different platform to do virtual events. I'd like to thank the organizers and speakers who embraced the platform and shared their data so willingly, and our, our, our board and scientific advisory board who advised us along the way. And finally, thanks to Kate. It's been fabulous collaborating with Zeroverse and doing this carbon footprint analysis. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for all that data, Thail. As a reminder to our audience, you could submit your questions into the Q&A tab and vote on other people's questions. I see we already have a few entered in there for this session, so that's great. Um, we will now proceed with our next speaker, Ms. Raluca Kadar, Executive Director of the Protein Society, who will talk to us about reducing barriers, protein society meetings and webinars. Thank you, Shannon, and hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to talk to you about the Protein Society and our meetings. Now, I've learned a lot throughout the day, and I'm going to change my talking points a little bit so that it's not repetitive, but um, we have a common theme, so you'll, you'll notice that. The Protein Society is an international organization. We exist to support and promote communication, collaboration, and cooperation for our protein scientists who study protein design um, as well as structure and function. And um, I'm giving you a snapshot here. I actually only have one slide, but I think I wanted to just emphasize that my contact information is at the bottom. I saw a lot of questions um, from similar organizations just um, that we have, and we may have some of the answers. So if any of the information um, can help you, and if I can be of help, please email me. I'm, I'm quite open to that. We've learned a lot. Um, so what I want to share with you is just the timeline, which again, you've heard from other organizations. I think this is very similar to a lot of the um, participants in the meeting. Our annual meeting was canceled. We have been in existence for almost 37 years. And we do have an annual meeting, which is an international meeting that brings together close to 800 attendees. Posters are a big part of that. So I'll talk a little bit about what we did when we went virtual. But I just want to go back to 2020 because that meeting was three years in the planning uh, with nonprofits across the world, which is almost unheard of. So we broke a lot of cultural and egos <laughs> to, to plan a world conference on protein science, which, of course, we had to let go of. Um, and we are quite heartbroken. And I've shared with you that our mission is communication, cooperation, collaboration. And uh, naturally, um, most of that is done through a meeting and an in-person meeting, as um, all of us have held um, from the speaker's side of what we heard today. Um, in 2021, we did um, hold a virtual meeting. And I can quite honestly say that it was close to flawless, as long as you hold it up to the standards of a virtual meeting. So I think what I, I think what I want to say is that the society is still in learning mode and we are not going back to in-person meetings. We're actually retaining what we've learned over the last, what the pandemic has taught us um, to, to take the tools that we have and the technological advances to do a better job at supporting our protein scientists. 
whom I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but I think they're saving the world, right? So this is very crucial for us. Um, but um, the virtual meeting was made possible or we're able to deliver it because of the vendors that we had, the platform, platforms that we found. And it actually um, was cheaper and it was profitable. So with in-person meetings, we lose money. And you can imagine why. We heard about travel costs, feeding costs, so many other um, space costs, AV and so on, many vendors. In the virtual meeting, we actually found a partner, a vendor that, um, to be blunt, did not make up the cost. So what I found in, in my interaction with virtual vendors or virtual meeting vendors, is that often you get quoted something that's just unaffordable. And we've heard that word a lot, but uh, Socio actually did not raise their price, kept the same price that we were paying for them when they were an app for an in-person meeting. And um, again, I think most of you may, I mean, what, I've, what we've learned is that uh, in-person virtual, uh, in-person app becomes a virtual meeting unto itself, right? So we held a virtual meeting. We didn't see a huge increase in participation. We kept the registration fee very low um, and we had to get very good at something that we did not know how to do. So uh, this actually taught us a lot. We didn't have the staff that ran virtual meetings before. We definitely had to do many more new things than we were comfortable with. But again, with, with the help of vendors and through a lot of negotiations, uh, we were able to run a meeting that we felt met the needs of what we wanted to offer. Again, um, the virtual meeting, we didn't expect it to be an in-person meeting. Um, and um, it's interesting that in our survey, what we've learned, uh, what the feedback was, you know, very good virtual meetings, one of the best I've attended, which we're very proud of. Um, but on the negative side, it said that it was a virtual meeting. Uh, so it was um, not an in-person meeting, which was what people wanted at that point in time. Um, the title of my talk is Reducing Barriers, and I want to just make this point that this meeting reduced barriers. Of course, we saw more participation, more international participation from countries that we have not seen before in person, more women, more underrepresented minorities. So access was important. Again, it was not an expensive meeting. I expected to see 2,000 people there because it was virtual and it was cheap. Uh, we didn't. And even though we had the on-demand sessions, we didn't see a lot of people watching them. And um, I think what we've learned, and so I'll just use an example of what we've learned, what we've heard today about traveling to a meeting. Let's say you have children. All of us that have children know that you may need childcare for your child when you go to a meeting. But I just want to point out that so do virtual meetings, right? So if you're going to be committed and engaged, and if you're going to take advantage of what they have to offer, you can't be distracted. So it's, you know, it, 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 virtual meetings don't um, always take care of that problem. You still have to take off work. Um, and we connect everything where um, the pipeline of our participants are high school students all the way to Nobel laureates. So um, again, it's, it's, it's very hard for uh, people to travel, but it's not always that people can just sign up for virtual meetings. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Four Waves. That's the platform that we use for abstracts, and we felt that it delivered what we wanted it to give to us. Of course, we use GatherTown for social interactions, which did not work out. Four Waves was good enough, again, for a virtual meeting poster session. They have, uh, they create a room for each poster presenter, but, um, Again, just to balance things out, uh, an empty room where someone is waiting two hours for someone to come in and see their poster. Uh, so a student who's invested a lot of time and maybe as nervous as I am now, you know, about talking about their research can have just a, you know, as a hard of an effect as um, somebody not stopping by in their poster hall by their poster. So we, we have to be very realistic about the challenges of virtual meetings. Uh, we couldn't wait to go back. Uh, and I probably, you know, I've learned a lot and and I think the impact of our actions is very important, right? Uh, and what I've started my presentation with was that we're not going back to in-person meetings only. Uh, we are we are still committed and we want to give more to our constituents and we know that virtual meetings can do that. What we have done are mini meetings or webinars, we, information dissemination, so research dissemination, we all know it's 
can be done just as well virtually uh, as it can be in person and for, for cheaper. So these webinars have really opened the world to us. We have at least 4,000 protein scientists across the world uh, among those 16 webinars that we've done. They're free and some of them have 4,000 views on YouTube. So again, we usually get 800 people at an in-person meeting. So, and they, they will stay forever. We have a lot of support from our, from our leadership to continue to deliver them. And we, we consider them, or I consider them our mini meetings. And um, I think if we could financially sustain it, we will have virtual meetings and in-person meetings. Uh, but I do believe it's important to have in-person meetings. It does not satisfy, again, the, the three tiers, which I think all of us focus on, of collaboration, communication, and, and cooperation. And what we saw in San Francisco at our in-person meeting this year was fewer registrations. 20% seems to be pretty consistent, even with other organizations. We had to, to commit more in travel grants because um, we wanted to reduce barriers, right? The, even though it was an in-person meeting, we, we really wanted to, to um, make it easier and possible for students to come. And this, the meeting was student heavy. It was one of our highest rated meetings, but I think just because we're all waiting to get back in person and posters are fabulous. And I think posters matter, abstracts matter. We treat our poster presenters, they're just as important as my speakers to us. So that's one of the reasons why we do um, in-person meetings. And we are planning another in-person meeting uh, next uh, year in Boston. But again, our webinars continue, and um, we are also considering mini virtual or larger virtual meetings as long as we can afford it. And back to affordability, again, what we've learned is that it takes a lot of negotiation and a lot of research, but it is possible to find vendors, even for a small organization such as ours. Um, however, I I sympathize, you know, with with staffing. Um, we are very small. We used to have three people, now we have two people, and my we don't have a director of uh, meetings anymore. So um, it's not easy, but it's possible. And that's why I listed my my email. That if I can help connect you with with some of the resources that we found, um, or just share our experience, um, I'd be very happy to. And I think I have a few minutes left, but I I like to just um, take a step back and. Uh, frame a little bit the way we approach what will happen in the future. And I think this recipe for magic and our meetings are magical. Even the virtual meeting was magical. Um, hearing a Nobel laureate talk about you know, their research virtually is probably just as powerful as in person. You know, that part doesn't suffer. But I think there are four components here. Uh, the needs of our constituents, which range from high school to Nobel laureates all over the globe. The skills of our staff and the time that they can dedicate to meeting planning, the budget, <laughs> which often wins out of these four, you know, if you can do it, you can do it. And um, Jennifer from the Biophysical Society had a presentation earlier and, and we learned a lot from their experience. And that's why you haven't heard me talk about hybrid uh, because I haven't been able to find a vendor that, that can uh, match our budget. And we're not sure how to do two things at once that satisfy everybody involved. And again, that's why we, for the future, we're thinking virtual and in person. Um, and then the, the fourth component, if you're keeping track, is just the impact of our actions. And that's important here. We've heard a lot of very strong statements about climate justice and equal access. And um, that's all to say that we, we are going to continue to learn. This meeting is, is very helpful. Um, but as you can see, we are also still committed to in-person meetings and, and the magic that they bring to us. Great, thank you so much, Raluca. Our third speaker is Mr. Matthew Duva, Chief Executive Officer of the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease who will tell us about the liver meeting digital experience. Thanks, Sharon. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've really enjoyed uh, the presentation today um, and learning from lots of really great organizations about their experience. 
I'm going to try to share, I will not try, I will share our experience today at AASLB. Um, and I'll try to offer some different perspectives that we've learned um, and sort of shout out those that I think others um, have learned as well. So a little bit of um, background on AASLB. Um, we are a professional associate, a, a professional society. Um, we have about 7,000 members. Our members are researchers, both, both basic scientists and clinical researchers, clinicians, um, including um, MDs, um, RNs, um, other um, advanced practice providers, as well as regulators, industry. Um, and although not full members of the association, um, in the last number of years, we've also introduced a strong patient program. So we also have a lot of patient advocacy as part of our broader community as well. Um, the key programs that we offer um, are pretty, you know, pretty typical programs that uh, associations tend to offer. So we have the liver meeting, which um, I'm going to talk a lot about today, um, as well as we participate in a program called Digestive Disease Week, which is uh, DDW. Um, we have four scholarly journals um, listed on your screen. We also have very active special interest groups that um, play a huge role in contributing to the content that the organization provides, as well as providing opportunities for enhanced networking among our membership. Um, we have a strong advocacy program where we work with regulators, we work with, um, with NIH, as well as with, um, with uh, members of Congress. Um, and then we have educational offerings, including the liver meeting, but also webinars, digital education, and other in-person meetings that allow our members to come together in smaller venues. And finally, we play a huge role or play a role in providing um, resources um, to help clinical practice. So whether those are through our guidelines programs, our guidances, or other recommendations um, that help um, influence um, patient and uh, practitioner interactions. Um, so, uh, let me give a brief overview of sort of the phenotype of the liver meeting. This is sort of a combination of mostly pre-pandemic, but also um, as, we've, as we've evolved as well. So, we generally uh, draw about 8,500 attendees. That's the average of, you know, the last number of years. We do about 115 educational sessions, um, which are a combination of invited sessions or organized sessions, as well as um, poster abstract oral session. We also have about 2,000 posters that are on site for the four days of our meeting. Um, one of the things that we have always had that have increased um, a lot is networking and engagement programs. So those are more informal sessions um, that are not continuing education programs that we offer, and those have been on the increase. We also do the business of the society. So we have an annual business meeting. We also bring together committees, special interest groups for meetings to help plan the future of the field, as well as for the society. Um, and then we have an exhibit component. So that's 130 exhibitors on the show floor. Um, and then those groups are engaged in other industry-sponsored events um, that add additional content, education, um, and engagement opportunities that are all kind of part of the ecosystem of the meeting. And then I mentioned our patient program, which actually um, I'll talk about a little bit, but was launched um, in the first year of the pandemic. So uh, this year was the first time we actually offered a patient program on site, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But our patient program is about 19 sessions that happen dur during the meeting. That includes a poster tour session and the like as well. Um, and the other thing that I would mention is that um, our overall impact of the meeting is about 24 million. So that's the impact of the of our meeting on a city, um, which which is also interesting as we think about sort of all that's happened um, over the last couple of years, and then as we think about our future planning. So um, I, I will take a quick step back, and I I will just quickly say. I want to acknowledge the, the work of our society, our staff, our, our members who really have helped us write this story about our experience with the liver meeting and the virtual. Um, I started with the society in January of 2020. So I actually um, have been in this role since that time and have just went to my first liver meeting in person about three weeks ago. So it really was a complete team effort with my colleagues and staff, as well as with our members, to try to figure out how to navigate these really interesting unchartered waters. So I want to acknowledge them and acknowledge the partnership that led to it. 
So when 2020 happened um, with the pandemic, our meeting was in um, the end of 2020, as you can see all over the piece this graphic. Um, so essentially our meeting, uh, we had some time to plan and think about what we were going to do. Um, so we made the decision at that time to sort of introduce what we hoped um, would be a new product, which is the Liver Meeting Digital Experience. We created a brand for it. Um, we also sort of, we had always referred to the Liver Meeting as TLM. So then we started referring to the Digital Meeting as TLMDX. Um, with the idea that we were bringing our members something different. So what I'm going to do right now um, in the remaining time that I have is kind of take you through the experience of what uh, the DX version of our meeting has evolved um, up till the meeting we just completed about a week ago where we, we brought those things together in terms of having in sort of that one meeting, TLM and TLM DX. So in 2020, uh, we launched TLMDX. Uh, we had from May to November. May was actually when we decided to cancel the meeting, which I recognize now seems probably late. But, you know, if I almost remember things were very unclear, but that's when we decided to cancel the meeting and we had till November to plan it. So essentially what we did was we pre-recorded the majority of our content um, and then had live Q&A sessions. We had one or two fully live sessions um, that were very clearly monitored, but the majority of our content was pre-recorded with the live chat, as many others have mentioned today. Um, we did try to do an exhibit hall. Um, we had a digital poster gallery. All of this was done through the Freeman platform. Um, and, you know, I think our results were mixed in terms of those engagement pieces. So one of the things that we did do that we were pretty pleased about was our interactive sessions were done both through um, the interactive platform, but we also were able to use Zoom within the platform to bring people out of the platform, um, but use Zoom technology so we could have larger rooms. The biggest issue we had within our platform was actually the number of people we could have in some of the organized sessions. So we needed to bring people out of the platform to ensure that we are doing that. Um, from an economics perspective, we did make a small profit, but it was certainly not a profitable venture. Um, and, and we also drastically reduced our overall registration fees from our typical 2019 rate. So I believe it was about 50% reduction in, in the cost of our, of our program. So then fast forward to 2021, um, we actually um, didn't know what we were doing in terms of what kind of program we were going to offer. So we began and planned the year as if we were going to have a hybrid. So we decided we would allow both of these programs, TLM and TLM DX, to exist together in harmony was the idea. Um, and so we kind of imagined what that would look like. So we put together a plan of mixed and pre-recorded and, and actually fully live sessions that we would transport out. We talked about how we would interact and engage with all of the other things that we do, that we did. Um, and then from a pricing perspective, what we decided to do was we sort of priced the DX product um, higher than it was the previous year. And then we sort of charged, we didn't sort of, we charged an additional fee for anybody who had decided that they would be willing to join us in person with the idea that we would be um, providing food beverage and those kinds of things. So there was essentially an additional charge for those that were coming in person. Um, so then when we made the painful decision in September of 2021 that we were going to go fully digital and fully engage in our DX platform, the refund was simply just the refund for the in-person component. So from an administrator perspective, it was a bit easier to kind of keep that moving. Um, most of the way we did the program then in 2021 was quite similar to what we did in 2020, um, except we, we kind of played around a lot more with interactive live sessions. So we did things like social events in the evening um, where we did dueling pianos one night. We did a kind of a keynote presentation in the evening with, um, with engagement opportunities um, for people to be at engagement tables. Um, and then we also did... Um, we also did uh, like a trivia night one of the nights. People enjoyed them, but we definitely did not see large engagement, large numbers of people. Um, and I think part of it is our 
group wasn't interested on some level. I think part of it was people were tired from a long day of learning. Um, and I think it, for some people, I think it felt forced, um, to be quite honest. So we tried it. It was, you know, but those were some of the things that we did introduce in 2021, in addition to the programs that I mentioned in 2020. From an economics perspective, again, we, we continue to use the Freeman platform. Um, and I mentioned the, the way we did profit, we, we, we priced it. So then now, uh, 2022, which is where we just finished it, finished our program, and that was just this past November. Um, we made, first of all, we made the decision to charge the same fee for both DX and for the liver meeting. So there was no price differential, including the early bird and the like. So we did not, we increased our fees as we got closer, like we've traditionally done for the in-person meeting and then did something similar for um, for the DX version as well. Um, and the idea of that was that we felt that there was a price tag and a value for the content, that that was really what we wanted to focus on and that's what we did. Um, and so um, we felt that if people were coming in person, the additional fees that they were uh, incurring to get there and all that, you know, that was sort of our balance of the food and beverage and, and the like. Um, so that's what we did in terms of how we offered the DX program. Um, we live streamed four sessions at a time and then the remaining content was recorded and available within 72 hours on our platform. And our platform, like many of yours, remain open um, for three months, so through February. Um, we did have a digital poster gallery that we did through Amuse this year, not through the Freeman platform. And we did, we did no exhibit hall or any kind of, uh, we, we just sort of gave up on that and focused on the in-person exhibit hall. But we did do some virtual symposia and did some virtual sponsored exhibit um, and engagement uh, programs, uh, like one or two, not very many. Um, so I, with the time that I've left, I want to talk a little bit about our numbers and then sort of what we learned. So overall, our registration actually remained pretty steady among uh, both our pre-attendance or our pre-pandemic and then kind of into now. Where we've seen the largest decreases is in industry engagement. So the number of exhibitors that are both coming to the meeting and supporting the meeting um, went down, obviously, in the during the virtual. And it also has remained lower um, in the in, in, in this year as well. Um, and that also affected group registration. So the number of uh, organizations that could bring essentially others to the meeting, that continues to go down. That's always been lower in the obviously the United States, that's not possible. But internationally, that was something that was quite a benefit for the society that has, has declined. Um, this year, we found that 25 of our total attendees were fully digital. So there was a, a great group that we uh, care about and that we were able to build relationships with, and that was great. And from an international perspective, you can see the mix that we're still lower than we were in 2019, but we actually have been pretty consistent in being able to keep our global footprint, which was something that was very important to the society. Um, I would note as well that in terms of a pricing perspective, we did um, we did charge reduced fees um, for uh, for middle income countries and zero uh, registration rates for low income um, for both experiences, so people can make that decision. Um, and then finally, I know I'm running out of time, but and I'm happy to talk about this more in our Q and A. Some of the lessons that we learned was one: the content is value. Um, what we also found was how people engage with the platform was quite interesting to us. So. Not only was the platform really valuable to people who couldn't be there, but the DX experience also added value of people at the meeting. We saw lots of people who were going online and, you know, skipping sessions um, because they could listen to it later and having a networking conversation or having a meeting with colleagues or people who were going to their rooms because they felt that they could enjoy the content in a different and more um, less distracted way. So we actually have found in our research that the DX platform is actually quite valuable for people as an additional alternative to those on site. So we're really trying to explore that right a lot more and looking at what the right mix of live and recorded will be. Um, and then finally, and I'll wrap up, is um, we're also looking at sort of the same questions that have been asked about basic science. So what's, the, what, what's around recording and what can we do for our basic scientists? So with that, I will um, thank everyone and look forward to the conversation in a bit.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matthew. And our final speaker today is Mr. Dylan Rudiger, Senior Analyst at Ithaca SNR, who will be telling us about weighing risk and opportunity, five propositions on the future of annual meetings. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here today. Um, I've been listening with uh, great interest to the presentations thus far, and I'm happy to share a little bit about the work that Ithaca SNR has been doing uh, over the past year or so to study the future of scholarly meetings, and in particular to look at the future of the annual meetings that are so foundational to uh, many scholarly societies. As Shannon already said, my name is Dylan Riediger. I'm a senior analyst at Ithaca SNR. Uh, where I lead an interdisciplinary team of social science researchers who study the research enterprise. Um, before joining SNR, I will briefly mention that I also worked at the American Historical Association for a little bit more than four years, um, during which time I was quite active in uh, helping with programming for events and meetings. So I also come to this with somewhat of an insider's sense of what it means to plan a meeting from a society's perspective. For those of you who aren't familiar, uh, a little bit of background on my organization might be helpful. Ithaca SNR is a nonprofit research organization that focuses on the production and circulation of knowledge within higher education and kind of adjacent uh, entities. The S, if you're interested in knowing, stands for strategies, and the R stands for research. And our funding uh, largely comes from grants. Uh, we are a very mission-driven organization, and we scope our work to benefit uh, researchers, universities, publishers, scholars, scholarly societies, and the like. Um, and you can see on the slide here um, a sample of some of the work that we do that's focused on researchers and scholarly communication, which has been an interest of ours uh, for quite some time. One of the projects that... Uh, that is in this portfolio of, of work on scholarly communication is the program that I'm here to talk about today. Um, this is the Future of Scholarly Meetings program. It's funded by the Sloan Foundation. And what it is, is it's a cohort of 17 uh, scholarly societies um, who are participating with us in a year-long series of workshops and conversations and kind of co-learning to uh, consider many of the same topics that are, are being discussed here today, um, and also to do some design-informed uh, workshops and a design lab and some sprints to help uh, create potential solutions to some of the problems that, again, are, have already come up quite a bit in, in conversation today. There are 17 scholarly societies who are participating with us. Um, they range very widely in size from very, very big organizations like the American Society of Civil Engineers, which has approximately 150,000 members and a very large staff and a lot of resources, to very small organizations like the American Arachnological Society, which has 300 members and no paid staff. And also, as you can see here, um, the group is uh, disciplinarily very diverse. Um, it's weighted a little bit towards STEM fields, but it includes significant representation from the humanities and the social sciences. Uh, this is by design. Um, we thought that it would be useful to kind of have the opportunity to have these conversations, not only with organizations that looked alike, but with organizations that did not look alike, to help us kind of triangulate what were common problems, what were shared agendas, um, and what were kind of idiosyncratic disciplinary uh, issues or issues specific to a single organization. Each of the societies that's been participating in this has put together a team of, of its, uh, its staff. Typically, it's the executive director and a meetings director who've been involved. And as I mentioned, they've been through a series of workshops and meetings over the year. Um, on various uh, topics of mutual interest. We've had one, for instance, on uh, innovative ways to structure hybrid meetings. We had another one on financial and membership implications of changing conference modalities. Um, and we are about to have our wrap-up meeting for this cohort uh, later this week, actually, where we'll be sharing with them some prototypes from the design phase. And unfortunately, since they get first preview of those, I won't be sharing them here today. Um, 
but I would just flag that in 2023, we'll be uh, producing a final report on this project that I think would probably be of great interest to people here. And that uh, we'll cover, we'll include those prototypes and it'll be publicly available in the spring. The stakes of getting uh, scholarly meetings right are very high. I think everybody in this room probably has a pretty good sense of that, but I think it's always useful to, to kind of frame questions about solutions in relation to uh, the purpose and the value of what we're trying to accomplish in the first place. And here I would, I would point to uh, three particular purposes that conferences serve. Obviously, uh, they are an important means of scholarly communication. Um, and I would just flag here uh, that Ithaca SNR does a faculty survey every three years, and pretty consistently faculty identify conferences as the single most important means that they use to keep up with their fields, um, which suggests a really robust value to conferences as a format. And also, as has come up several times here already today, um, conferences are a place where ideas are exchanged, collaborations are forged, and uh, ideas are shared with colleagues and potential collaborators. A second reason that conferences are quite important, important is that they gather together scholarly communities, and they're a great opportunity to foster values of equality and accessibility and access and belonging, um, and to uh, continue the project of building scholarly organizations that look like the fields uh, that they represent. And finally, they're important for the societies. I think since the, the uh, attendees here today are probably mostly society people, um, this will come as no surprise. But I think what's really particularly important to flag from my perspective is that if you look at the big picture in the landscape, Across disciplines, uh, membership is stagnant or declining in many scholarly societies. Uh, early career scholars in particular often feel alienated um, from this, the scholarly associations that claim to represent them. Scholars of color have similar concerns. And there's been research by Wiley this year that suggests that uh, members in general are citing diversity and the need to increase representation as one of the things they're least satisfied with uh, when they think about the society that, that you know, represents their discipline. And also scholarly uh, meetings are, are a great place where the value proposition and the branding of the society in question is really articulated and showed off to the world. With those kind of stakes in mind, um, I want to share less individual things that specific societies are doing. I think we've heard really good coverage of, of that topic uh, from the earlier speakers. And more to uh, zoom out just a little bit and present four propos uh, five propositions that I think are important as we look ahead to what I still, what I think is still a very unsettled future for for scholarly meetings. These are obviously as propositions; they're contestable. Um, hopefully, we'll get into some conversation about them in the Q and A. But I'd like to throw them out here um, in in what's left of my time. The first is that the opportunities here outweigh the risks. Um, scholarly societies, in my experience, are often fairly risk averse uh, organizations for very good reasons in many in many cases. Um, but I think we've been given a real opportunity here um, from, the, from the pandemic to rethink the foundation of conferences from the ground up. Um, conferences often are a kind of an accumulation of legacy policies, legacy practices, um, and uh, standard ways of doing things that are often um, may have made sense once, but don't, but don't often get reevaluated. And so we have an opportunity here, um, and especially given the health of many scholarly societies, this is a time to take some risks um, because the upside of acting is quite significant. Um, hang on one sec, my driver is going to update in four minutes. Um, I'll be quick. Um, the second thing is that hybrid is already here. Um, Hybrid, I think, is actually a flexible concept, not a format for a conference. Um, and as we've seen today, uh, scholarly conferences now commonly include both virtual and in-person elements in some degree. 
So the question really isn't about whether or not to go hybrid. It's about how to create meetings that leverage different kinds of technologies um, to suit the purpose that they're made for the best. Um, this means, I think, really thinking hard um, at every instance about what the purpose of a particular meeting or a particular session within a meeting is and trying to understand how to uh, use the different kind of technological affordances in terms of like modality um, to best accomplish those purposes and to best present the material to the audience that you identify as being uh, most interested in it. A third is that all formats are going to have trade-offs. You can't please everybody. Um, I am aware that within our cohort, a lot of societies are feeling kind of a pinch right now. They have um, a faction of members who are very vocally in favor of going back to purely in-person meetings. They have another faction of members who want to stay in virtual meetings forever, and they're kind of canceling each other out, and a lot of societies are feeling kind of paralyzed and unsure of what to do in the face of these competing demands. Um, but I think the, the approach that I'm seeing people take to kind of get out of this is to really recognize that being forced to make decisions is not necessarily a bad thing um, because it, it allows you to consider strategically which members or potentials members needs uh, that you intend to prioritize. And I would point out here, as uh, pretty much everybody has already shown, uh, that virtual meetings have been able to attract an audience that is very different from what we traditionally have seen at in-person meetings and that meets um, uh, the missions of many organizations which are really trying very hard right now to incorporate diversity and equity and inclusion into the heart of their societies um, these virtual meetings seem to be an important way to facilitate our allowing access to people who are otherwise on the outside looking in <clears throat> The fourth one is that the basics should be on the table. Um, we've done some really interesting work in the cohort to zero in on specific types of uh, events at meetings, whether the plenary, the exhibit hall, the business meeting, the panel, the poster session, and to really think about how well those different genres of communication are serving the purpose uh, that they were designed to serve and whether or not they ought to be translated kind of one-to-one -one into virtual environments. Uh, do you need, is, a, is an in-person panel, should it be structured in the same way that a virtual panel is structured, for instance? And I think this is a really good opportunity to um, take some time to reflect on uh, something that, I, that I, I notice often, which is that scholarly meetings, they're a 19th century uh, invention for the most part, uh, and they haven't really changed a whole lot since then. Um, and this is a really good opportunity to kind of rethink what the basic communicative modes are and how well they're serving the needs of scientists and researchers and other members of our community. And the last point that I'll make is that meetings embody values. Um, meetings are, for most members, the most visible output of a society. For many people, it's the only real engagement that they're going to have with a particular scholarly society. And they are uh, the flagship event of many, of many organizations. They are the embodiment of the kind of priorities and values that the organization has. And I think people who are attending the conference are going to rightly see them as reflecting the organization's priorities. Um, and so decision making about conferences, I think, should be calibrated to take into account the fact that people are going to read the decisions you make as reflecting um, your deepest priorities. And I truly apologize because I can't stop my computer from rebooting in nine seconds, but I think I got this done and I will rejoin the call momentarily. Uh, thanks so much for this opportunity, and I'll see you as soon as I can. All right, perfect. Well, Dylan, I'm glad we made it through your presentation, and uh, yeah, we'll see if we lose you and get you back again. Um, but to kick off the discussion, um, I guess I'd like to ask everyone how their experience was in 
adapting platforms for virtual. It seems like everyone did a lot of very different, interesting things. Um, and with minimal staff, or how did that affect staff time? Or Luca, you mentioned that you only have two to three staff members. So what is what is optimal for the amount of time that staff is dedicating towards developing these platforms and processes um, and what can be done maybe to outsource or I don't know, whatever, Reluca, your organization was able to do with that minimal um, yeah, staff available. Um, so sure, I'll take a step at that. Do you want me to um, go oh, yeah, for it? Really sure. So, uh, so socio for us, and um, I'm not marketing the platform at all. I just wanted to give them recognition for not charging me an opportunity cost, which is what I said a lot of vendors do nowadays. Um, was very easy to handle, and I think that's key. Don't get, um, don't look for the best or the least expensive or whatever criteria you have. Make sure that you can handle. My technical skills are very minimal, um, but you're not going to like my answer for time because really I worked on it at night, and they had customer service representative available 24-7, so that worked from, to my advantage. They, I was, I'm in California, they were in Turkey, so it was beautiful. No one was, you know, uh, too tired. But um, everything goes off the window when you talk about time. I think you need dedicated staff who's willing to put in the hours. Fortunately, you only have to do it once, right? So that's why I said we can do virtual meetings over and over again because we've learned a platform, but that year was tough. So it takes a lot of motivation and kind of just take it all on in and telling yourself you're going to learn new skills overnight. And that's exactly what happened. But I cannot sugarcoat the commitment or the time that goes into it that first time when you have to deliver a virtual meeting um, where you have never thought of virtual before. Mm -hmm. Dale, do you want to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for our organization, um, one of the challenges was that it wasn't just a single event, but in fact, it was, you know, 50 to 60 events that, that were planned that had to be then rapidly transitioned to a virtual platform. And, and a lot of our staff were, you know, specialists who knew a particular aspect of the logistics of putting on in-person conferences. Um, so, you know, some of the, some of the work, transitioned relatively easily, like people that handle things like registrations, that's easy to convert. But but um, a lot of the virtual events we found, um, even though it, it appears simple to the attendees, a lot goes on behind the scenes to get it to work flawlessly. And um, it, it was quite stressful, you know, for the staff. And, you know, they were showing up to work at 4 a.m. and dealing with technical issues, a speaker's internet goes down right before they're gonna talk. And, um, you know, there was all of that. And um, the people that worked on the program side had to, you know, really communicate extensively with the scientific conference organizers and the speakers um, to both get them to understand how things were gonna work, but also even just to get their buy-in to do it and and to send their students to the meeting and, and all of that. So there, there were a lot of, a lot of growing pains and and having to, having to queue up. I mean, you just finish one event and oh, we've got three more planned for next week that we're going to be running simultaneously. So, um, so that that wasn't trivial. It it is certainly a learning curve that gets easier over time. So as people adapt to you know figure out how the platform is going to work and um, then can start to anticipate some of the issues and head them off and. Um, so it got easier over time um, and and became more seamless. Um, but but yeah, I wouldn't trivialize what was involved in in going virtual and and it was always a little hard to hear at some of the attendees saying, "Well, this should just be free, you know <laughs> you know and, and you see all of your colleagues working so hard to make it um, come off um, flawlessly, and you know it, it can't be done for free. Uh, I certainly think there's the possibility, um, as we've heard about, to do like single events, like a webinar or, or a short event, and we certainly still do some free content. Um, but the bulk of what we do, we can't keep operating without 
you know, charging some, some registration costs. So, yeah. Yeah. Matthew, I see you nodding along to a lot of that. What about your experience? Yeah, I'll, I mean, I would say yes to everything. Um, so for sure. Um, I think for us, um, I, I think what's been really challenging is that every year has been different, right? So as I mentioned, like the first year we were, we had, we were in the midst of the pandemic and had to figure out how to do all this, uh, like everyone else. And then the second year we were sort of go stop, go stop, go stop. And that was, you know, a whole set of challenges. And I, but I do feel like this year now we've now gotten a sense of what, what, that mix of hybrid might be for us. And so how to operationalize that a little bit more um, is kind of what I'm looking forward to. But I do think that um, two things that I'll mention, the first is I would definitely echo what Dale said about how it hurts the planning. So one of the big things that we've seen is we have, this is the first year and like three where we're, I think, doing a better job of getting ahead of the 2023 annual meeting, which you really have to be planning before you finish a program, as everybody on this in this group knows. Um, and so that's been something that has been a real challenge for us and something that we're working towards. And then um, the other thing is, is, you know, the hybrid environment or in general, one of the things that I am grateful for is have having the experience because the speaker expectations are also quite different now. So it was surprising to me um, that when we were preparing for this year's meeting, which was going to fully be in person, we got so many questions about, well, I'd like my session recorded because I can't be there. I mean, we even got questions, for example, from people who were invited to speak who said, you know, that time isn't really convenient for me. So I just want to go ahead and record my session because I'm going to leave early. And we were like, no, 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 we can't meet those kinds of requests. But that has really, you know, this has really opened up. I think people sort of what they perceive to be the menu of opportunities. And so managing those expectations is an additional thing that I would add in addition to everything that I've said. That's a good point. Did anyone have any other comments about? Dylan, what did you hear from other societies about kind of managing staff time, minimizing maybe the amount of work or number of people needed to dedicate to that to these evolving um, platforms and processes growing pains in that respect yeah um, I think the experiences that have just been articulated uh, are very common um, meeting departments are usually pretty small often one or two people um, and it's a lot of work to pivot I think for me, one of the things that I'm really trying to think through, and Thail, you mentioned this kind of like um, backlash against virtual and the kind of sense of returning to normal. Um, and I think, you know, when the pandemic first started, there was this sense that people had that the goal was not to return to the normal, it was to make some kind of a new normal. And I think what this uh, question really gets to is how much exhaustion and having to be making quick decisions and pivoting for going, you know, three, year, three years now um, has led to people kind of feeling like maybe just going back to the old way of doing things has some value. Um, I think that's probably a mistake, but I also understand why it's so hard. And I think, Matthew, when you talk about like the way in which you have to start planning for meeting before the old meeting even ends. You know, this is another really complicated thing about big changes to meetings is that to work, the meeting has to run on this very complicated series of timelines uh, that are what make it possible to have the next meeting. But what isn't usually possible within that is really taking the time to say, well, what if we did something totally different, right? And what if we just take five months to figure out what that might be. And there isn't really a moment in the cycle to do that kind of like deep reflection and significant experimentation. And I don't know that there's an easy way out of this. It's not really a critique, but it is one of the factors mm -hmm. that I think is limiting our collective imagination about what's possible here um, and leading us into some of these uh, 
s- kind of pseudo solutions are like it works okay. Works um, okay. Kind of, kind of um, answer. Interesting. Well, in one of our. One of our keynotes, uh, Felix alluded to this idea of, uh, I think he called it a, a non-parallel hybrid model where the hybrid isn't occurring simultaneously with the in-person event, but that in fact you have maybe a smaller in-person event or less frequent in-person event followed by uh, potentially a series of short virtual events that keep the community connected, keep the scientific conversation going, and then you know eventually lead to another in in person gathering and i think that's something that we're very interested in in trying to explore more whether it's just an alternating year instead of holding the tb meet, meeting annually for example would we consider doing every other year virtual and and in terms of opportunities to experiment maybe where that comes about i, I mean i think for us it would be difficult to wholesale just change over the entire portfolio of meetings simultaneously to doing that. But what we could do is more selectively experiment and, and really even identify communities of scientists because they each, each community has their own personality. Identify communities of scientists that really want to embrace that and work with us to develop that type of model to keep their community together. Because I actually think in the long run, they'll find that they're learning more from each other and staying more connected to each other doing something like that than even the traditional model that they're used to. Well, one of the things that I was just going to add to you is, you know, we've been talking a lot about building the strategic plan for our meeting. So recognizing that, you know, I think it's in the association model, there's a lot of like, you have a board and the board sort of, has an experience and they want to kind of implement a lot of the new ideas that they have, but recognizing that our, the members we're serving are in such constant change and flux in their day jobs. So they don't have the time to prepare for your meeting and to sort of figure out how to navigate your meeting. So one of the things we've been talking a lot about having just finished a meeting is, yes, there's 10 things that we think we can do to make the liver meeting and liver meeting DX better. But how do we put that in a three to four year plan? Because if we try to do all the things, we are going to confuse everybody when they show up and they're not, then we're going to have a different set of problems and, the, and we're going to have a different set of challenges in terms of them. By the time they figure out what we're giving them, that they're, they're ready to go home. And they're not going to be pleased. So the implementation phasing is really, I think, becoming more important than ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what is that balance between kind of new features, engaging activities um, with a user-friendly kind of interface and making that both engaging but not frustrating for the user, um, I think is a challenge. Even if you do really put effort into um, trying to do these new style of kind of engagement and interactivity online. Dylan, do you have anything to add about kind of developing new features and how to make users how to make you able to use this, them better? This may be um, a little bit off topic, um, but okay. I think one of the things that I think is really important is to make sure that when we're thinking about virtual and in person that we don't end up kind of replicating existing hierarchies within academia. Um, this is so this is less a question about timing than an observation that it's not hard to imagine a world in which in person events continue and maybe become even more high status and exclusive and the virtual events become for everybody else and a virtual presentation becomes uh, you know considered to be a kind of second class output or outcome. I don't think that's by any means inevitable. Um, and I don't know that that's really a question about timing so much as considering the implications of these decisions so that you're building in um, more equity in meetings uh, than the old way of doing things had with it. It's mm, a really good point. 
Um, speaking of equity, we have an audience question that relates to that and internet access. It says, how does differing access to the internet or reliable internet access impact discussions around virtual meetings or hybrid meeting components? What can show organizers do to help mitigate impact, allow attendees and presenters from impacted areas to participate fully in the meeting? Any suggestions? I mean, we I'll, certainly. I'll oh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> please, please. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, we we certainly found that um, uh, you know people did encounter technical issues, and sometimes it was related to their internet connection. Um, by and large, most of them reported that they were able to either just fix the issue themselves or or get technical help. And and we did have all of our sessions always had on. Um, you know, somebody monitoring and, and providing technical support. But if their internet connection actually went down, obviously that that does make it, you know, impossible for them to to participate in a live session. Um, uh, for that purpose, a num number of people commented that they really appreciated that the on-demand material was always available later so that, you know, when they their connection was restored or when their time zone was more favorable, they could watch the material and at least um, gain access to the science, although they lost some of the interactive component. Um, but that's certainly, you know, always going to be the case that, um, you know, we can only be connected virtually to the extent that we have um, solid technical connections and, and, and really that, that becomes a, a worldwide, you know, equitable access question as well. Matthew, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, I, well, I would just say that similar situation. Um, I, I would say that, um, yeah, the uh, accessibility thing is fascinating because, you know, I had one member tell me that he had to rush home for something for an emergency and come back to the meeting. And so he caught the whole plenary session on his JetBlue flight uh, home and then caught the other one. I mean, so, you know, there's this ability to participate in the meeting, even when they're rushing home, it's kind of an amazing thing, but then you have other areas where, you know, internet isn't available. We also had issues, um, for us, one of the big challenges that we found was uh, issues for members at wanting to access the platform in China. So that, that was particularly, that has been the last couple of years a particular challenge um, and something that is, in, is something that we're constantly working on. But I do think the, the digital, the on-demand access aspect has really been a critical piece of, of providing um, that connection. And I think that the expense to travel to the United States is sort of outweighing the, the you know, the internet is definitely something we need to look at and in, in internet accessibility, but, but the ability for our content to be more accessible to people outside of the United States um, has been a, a really important part of our strategy. And I think it's something we're gonna be really looking at more. Yeah, that's this would only this would only work in very specific situations and organizations. But another thing that I've seen some people experimenting with is um, using kind of hub and spoke type meetings where they'll have um, smaller gatherings to do um, maybe a watch party for part of the thing. Um, that's where I'm thinking about this in terms of connectivity. Maybe if you're in a place where the internet is not great, there's a central internet somewhere at a university or something that people could congregate at to participate in the meeting. Maybe there's even an opportunity to offer some supplemental programming on site. Um, that's only gonna work in certain kind of contexts and for certain kind of meetings, but it might be a way to mitigate that in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I also kind of wanted to touch on this issue of the cost and benefit um, and overall for your organizations, do the benefits outweigh the costs in terms of virtual or hybrid? And maybe for Dylan, what maybe did you find in serving many different organizations as to maybe do's and don'ts when it comes to making it most affordable um, to put on these hybrid and virtual events? Matthew, 
Matthew, did you want to maybe start us off there? Sure. I mean, I I think that I think what I would say for us is I am most surprised, and I'm still unpacking this because we're like five days out from a meeting right now. But I'm most surprised by the value that people perceived in the digital experience who were at the meeting, um, and we had when we did the budget for the digital experience versus the liver meeting, we did them as separate projects. I should be reporting to you that the DX product is probably losing money or is close to losing money. And, you know, it really, it, as we were, as, as we were going into the meeting, I was thinking very differently about what we would offer next year. Um, and then we witnessed how people use the product to register for the liver meeting. And we're sort of thinking it as a value add in a different way. And so how we have to, we have to think about that. So I don't have the answers other than to say, um, I have a lot more questions. So we're going to be looking at things like who logged in, how often did they log in, have they logged in since, um, and really looking at, you know, how much the value proposition of, of this is existing for our members. Um, and then sort of the, the cost of not providing something that, one, they're finding incredibly valuable, and two, um, that really hurts the community because then we're, we are really providing more science. We're providing more opportunities for people to digest the science and engage with the science, which is why we exist. So, you know, cutting that off is really a challenge. And so, you know, I'm not sure there's a lot of appetite from our leadership to do that. So, mm -hmm. more questions than answers. Than answers. I think Matthew that that's really really important um, because it it there's the revenue that you need to run the meeting today, and then there's the revenue that you need to sustain the organization ten fifteen years down the line, right? And my sense is that right now the in in many contexts and and societies differ, their business models differ, their membership differ. So it's hard to generalize, but with membership overall declining and memberships that in many contexts look decreasingly like the next generation of scholars who are coming up the ranks, um, part of the financial picture that's really important to keep in mind is, are you building a membership base through the decisions you're making with your meetings now that will sustain you in 2030, 2040? Because that needs to be, I think, part of the equation. And I think it will change the math versus does this event make money today? Now, obviously, there are limits to how flexible you can be about that. But I think it's really important to keep that long, long view in mind. Helen, I would just, I, I would I'd like to say that membership has changed drastically. The definition of membership has changed drastically for us. I no longer think of my members of just the people that pay to become a member. I claim all those webinar watchers from countries that, you know, unfortunately will not be able to attend my in-person meeting. I claim them as members. So um, this is a very interesting concept that we don't have time to discuss, but I think the value add of, of using the technology developments that we are forced to accept is is at the top of our list. That's the highest priority now is to continue to engage people that we found we can engage through virtual means. It's just not the sole solution. It does not meet all of our needs for what we exist to give. And if we we haven't had to, I have to say our board has been very, very supportive. We haven't had to choose Eventually, as costs rise, and they are rising for many different reasons, we will have to choose. But I'm also hoping that the vendors will catch up by then. Um, we had seven vendors for our virtual meetings. That's insane. Talk about burnout and time invested. And um, maybe, maybe that part of um, the industry will be more friendly towards associations and towards um, scientific associations, because again, a meeting without posters is not a meeting for us. So 
Uh, I don't have the luxury of saying, I'll just do webinars and forget about posters. It has to be all inclusive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that we've been experiencing this year is the difficulty in forecasting, especially when we start doing these more complex formats that involve both an in-person component and a virtual component. Um, and, and again, we're a nonprofit, but we still have to be able to break even on our events in the long run. If we don't know how many people are coming in person, then that makes it difficult to forecast, you know, and to have the right venue contracts and food and beverage contracts to cover those events. <clears throat> and if we don't know how many people are going to register for the virtual access, then, then it, it makes it a lot harder to decide, okay, how much do we have to charge for registration just to cover our basic costs for the platform and, and everything involved in, in adding that component. And, and, and we're in such a, strange sort of transitional period with the pandemic where you know there's been a return to travel there's been a, a a wide recognition that even the workplace itself is starting to change and may there may be some permanent changes there there's there's the impact on carbon footprint that everybody's starting to recognize you know we all have to take that seriously and in our personal lives um and then i think for scientific conferences there's the complication that all the canceled events from the past couple of years got rescheduled into this year and you know end of 2021 into this year and early into next year so so it's created this this very unpredictable landscape that makes any kind of financial forecasting and strategy around size and content and pricing very complicated and and I think what, one of our hopes is just that we we get a better handle on who is interested in virtual content? And, you know, we've certainly seen that, that we get broader access and that is very much aligned with our mission and something that we want to continue. Um, but we just need to need to figure out the numbers. Great. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up the discussion here, but I do encourage everyone to join the Remo Networking Lounge to continue these conversations. Um, let's take a look at our poll results from this session. Our first poll, has your attendance at in-person conferences changed compared to pre-pandemic times? Um, and most answer they've attended fewer in-person conferences per year now than previously. Our second poll. Uh, what percentage of participants attend in person versus remotely for hybrid events? And we see that 75% attend in person in general, um, and then 50% is our second most common answer. And our third poll, in 2023, what percentage of conferences do you plan to attend in person versus virtually? Um, there's a good mix here, and 50% um, in person versus virtual is the most common, but it looks like they're pretty distributed across. So that doesn't help us do much prediction, as we <laughs> said. So, um, but it is good to see everyone. There's a different combination of interest um, from different people, probably for a lot of different reasons. So um, it's a constantly evolving landscape. So I'd like to thank um, our speakers for this session for a really great um, analysis of what's happened during the pandemic and where we should look moving forward. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that all sessions will be available on demand and open access likely by the end of the week. So feel free to share with anyone who might find this content useful. Um, again, please join us in the remote networking lounge to meet other attendees and continue conversations with speakers and explore how this platform can foster connections and collaborations virtually. You can access the lounge by clicking on the networking session in the main menu or copy and pasting the link that will be posted to the chat. We do recommend that you use Google Chrome as your browser for the best experience on Remo.
And we'll reconvene tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern for our session on technologies, tools, and platforms to facilitate virtual conferencing. See you then. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to our final session of the event. During the break, our speakers and representatives from leading conference organizations met in small, small breakout groups to discuss lessons learned and next steps forward in the future of scientific conferences. We will now hear from each of the group leaders about their group discussions, conclusions, and outcomes. We'll start with Felix Rundell. Thanks, Shannon. Um, and first of all, thanks to my wonderful breakout group uh, with 14 experts um, from many different institutions. There are definitely a lot of learnings um, to be shared after these two days. Um, starting with the main um, fact, and Kate Whitfield's uh, keynote yesterday certainly set the tone in that climate change is um, happening. It's affecting how we do business, uh, how we run as a society, and it most certainly affects already now how we have to run our events. Um, technology is a solution. Uh, virtual events are a solution. Um, and how we design our events, how we um, curate amazing content for our audiences will also be relevant for contributing to the, the solution. But we also discussed that the future technologies that are going to save us, you know, they are going to uh, provide smooth new online event experiences. Some of these are still uh, a bit further away when we think about VR, AR. And the question is really, what can we change today? And how can we change what we do today um, when some of the future technologies still need some development uh, while they're already on the, on the horizon for, for many of us? Um, so I think there was an agreement that the near future of scientific conferences um, is decided by the small steps and the decisions we take today. Um, we talked about hybrid meetings as, as a solution, and many of us uh, find um, that still very hard to realize, a problematic uh, a solution, a costly and um, a solution that's connected to a lot of effort. And what we're going to need and what we will hopefully see in the near future is more creative concepts for more fluid solutions, cheaper solutions also when it comes to technology for hybrid events that do not um, disadvantage um, one target group or, or another. So um, what we also discussed is that organizers need to be very clear about their objectives now. They need to really decide what their priorities are. Do we want to focus on community building, on the social effects, and do we want to then um, use uh, physical face-to-face -face events for that, and maybe do those uh, in a much uh, uh, lower frequency, maybe just every second year, and then instead focus on more um, affordable, uh, but much more, much more frequent online solutions to exchange information, to um, collaborate uh, in online formats. And then we have to build our meeting strategies accordingly. And that takes us uh, to another important aspect that was discussed in this group, the financial aspects. And uh, that, that's another tough nut to crack. Uh, we learned that there are many different business models um, that uh, organizations are applying. There's not one silver bullet solution, but um, the one problem we all still share is um, the fact that costs um, can where online events can barely be covered by uh, ticket sales or uh, other sources of income. So they need to be, uh, yeah, new, we need new approaches, we need new strategies, maybe new business models. Um, one insight is definitely that when it comes to sponsors, um, sponsors want high quality experiences. They want to uh, apply to slap their brand onto um, well, uh, rounded, high quality products, not onto cheap uh, 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 products. And that's one of the main insights, I think, that can be distilled from uh, the conversations we had. It's still always about content. If you provide high quality content and a high quality framework and an entertaining structure, that's uh, a great way to attract. Uh, sponsors and audiences alike. We talked about uh, virtual space a bit more and uh, the metaverse solutions, uh, some of the virtual environments that we heard about today and yesterday. And there's, of course, the development that new generations, uh, 
Gen Z and, and uh, even younger generations are far ahead in using these uh, technologies and virtual environments. They're also um, very well suited for disabled audiences and communities. So we need to get, get going with these uh, um, possibilities with these platforms as soon as possible. Uh, one um, beautiful aspect is, of course, that and now we see young generations also gaming with their grandparents. Uh, that was one insight shared. So intergenerational learning in virtual worlds is possible. And how can we maybe learn from that and be inspired for our uh, virtual events and offer um, amazing experiences, learning opportunities, uh, collaboration uh, opportunities for intergenerational audiences, for uh, disabled audiences and uh, disadvantaged audiences. Finally, um, we asked uh, in a very quick fire round um, what we will do next, uh, what are the tangible um, solutions and steps we want to apply from starting from here. Uh, and one um, item that was shared was we want to measure more. The impact that we have in general, but specifically our carbon emissions, so that we can you know, give overviews uh, like the one um, Kate showed yesterday. This is your event uh, in the physical world with uh, this amount of emissions. And here's, in comparison, a, a virtual event. Um, and you can um, easily um, create compelling argumentations around it for your audiences, for your sponsors to take the climate friendly route and uh, produce virtual events. Um, we also learned that, of course, um, climate friendly solutions do not only or don't stop with uh, virtual event technology. There are many things that we can still do in our in-person events to reduce carbon footprints. And I think there are a lot of uh, resources to learn from. And that takes me to the last point and maybe the most important point um, is that we should not stop uh, getting together like we did in the last two days. We should not stop uh, the exchange, co-learning and this co-evolution in our field, trying to help each other take the net next steps, uh, benefit from each other, from um, one another's experiences, collaborate and talk more. So uh, this uh, symposium was very, very well received and appreciated by all. Um, that's um, one thing we can say for certain. Thank you and back to you, Shannon. All right, great. Thank you so much, Felix. Um, next, we'll hear from Thale Jarvis, who headed up our group two. And so I'll be reporting out on the our breakout group discussion. Um, one of the themes that we talked about was, was the idea that the principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion seem to be a shared common value across all of the organizations that we heard from, and um, and something that um, was really addressed in many ways by the added access that you get from virtual events. And that was something that that um, is a principle that we all want to remind ourselves as we think about where we go forward with scientific conferences. Um, the, there was also certainly a consensus that emerged that um, people really missed during the pandemic, those in-person interactions, and they really value coming together in person. But at the same time, this feeling that, that we all acknowledge that just going back to the way we did things before the pandemic is not the way forward, that we, we see value in, in both in-person and, and virtual formats, and certainly the concern around um, the climate impact is significant and recognized by all. Um, so, so a consensus that we all recognize the issue of climate change and, and our practices and how they impact carbon. But uh, it seemed that relatively few institutions have really ways to um, track or incentivize the carbon footprint of their activities um, or, or even um, ways, ways to measure the carbon footprint of what they're they're doing. Um, echoing what we just heard from from Felix, um, this was there was a, a strong consensus that that we think the conversation that we've had over the last couple of days has been extremely valuable, and and we would like to keep that conversation going. and And wondered, you know, if there was interest and appetite to reconvene a similar event, perhaps in a year or or maybe a little bit longer 
to see where we're at and, and, and what new things have we learned and some of the outcomes that we'll talk about today and, and maybe if we have a chance to implement some of those. Um, a, another common theme that came out, um, we felt, was that the, the idea of even the word hybrid has different definitions for different people, but the idea that hybrid events really have two separate audiences that have two separate sets of needs and that, in fact, um, we can envision very effective utilization of, of hybrid events that aren't synchronous. So, in fact, having really what amounts to alternating in-person events that are maybe smaller and less, less frequent, um, but then alternating with virtual events that are fully virtual and, and put all of the participants on an equal footing and, and carrying on and on ongoing scientific conversations with, with mechanisms like that. Um, uh, we, we like that it came out in a number of conversations that rethinking really how we present our science when we go virtual is, is very important. Uh, the, the attention span and fatigue that occurs when people are, are just viewing something virtually needs to be acknowledged and that presentation, presentations that are shorter and 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 trying to find engaging activities that bring the virtual audience in in a more active way um, is, is certainly very valuable. Um, scientific posters, that was a, uh, an area where I think almost universally everybody felt that the poster experience was one of the hardest things to accomplish effectively in a virtual medium. Um, you know, we, we did hear about uh, various various ways, you know, for example, with Keystone Symposia, we presented that, you know, our poster sessions could occur interactively so people could get into a small, you know, virtual meeting room with the poster presenter and they, the presenter could share their screen and so forth. But that being said, um, just getting participation is still really hard. And, and that was certainly something that we saw in our survey outcomes was one of the less satisfying aspects of the meeting. And, and yet we recognize that those are super important, especially for the more um, junior participants in, in conferences. And, and we talked about ways that, that we could take interactive posters to a different level in virtual meetings. Um, for example, trying to do, do a matchup of um, uh, taking you know, keywords from abstracts, try to do a matchup of, of the different poster abstracts that are submitted you know, maybe um, grouping them in groups of six or seven presenters and putting them into a room together where they all talk about their science as a group and perhaps even and ideally assigning the invited speakers, the program faculty to, to have one or more of them in, assigned to each of those groups so that you get this really sort of focused scientific discussion um, with the trainees and some of the senior faculty might be an interesting way to try and address that. Um, and that what one other thing that we wanted to suggest to the group that we could consider is whether or not we want to follow this event um, in drafting some sort of position statement on um, the some of the outcomes that we've learned, the, the importance of carrying on um, some aspect of, of virtual meetings and the value both for democratizing access for the community and reducing carbon footprint. And um, that, that could be a draft that would be shared, revised um, with group participation, and then optionally signed by the organizations that, that are, are interested and supportive of the, the position statement that could come out of this. All right, great, thanks, Vale. And our final report out is by Dylan Rudiger. Dylan, what did your group discuss? In I'll uh, try to focus on ground that doesn't overlap too much with what's already come up, although I will say that we uh, touched on many of the same topics. In particular, climate change was um, probably a full third of what we talked about. It was a very big looming issue um, that seems to be um, a, a, both a powerful argument for virtual and also a real challenge to um, articulate to people that they should prioritize that when they're planning meetings. 
um, but also an urgent topic that needed to be faced. Um, I think we really kind of identified a, a key tension, which is that societies in particular um, are kind of caught between uh, financial models that make meetings uh, very important to their finances. This is true whether they're running meetings as profit centers or as break-even events. Um, and regardless of their financial model, it's a very important part of where the revenue for societies come from. And changes to the meeting uh, have financial implications that are really difficult for societies to navigate. On the other hand, uh, societies have missions that are really oriented towards spreading uh, the word about the, the science that their research communities are doing as widely as possible, and that those two things are uh, in tension in ways uh, that, you know, are probably perennial, but have become more acutely clear uh, in this moment when the opportunities to kind of think about meetings differently have changed the uh, horizon of what seems possible. Um, so we talked quite a bit about those uh, those issues. Uh, finance in particular came up um, and, a, and a recognition that there are a lot of different uh, financial and business models for different societies um, and also a lot of different kind of staffing models and sizes of meetings and thus that there's unlikely to be uh, a one size fits all kind of solution here, um, that different societies are probably gonna make different decisions about what way they break. Um, I'll say speaking just for myself, I think that's probably a good thing. Um, and uh, something that's exciting because it will mean that people are continuing to innovate in this space. Um, we had a rather interesting discussion about whether generational divides were important or not. Um, there was some, uh, some some folks who thought that they were a, a kind of key fault line in understanding who was interested in virtual or in-person meetings, um, including who really got the most kind of value of the collaborative aspects of in-person meetings um, with some suggestions that that might be something that was more useful to older faculty or that older faculty valued uh, more closely as something that was unique to in-person formats. Um, on the other hand, there was a recognition um, that other people pointed out that a lot of young scholars are also eager to go back to in-person conferences, um, in part because the value of conferences isn't just for uh, one's career, it's also uh, the opportunity to travel and to go to a neat place and have fun for a couple of days, and that that's something that uh, needs to be in the equation when we're thinking about the value of conferences. And then finally, uh, two last points that I'll, that I'll touch on. Um, we talked a little bit about the uh, possibility of thinking of conferences uh, not as a single monolith, but as a series of interconnected events and to kind of uh, imagine that what you're trying to think through when you're thinking about mo different modes of delivery is less do we have a virtual or an in-person conference or a hybrid conference and more to think about uh, different types of events like plenaries, poster sessions, uh, regular panels, networking lunches, um, business meetings, et cetera, and to think about those pieces as different components and to make decisions about modality based on what the purpose and audience for individual types of activities are. Um, and one very specific example of that coming out of the uh, Biophysics Association um, was the uh, idea of moving governance meetings that had been formerly held in conjunction with the annual meeting into virtual settings. And then the last thing that I'll say is that there, was, um, there were several interesting comments about the importance of the kind of smaller conferences that are organized uh, outside of the scholarly society world. Um, and that those might be important sites for innovation that could uh, develop new ways of, of thinking about conferences that would be useful to uh, scholarly societies. And so they were uh, kind of flagged as a place to watch. So that's pretty much what our group covered that hasn't already been well reflected in the conversation.
Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, we do have a few minutes for audience questions, so go ahead and submit your questions um, now if you'd like to ask our group leaders anything. Um, I would like to ask our leaders, was there kind of a difference of opinion based on either size of organization, where people were coming from based on what events they had tried? What were the lessons learned about the diversity of the of meeting organizers that we are trying to serve here. Uh, Dylan, did you want to jump in there? Sure. I mean, this is somewhat reiterating something I just said, but um, I think that in our room, at least, there was a sense that size of organization had some kind of correlation, however rough, to uh, business models for meetings and also certainly a very strong correlation with the amount of staff that were available um, and the amount of resources that were available to leverage. Um, and so uh, this creates can create a lot of different outcomes. It might make larger organizations have more capacity to innovate and be willing to take more risks. But on the other hand, um, larger societies might be more uh, likely to be treating their conferences as revenue generating, you know, profit centers, and thus be disincentivized to um, fiddle too much with things that are essential for funding other work the organization does. Mm -hmm. Felix, did you notice yeah, anything in your group? Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Yeah, group one. Um, we certainly had uh, representatives of uh, organizations of different sizes, um, different budgets, um, different business models, but um, I think the uh, overriding um, sentiment or the, the, the shared sentiment was that in the grand scheme of things, we are all in the same phase together when it comes to stepping into the future of uh, scientific conferences. We're in an exploratory phase. I think I mentioned uh, we have more questions than answers. That's what we all have in common. And um, so I think even though there are differences in sizes and, and budgets, and we need to solve the same questions together. Yeah, and in group three, we, we didn't really touch on this specific topic exactly, but, but some of the related themes, I, I think echoing what Felix just said, I think there was a sense of a lot of commonality of, of some of the outcomes that we've experienced to date and the challenges that we foresee and the, you know, the directions that, that we want to move in going forward. And, and that, that underlying financial theme, I think, really does affect all of the, the organizations across the board because whether you're a for-profit or a non-profit, and I think the majority of the participants were actually non-profits in this, but but regardless, you can't keep operating at a loss, certainly, um, no matter what your um, economic structure and, and, and really mission is. And at the end of the day, um, really the, the underlying mission of serving the scientific community is a common theme across all of the organizations that, that we heard from, and it's really just a matter of learning from each other and, and figuring out um, both how do we make the content as impactful as possible and the, the format with which it's delivered, um, but also do it in a way that, that we can keep doing it for the, for the long term. Great. Um, speaking of kind of learning from each other and everything, did you get a sense from your groups if they found this these two days useful and if there would be interest in holding such a event again in the future kind of maybe i don't know six months a year from now felix go ahead yes um this was mentioned very explicitly and i think i also um, mentioned this in my quick summary um the i think my group regarded this meeting as very successful in several um, senses. Um, most of all, that it sets an agenda. It puts the problem center stage, yeah? allows us all to talk about it, about the status quo we are experiencing in our work. Uh, and then it channels this uh, amazing crowd in intelligence, right? 
uh, all the different perspectives on the topics, a lot of experience, a lot of expertise and solutions. So I think this, as I said, um, this was very appreciated. I think a lot of the participants would love to see this uh, repeated and maybe not even a, a year down the line, but um, even more frequently. And I just want to um, add to this that I think we are at a very important point in time in finding those solutions together. Um, when we think about the role of um, scientific events in the sc scholarly communication system, I think it's always underestimated how uh, important of a role these also small uh, events and conferences and informal get-togethers and Zoom calls play in the overall um, uh, system. So um, finding better solutions, making these meetings more effective, creating better um, yeah, uh, productivity and, and better rates of exchange is so important at this point in time. If I can just piggyback off uh, what Felix just said, I think the other thing that's really important to for me when I think about keeping these conversations going is that the trend, the abrupt transition to virtual happened at a time that was very unusual. Um, the backlash that we're kind of seeing towards it now may also be an unusual moment, um, given what we've all been through and living in our houses for the last several years. And so I think it's going to take some time to actually get a good sense on some basic questions like, what is the audience for virtual events? I don't think we really know the answer to that, and we probably won't for a while yet because the last few years have just been odd. Um, although I, you know, just to go back to climate change, the coming years might also be very odd. So, you know, maybe maybe odd is just the new status quo. But I do think it's worth keeping these things going because we're very early in these experiments and we don't really have a good sense of um, what the long term trends look like at this point. That's a good point. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And um... Yeah, in terms of a, a follow-up event that came up specifically in our group discussion as well, when we think about optimal timing for that and, and maybe even even the length of such an event, um, I, I think giving it enough time that some of the ideas that have percolated up to the top from these, um, this day and a half of really fascinating conversation giving it enough time that we can each as an organization implement and act on, on some of the ideas and, and learnings. Um, and then, then be in a position to be able to report out, I, I think would be interesting. And, and I don't know what that looks like. I, you know, maybe six months isn't quite enough time to get there. Um, uh, you know, but there, there are so many different ways you can do virtual events and, and they don't have to be a whole day and a half. This content will remain available, from what I understand, on demand and, and open access for anybody that wants to look at it for at least some period of time. Shannon, you might be able to comment on how long. Um, but then, you know, a, a follow on event um, could be even a little bit more shorter and more focused, which is a theme that, would, that we heard um, throughout as far as, you know, within the organizations that participated in this or other organizations that look at this content and are interested in participating in the future, you know, you, you could have some sort of um, uh, essentially abstract submission kind of thing where people can say, you know, I'd love to report out on, you know, we tried this interesting model and uh, we, we learned some things that I'd like to share with, with the broader community of, of conference organizers. Great. Um, and as we near the end of our session, I just want to ask each of you for any concluding thoughts or things you think the audience would find valuable about the discussions or about these two days in general. I guess I would just say that we're at a moment in time mm -hmm. where the early momentum towards rethinking meetings is flagging a little bit. Um, and I really think that that's a mistake and it's encouraging to see that people who are here at this meeting are recognizing the need to not just reflectively go back to the old ways of doing things. 
I'll add to that. And if you heard my keynote yesterday, I might sound like a broken record, but um, try to um, go off the beaten path. There's not one blueprint for doing uh, academic conferences. Um, there's never been a blue one blueprint. Uh, try to um, create some experimental spaces in which you can try new things. They can be small to start with, and then you can expand on them. It gives you some creative uh, freedom and space. Great idea. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that really strikes me is, um, you know, we had deep conversation and, and great ideas coming um, primarily with this group from, from people whose organizations have been involved in, in putting on events. Um, so so the, the organizers of the events, there is, you know, bringing the, the community into the conversation is always important. And we constantly get informal feedback as we interact with the scientists who, who are the, the scientific organizers, the speakers and the attendees at our events. Um, but but I, I think amplifying on what, what Dylan just said, just it, we really are in a, in a point in time where we shouldn't immediately judge what the long-term outlook is of, of virtual events, for example, because yes, I mean, so many people communicated to us how wonderful it was to get back in person, how terribly tired they were of interacting only virtually. Um, and, and, and of course, you know, we were all so isolated and, and well beyond, um, a time frame when when anybody would would welcome that that you know quiet point in their lives and and so it is it is a unique situation and 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 I think you know letting letting the waters calm a little bit in terms of that kind of community rebound reactiveness about virtual is is going to be an important thing to to keep in mind and and I think about for Keystone Symposia um, going forward, because we do multiple events with different conference organizers and really different unique communities that have their own interests and, and characteristics, um, we do have an opportunity um, to work with, with the folks within our community who do want to be the early adopters and, and experiment with us. Um, you know, we've already been approached by a, a group that does something called, called Global Immunotalks, where they they um, started doing this recurring, you know, one, one talk. Um, I can't remember if it was once a week or once a month that they would do a talk that was open to anybody in the world, you know, working on interest in immunology. And, you know, they started it during the pandemic, but they'd like to keep that going. And that's different than having a highly curated scientific conference on, you know, one topic where you bring a bunch of people together at one time to talk about a topic more broadly. But it, it is an example of um, communities that actually found that there was something really useful in kind of this ongoing virtual interaction, you know, almost like having um, a journal club or a, 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 a speaking series um, that, that was ongoing, but it's not just at your university, it's for the whole world. Um, so, so I think there are folks out there that want to keep um, connecting virtually and their, their voices may not have been heard above the clamor of all of the folks that are, you know, so happy and relieved to be able to travel again after the pandemic, so. Great. Well, thank you all for for your concluding thoughts and outcomes. I think it's been a really valuable meeting for everyone involved, and we really appreciate your engagement and the audience engagement. I think it's been a really great demonstration of how interactive and valuable those interactions can be online. Now to wrap up the event, we have our meeting organizer, Dr. Debbie Johnson, to share her reflections about what we've learned and directions for the future. Hi, everyone. Um, on behalf of myself and Judith, I just want to thank all of you for participating in this very important event. Uh, I hope you found it as inspiring as I did. Uh, I think we learned a great deal. Uh, it was a valuable discussion. Uh, and I hope that this will push us forward to continue 
to experiment uh, with ways of engaging our scientific community in addition to the in-person events that we obviously all uh, still treasure and, and want to keep going. Um, finding ways to balance the needs of both uh, those that want to be at a meeting in person versus those that want to connect virtually. Uh, taking advantage of the latest technologies, a lot of interesting new things that we uh, were exposed to today. Uh, and, you know, again, looking at uh, the, the biggest benefits, I think, that we all see from engaging the community uh, in a virtual way is uh, democratizing science as well as the issue of climate change that certainly uh, is very um, much uh, on all of our, uh, our minds at this point. So um, again, I just want to thank all of you um, for this. This is really, really uh, very helpful. We will have the on-demand content available within this next week. Um, and uh, please continue to engage with each other. Uh, happy to uh, have uh, all of you answer uh, each other's questions as we, we leave the meeting, because it's a continued conversation that I hope we will still engage with each other uh, beyond this uh, meeting. So thanks so much again. Appreciate it.